Prologue. James Lassiter was forty years old, a well-built, ruggedly handsome man in the prime of his life, in the best of health. In an hour, he'd be dead. From the deck of the boat, he could see nothing but the clear, silky ripple of blue, the luminous greens and deeper browns of the great reef shimmering like islands below the surface of the coral sea. Far to the west, the foamy froth and surge of sea surf rose up and crashed against the false shore of coral. From his stance at the port side, he could watch the shapes and shadows of fish darting like living arrows through the world he'd been born to share with them. The coast of Australia was lost in the distance, and there was only the vastness. The day was perfect, the jewel-clear shimmer of the water dashed by white facets of light tossed down by the gold flash of sun. The teasing hint of a breeze carried no taste of rain. Beneath his feet, the deck swayed gently, a cradle on the quiet sea. Wavelets lapped musically against the hull. Below, far below, was treasure waiting to be discovered. They were mining the wreck of the Sea Star, a British merchant ship that had met its doom on the Great Barrier Reef two centuries before. For more than a year, breaking for bad weather, equipment failure, and other inconveniences, they had worked, often like dogs, to reap the riches the star had left behind. There were riches yet, James knew, but his thoughts traveled beyond the Sea Star, north of that spectacular and dangerous reef, to the balmy waters of the West Indies to another wreck, to another treasure, to Angelique's curse. He wondered now if it was the richly jeweled amulet that was cursed, or the woman, the witch Angelique, whose power, it was reputed, remained strong in the rubies and diamonds and gold. Legend was that she had worn it, a gift from the husband it was said she murdered, on the day she was burned at the stake. The idea fascinated him, the woman, the necklace, the legend. The search for it, which he would begin shortly, was taking on a personal twist. James didn't simply want the riches, the glory. He wanted Angelique's curse and the legend it carried. He had been weaned on the hunt, on tales of wrecked ships and the bounty the sea hoarded from them. All his life he had dived, and he had dreamed. The dreams had cost him a wife and given him a son. James turned from the rail to study the boy. Matthew was nearly sixteen now. He had grown tall but had yet to fill out. There was potential there, James mused, in the thin frame and ropey muscle. They shared the same dark, unmanageable hair, though the boy refused to have his cut short so that even now as Matthew checked the diving gear, it fell forward to curtain his face. The face was raw-boned, James thought. It had fined down in the last year or two and lost the childish roundness. An angel face, a waitress had called it once, and had embarrassed the boy into hot cheeks and grimaces. It had more of the devil in it now, and those blue eyes he'd passed to Matthew were more often hot than cool. The Lassiter temper, the Lassiter luck, James thought with a shake of his head. Tough legacies for a half-grown boy. One day, he thought, one day soon, he would be able to give his son all the things a father hoped for. The key to it all lay quietly waiting in the tropical seas of the West Indies. A necklace of rubies and diamonds beyond price, heavy with history, dark with legend, tainted with blood. Angelique's curse. James's mouth twisted into a thin smile. When he had it, the bad luck that had dogged the Lassiters would change. He only had to be patient. Hurry up with those tanks, Matthew. The day's wasting. Matthew looked up, tossed his hair out of his eyes. The sun was rising behind his father's back, sending light shimmering around him. He looked, Matthew thought, like a king preparing for battle. As always, love and admiration welled up and startled him with its intensity. I replaced your pressure gauge. I want to take a look at the old one. You look out for your old man. James hooked his arm around Matthew's throat for a playful tussle. Going to bring you up a fortune today. Let me go down with you. Let me take the morning shift instead of him. James suppressed a sigh. Matthew hadn't learned the wisdom of controlling his emotions, particularly his dislikes. You know how the teams work. You and Buck will dive this afternoon. Van Dyke and I take the morning. I don't want you to dive with him. Matthew shook off his father's friendly arm. I heard the two of you arguing last night. He hates you. I could hear it in his voice. 
a mutual feeling, James thought, but winked. Partners often disagree. The bottom line here is that Van Dyke's putting up most of the money. Let him have his fun, Matthew. For him, treasure hunting's just a hobby for a bored, rich businessman. He can't dive worth shit. And that, in Matthew's opinion, was the measure of a man. He's good enough. Just doesn't have much style at 40 feet down. Tired of the argument, James began to don his wet suit. Buck, take a look at the compressor. Yeah, he got the kinks out. Dad, leave it, Matthew. Just this one day, Matthew said stubbornly. I don't trust that prissy-faced bastard. Your language continues to deteriorate. Silas Van Dyke, elegant and pale despite the hard sun, smiled as he exited the cabin to Matthew's back. It amused him nearly as much as it annoyed him to see the boy sneer. Your uncle requires your assistance below, young Matthew. I want to dive with my father today. I'm afraid that would inconvenience me. As you see, I'm already wearing my wetsuit. Matthew! There was impatient command in James's voice. Go see what Buck needs. Yes, sir. Eyes defiant, he went below decks. The boy has a poor attitude and worse manners, Lassiter. The boy hates your guts, James said cheerfully. I'd say he has good instincts. This expedition is coming to an end, Van Dyke shot back. And so is my patience and my largesse. Without me, you'll run out of money in a week. Maybe, James zipped his suit. Maybe not. I want the amulet, Lassiter. You know it's down there, and I believe you know where. I want it. I've bought it. I've bought you. You've bought my time, and you've bought my skill. You haven't bought me. Rules of salvage, Van Dyke. The man who finds Angelique's curse owns Angelique's curse. And it wouldn't be found, he was sure, on the Sea Star. He lifted a hand to Van Dyke's chest. Now keep out of my face. Control, the kind he wielded in boardrooms, kept Van Dyke from lashing out. He had always won his rounds with patience, with money, and with power. Success in business, he knew, was a simple matter of who maintained control. You'll regret trying to double-cross me. He spoke mildly now, with the faintest hint of a smile curving his lips. I promise you. Hell, Silas, I'm enjoying it. With a quiet chuckle, James stepped inside the cabin. You guys reading girly magazines or what? Let's get going here. Moving quickly, Van Dyke dealt with the tanks. It was, very simply, business. When the Lassiters came back on deck, he was hitching on his own gear. The three of them, Van Dyke thought, were pathetically beneath him. Obviously, they had forgotten who he was, what he was, he was a Van Dyke, a man who had been given or earned or taken whatever he wanted, one who intended to continue to do so as long as there was profit. Did they think he cared that they tightened their little triangle and excluded him? It was past time he dismissed them and brought in a fresh team. Buck, he mused, pudgy, already balding, a foolish foil to his handsome brother, loyal as a mongrel puppy and just as intelligent. Matthew, young and eager, brash, defiant. A hateful little worm Van Dyke would be pleased to squash. And James, of course, he mused as the three Lassiters stood together, sharing idle conversation. Tough and more canny than Van Dyke had supposed. More than the simple tool he had expected. The man thought he had outwitted Silas Van Dyke. James Lassiter thought he would find and own Angelique's curse, the amulet of power, of legend, worn by a witch, coveted by many, and that made him a fool. Van Dyke had invested in it, time, money, and effort, and Silas Van Dyke never made poor investments. There's going to be good hunting today, James strapped on his tanks. I can smell it. Silas, right with you. James secured his weight belt, adjusted his mask, and rolled into the water. Dad, wait! But James just saluted and disappeared under the surface. The world was silent and stunning. The drenching blue was broken by fingers of sunlight that stabbed through the surface and shimmered clear white. Caves and castles of coral spread out to form secret worlds, 
a reef shark, eyes bored and black, gave a twist of its body and slid through the water and away. More at home here than in the air, James dived deep with Van Dyke at his heels. The wreck was already well exposed, trenches dug around it and mined of treasure. Coral claimed the shattered bow and turned the wood into a fantasy of color and shape that seemed studded with amethyst, emerald, ruby. This was the living treasure, the miracle of art created by seawater and sun. It was, as always, a pleasure to see it. When they began to work, James's sense of well-being increased. The Lassiter luck was behind him, he thought dreamily. He would soon be rich, famous. He smiled to himself. After all, he'd stumbled onto the clue. He'd spent days and hours researching and piecing the trail of the amulet together. He could even feel a little sorry for that asshole Van Dyke, since it would be the Lassiters who brought her up, from other waters, on their own expedition. He caught himself reaching out to stroke a spine of coral as though it were a cat. He shook his head, but couldn't clear it. The alarm bell sounded in one part of his brain, far off and dim, but he was an experienced diver and recognized the signs. He'd had a brush or two with nitrogen narcosis before, never at such a shallow depth, he thought dimly. They were well shy of a hundred feet. Regardless, he tapped his tanks. Van Dyke was already watching him, eyes cool and assessing behind his mask. James signaled to surface. When Van Dyke pulled him back, signaled toward the wreck, he was only mildly confused. Up, he signaled again, and again Van Dyke restrained him. He didn't panic. James wasn't a man to panic easily. He knew he'd been sabotaged, though his mind was too muddled to calculate how. Van Dyke was an amateur in this world, he reminded himself, didn't realize the extent of the danger, so he would have to show him. His eyes narrowed with purpose. He swung out, barely missing a grip on Van Dyke's air hose. The underwater struggle was slow, determined, eerily silent. Fish scattered like colorful silks, then gathered again to watch the drama of predator and prey. James could feel himself slipping, the dizziness, disorientation as the nitrogen pumped into him. He fought it, managed to kick another ten feet toward the surface, then wondered why he'd ever wanted to leave. He began to laugh, the bubbles bursting out and speeding high as the rapture claimed him. He embraced Van Dyke in a kind of slow, whirling dance to share his delight. It was so beautiful here in the gilded blue light with gems and jewels of a thousand impossible colors waiting, just waiting to be plucked. He'd been born to dive the depths. Soon James Lassiter's merriment would slide toward unconsciousness and a quiet, comforting death. Van Dyke reached out as James began to flounder. The lack of coordination was only one more symptom, one of the last. Van Dyke's sweeping grab pulled the air hose free. James blinked in bemusement as he drowned. Chapter 1 Treasure Gold doubloons and pieces of eight. With luck, they could be plucked from the seabed as easily as peaches from a tree. Or so, Tate thought as she dived, her father said. She knew it took a great deal more than luck, as ten years of searching had already proven. It took money and time and exhausting effort. It took skill and months of research and equipment. But as she swam toward her father through the crystal blue Caribbean, she was more than willing to play the game. It wasn't a hardship to spend the summer of her twentieth year diving off the coast of St. Kitts, skimming through gloriously warm water among brilliantly hued fish and sculptures of rainbow coral. Each dive was its own anticipation. What might lie beneath that white sand, hidden among the fans and seagrass, buried under the cleverly twisted formations of coral? It wasn't the treasure she knew. It was the hunt. And occasionally you did get lucky. She remembered very well the first time she had lifted a silver spoon from its bed of silt, the shock and the thrill of holding that blackened cup in her fingers, wondering who had used it to scoop up broth. A captain, perhaps, of some rich galleon, or the captain's lady. 
and the time her mother had been cheerfully hacking away at a hunk of conglomerate, the chunk of material formed by centuries of chemical reactions under the sea, the sound of her squeal, then the bray of delighted laughter when Marla Beaumont had unearthed a gold ring. The occasional luck allowed the Beaumonts to spend several months a year hunting for more, for more luck and more treasure. As they swam side by side, Raymond Beaumont tapped his daughter's arm, pointed. Together they watched a sea turtle paddle lazily. The laugh in her father's eyes said everything. He had worked hard all of his life and was now reaping the rewards. For Tate, a moment like this was as good as gold. They swam together, bonded by a love of the sea, the silence, the colors. A school of sergeant majors streaked by, their black and gold stripes gleaming. For no more than the joy of it, Tate did a slow roll and watched the sunlight strike the surface overhead. The freedom of it had a laugh gurgling out in a spray of bubbles that startled a curious grouper. She dived deeper, following her father's strong kicks. The sand could hold secrets. Any mound could be a plank of worm-eaten wood from a Spanish galleon. That dark patch could blanket a pirate's cache of silver. She reminded herself to pay attention, not to the sea fans or hunks of coral, but to the signs of sunken treasure. They were here in the balmy waters of the West Indies, searching for every treasure hunter's dream, a virgin wreck reputed to hold a king's treasure. This, their first dive, was to acquaint themselves with the territory they had so meticulously researched through books, maps, and charts. They would test the currents, gauge the tides, and maybe, just maybe, get lucky. Aiming toward a hillock of sand, she began to fan briskly. Her father had taught her this simple method of excavating sand when Tate had delighted him by her boundless interest in his new hobby of scuba. Over the years, he'd taught her many other things, a respect for the sea and what lived there, and what lay there hidden. Her fondest hope was to one day discover something for him. She glanced toward him now, watched the way he examined a low ridge of coral. However much he dreamed of treasure made by man, Raymond Beaumont loved the treasures made by the sea. Finding nothing in the hillock, Tate moved off in pursuit of a pretty striped shell. Out of the corner of her eyes, she caught the blue of a dark shape coming toward her, swift and silent. Tate's first and frozen thought was shark, and her heart stumbled. She turned, as she had been taught, one hand reaching for her diver's knife, and prepared to defend herself and her father. The shape became a diver, sleek and fast as a shark, perhaps, but a man. Her breath whooshed out in a stream of bubbles before she remembered to regulate it. The diver signaled to her, then to the man swimming in his wake. Tate found herself face mask to face mask with a recklessly grinning face, eyes as blue as the sea around them. Dark hair streamed in the current. She could see he was laughing at her, undoubtedly having guessed her reaction to the unexpected company. He held his hands up, a gesture of peace, until she sheathed her knife. Then he winked and sent a fluid salute toward Ray. As silent greetings were exchanged, Tate studied the newcomers. Their equipment was good and included those necessary items of the treasure seeker, the goodie bag, the knife, the wrist compass, and diver's watch. The first man was young, lean in his black wetsuit. His gesturing hands were wide-palmed, long-fingered, and carried the nicks and scars of a veteran hunter. The second man was bald, thick in the middle, but as agile as a fish in his undersea movements. Tate could see he was reaching some sort of tacit agreement with her father. She wanted to protest. This was their spot. After all, they'd been there first. But she could do no more than frown as her father curled his fingers into an OK sign. The four of them spread out to explore. Tate went back to another mound to fan. Her father's research indicated that four ships of the Spanish fleet had gone down north of Nevis and St. Kitts during the hurricane of July 11, 1733. Two, the San Cristobal and the Vaca, had been discovered and salvaged years earlier, broken on the reefs near Dieppe Bay. This left, undiscovered and untouched, the Santa Marguerite and the Isabella. 
documents and manifests boasted that these ships carried much more than cargoes of sugar from the islands. There were jewels and porcelain and more than ten million pesos of gold and silver. In addition, if true to the custom of the day, there would be hordes secreted by the passengers and seamen. Both wrecks would be very rich indeed. More than that, discovery would be one of the major finds of the century. Finding nothing, Tate moved on, bearing north. The competition from the other divers caused her to keep her eye and her instincts sharp. A school of gem-bright fish speared around her in a perfect V, a slice of color within color. Delighted, she swam through their bubble. Competition or not, she would always enjoy the small things. She explored tirelessly, fanning sand and studying fish with equal enthusiasm. It looked like a rock at first glance. Still, training had her swimming toward it. She was no more than a yard away when something streaked by her. She saw with faint irritation that scarred, long-fingered hand reach down and close over the rock. Jerk! she thought, and was about to turn away when she saw him work it free. Not a rock at all, but the crusted handle of a sword that he drew from the scabbard of the sea. Grinning around his mouthpiece, he hefted it. He had the nerve to salute her with it, cutting a swath through the water. As he headed up, Tate went after him. They broke the surface in tandem. She spit out her mouthpiece. I saw it first. I don't think so. Still grinning, he levered up his face mask. Anyway, you were slow, and I wasn't. Finders keepers. Rules of salvage, she said, struggling for calm. You were in my space. The way I see it, you were in mine. Better luck next time. Tate, honey. From the deck of the adventure, Marla Beaumont waved her hands and called out, Lunch is ready. Invite your friend and come aboard. Don't mind if I do. In a few powerful strokes, he was at the stern of the adventure. The sword hit the deck with a clatter. His flippers followed. Cursing the poor beginning to what had promised to be a wonderful summer, Tate headed in. Ignoring his gallantly offered hand, she hauled herself in just as her father and the other diver broke the surface. Nice meeting you. He dragged a hand through his dripping hair and smiled charmingly at Marla. Matthew Lassiter. Marla Beaumont, welcome aboard. Tate's mother beamed at Matthew from under the wide brim of her flowered sun hat. She was a striking woman with porcelain skin and a willowy frame beneath loose and flowing shirt and slacks. She tipped down her dark glasses in greeting. I see you've met my daughter Tate and my husband Ray. In a manner of speaking. Matthew unhooked his weight belt, set it and his mask aside. Nice rig here. Oh, yes, thank you. Marla looked proudly around the deck. She wasn't a fan of housework, but there was nothing she liked better than keeping the adventures spit and polished. And that's your boat there? She gestured off the bow. The Sea Devil? Tate snorted at the name. It was certainly apt, she thought, for the man and the boat. Unlike the adventure, the Sea Devil didn't gleam. The old fishing boat badly needed painting. At a distance, it looked like little more than a tub floating on the brilliant platter of the sea. Nothing fancy, Matthew was saying, but she runs. He walked over to offer a hand to the other divers. Good eye, boy. Buck Lassiter slapped Matthew on the back. This boy was born with the knack, he said to Ray in a voice as rough as broken glass, then belatedly held out a hand. Buck Lassiter, my nephew Matthew. Ignoring the introductions making their way around the deck, Tate stowed her equipment, tugged out of her wetsuit. While the others admired the sword, she ducked into the deckhouse and cut through to her cabin. It wasn't anything unusual, she supposed, as she found an oversized T-shirt. Her parents were always making friends with strangers, inviting them on board, fixing them meals. Her father had simply never developed the wary and suspicious manner of a veteran treasure hunter. Instead, her parents shimmered with southern hospitality. Normally, she found the trait endearing. She only wished they would be a little choosy. She heard her father offer cheerful congratulations to Matthew on his find and gritted her teeth. Damn it, she'd seen it first. Sulking, 
Matthew decided, as he offered the sword to Ray for examination, a peculiarly female trait, and there was no doubt the little redhead was female. Her copper-toned hair might be cut short as a boy's, but she'd certainly filled out that excuse for a bikini just fine. Pretty enough, too, he mused. Her face might have been all angles, with cheekbones sharp enough to slice a man's exploring finger, but she had big, delicious green eyes. Eyes, he recalled, that had shot prickly little darts at him in the water and out. That only made annoying her more interesting. Since they were going to be diving in the same pool for a while, he might as well enjoy himself. He was sitting cross-legged on the forward sun deck when Tate came back out. She gave him a quick glance, having nearly talked herself out of the sulks. His skin was bronzed, and against his chest winked a silver piece of eight hanging from a chain. She wanted to ask him about it, to hear where he'd found it and how. But he was smirking at her. Manners, pride, and curiosity collided with a wall that kept her unnaturally silent as conversation flowed around her. Matthew bit into one of Marla's generous ham sandwiches, Terrific, Mrs. Beaumont. A lot better than the swill buck and I are used to. You have some more of this potato salad. Flattered, she heaped a mound on his paper plate. And it's Marla, dear. Tate, you come on and get yourself some lunch. Tate? Matthew squinted against the sun as he studied her. Unusual name. Marla's maiden name. Ray slipped an arm over his wife's shoulders. He sat in wet bathing trunks, enjoying the warmth and company. His silvered hair danced in the light breeze. Tate here's been diving since she was pint-sized. Couldn't ask for a better partner. Marla loves the sea, loves to sail, but she barely swims a stroke. With a chuckle, Marla refilled tall glasses of iced tea. I like looking at the water. Being in it's something different altogether. She sat back placidly with her drink. Once it gets past my knees, I just panic. I always wonder if I drowned in a former life. So for this one, I'm happy tending the boat. And a fine one she is. Buck had already assessed the adventurer. A tidy thirty-eight footer teak decking, fancy bright work. He'd guessed she carried two staterooms, a full galley. Without his prescription face mask, he could still make out the massive windows of the pilot house. He'd like to have taken his fingers for a walk through the engine and control station. A look around later was in order, after he had his glasses. Even without them, he calculated that the diamond on Marla's finger was a good five carats, and the gold circle on her right hand was antique. He smelled money. So, Ray... Casually, he tipped back his glass. Matthew and me, we've been diving around here for the past few weeks. Haven't seen you. First dive today. We sailed down from North Carolina. Started out the day Tate finished her spring semester. College girl. Matthew took a hard swallow of cold tea. Jesus. He deliberately turned his gaze away from her legs and concentrated on his lunch. All bets were definitely off, he decided. He was nearly twenty-five and didn't mess with snotty college kids. We're going to spend the summer here, Ray went on, possibly longer. Last winter we dived off the coast of Mexico a few weeks. Couple of good wrecks there, but mostly played out. We managed to bring up a thing or two, though. Some nice pottery, some clay pipes. And those lovely perfume bottles, Marla put in. Been at it a while, then. Buck prompted. Ten years. Ray's eyes shone. Fifteen since the first time I went down. He leaned forward, hunter to hunter. Friend of mine talked me into scuba lessons. After I'd certified, I went with him to Diamond Shoals. Only took one dive to hook me. Now he spends every free minute diving, planning a dive, or talking about the last dive. Marla let out her lusty laugh. Her eyes, the same rich green as her daughter's, danced. So I learned how to handle a boat. Me? I've been hunting more than 40 years. Buck scooped up the last of his potato salad. He hadn't eaten so well in more than a month. In the blood. My father was the same. We salvaged off the coast of Florida before the government got so tight-assed. Me, my father, and my brother. The Lassiters. Yes, of course. 
Ray slapped a hand on his knee. I've read about you. Your father was Big Matt Lassiter, found the El Diablo off Conk Key in 64. 63, Buck corrected with a grin. Found it and the fortune she held. The kind of gold a man dreams of. Jewels, ingots of silver. I held in my hand a gold chain with a figure of a dragon. A fucking gold dragon, he said, then stopped, flushed. Big pardon, ma'am. No need. Fascinated with the image, Marla urged another sandwich on him. What was it like? Like nothing you can imagine. At ease again, Buck chomped into ham. There were rubies for its eyes, emeralds in its tail. He looked down at his hands now and found them empty, bitterly. It was worth five fortunes. Caught up in the wonder, Ray stared. Yes, I've seen pictures of it. Diablo's dragon. You brought it up? Extraordinary. The state closed in, Buck continued. Kept us in court for years. Claimed the three-mile limit started at the end of the reef, not at shore. Bastards bled us dry before it was done. In the end, they took and we lost. No better than pirates, he said, and finished off his beer. How terrible for you, Marla murmured. To have done all that, discovered all that, only to have it taken. Broke the old man's heart. Never did dive again. Buck moved his shoulders. Well, there are other wrecks, other treasures. Buck judged his man and gambled. Like the Santa Marguerite and the Isabella. Yes, they're here. Ray met Buck's eye steadily. I'm sure of it. Could be. Matthew picked up the sword, turned it over in his hands. Or it could be that both of them were swept out to sea. There's no record of survivors. Only two ships crashed on the reef. Ray lifted a finger. Ah, but witnesses of the day claim they saw the Isabella and the Santa Marguerite go down. Survivors from the other ship saw the waves rise and scuttle them. Matthew lifted his gaze to Ray's, nodded. Maybe. Matthew's a cynic, Buck commented. Keeps me level. I'm going to tell you something, Ray. He leaned forward, pale blue eyes keen. I've been doing research of my own. Five years on and off. Three years ago, the boy and I spent better than six months combing these waters, mostly the two-mile stretch between St. Kitts and Nevis and the peninsula area. We found this, we found that. But we didn't find those two ships. But I know they're here. Well, now, Ray tugged on his bottom lip, a gesture Tate knew meant he was considering. I think you were looking in the wrong spot, Buck. Not that I want to say I'd know more about it. The ships took off from Nevis, but from what I've been able to piece together, the two lost wrecks made it further north, just past the tip of St. Kitts before they broke. Buck's lips curved. I figure the same. It's a big sea, Ray. He flicked a glance toward Matthew and was rewarded with a careless shrug. I've got 40 years' experience, and the boy's been diving since he could walk. What I don't have is financial backing. As a man who had worked his way up to CEO of a top brokerage firm before his early retirement, Ray knew a deal when it was placed on the table. You're looking for a partnership, Buck. We'd have to talk about that. Discuss terms, percentages. Rising, Ray flashed a smile. Why don't we step into my office? Well, then, Marla smiled as her husband and Buck stepped into the deck house. I think I'm going to sit in the shade and nap over my book. You children entertain yourselves. She moved off under a striped awning and settled down with her iced tea and a paperback novel. I guess I'll go over and clean up my booty. Matthew reached for a large plastic bag. Mind if I borrow this? Without waiting for a response, he loaded his gear into it, then hefted his tanks. Want to give me a hand? No. He only lifted a brow. I figured you might want to see how this cleans up. He gestured with the sword, waited to see if her curiosity would overpower her irritation. 
He didn't wait long. With a mutter, she snatched the plastic bag and took it down the ladder to the swim step and over the side with her. The sea devil looked worse close up. Tate judged its sway in the current expertly and hauled herself over the rail. She caught a faint whiff of fish. Gear was carefully stowed and secured, but the deck needed washing as much as it needed painting. The windows on the tiny wheelhouse where a hammock swung were smudged and smeared with salt and smoke. A couple of overturned buckets and a second hammock served as seats. It's not the Queen Mary, Matthew stored his tanks, but it's not the Titanic either. She ain't pretty, but she's seaworthy. He took a bag from her and stored his wetsuit in a large plastic garbage can. Want a drink? Tate took another slow look around. Got anything sterilized? He flipped open the lid of an ice chest, fished out a Pepsi. Tate caught it on the fly and sat down on a bucket. You're living on board. That's right. He went into the wheelhouse. When she heard him rattling around, she reached over to stroke the sword he'd laid across the other bucket. Had it graced the belt of some Spanish captain with lace at his cuffs and recklessness in his soul? Had he killed buccaneers with it or worn it for style? Perhaps he had gripped it in a white-knuckled hand as the wind and the waves had battered his ship, and no one since then had felt its weight. She looked up, saw Matthew standing at the wheelhouse door watching her. Furiously embarrassed, Tate snatched her hand back, took a casual drink from her Pepsi. We have a sword at home, she said evenly. Sixteenth century. She didn't add that they had only the hilt and that it was broken. Good for you. He took the sword, settled with it on the deck. He was already regretting the impulsive invitation. It didn't do much good for him to keep repeating to himself that she was too young, not with her T-shirt wet and molded against her and those creamy, just sun-kissed legs looking longer than they had a right to. And that voice, half whiskey, half prim lemonade, didn't belong to a child, but to a woman, or it should have. She frowned, watching him patiently working on the corrosion. She hadn't expected those scarred, rough-looking hands to be patient. Why do you want partners? He didn't look up. Didn't say I did. But your uncle... That's Buck. Matthew lifted a shoulder. He handles the business. She propped her elbows on her knees, her chin in the heels of her hands. What do you handle? He glanced up then, and his eyes, restless despite the patience of his hands, clashed with hers. The hunt. She understood that exactly, and smiled at him with an eagerness that ignored the sword between them. It's wonderful, isn't it? Thinking about what could be there and that you might be the one to find it. Where did you find the coin? At his baffled look, she grinned and reached out to touch the disc of silver at his chest. The piece of eight. My first real salvage dive, he told her, wishing she didn't look so appealingly fresh and friendly. California. We lived there for a while. What are you doing diving for treasure instead of driving some college boy nuts? Tate tossed her head and tried her hand at sophistication. Boys are easy she drawled, and slid down to sit on the deck across from him. I like challenges. The quick twist in his gut warned him. Careful, little girl, he murmured. I'm twenty, she said, with all the frigid pride of burgeoning womanhood. Or she would be, she amended by summer's end. Why are you out here diving for treasure instead of working for a living? Now he grinned. Because I'm good. If you'd been better, you'd have this, and I wouldn't. Rather than dignify that with a response, she took another sip of Pepsi. Why isn't your father along? Has he given up diving? In a manner of speaking. He's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Nine years ago. Matthew continued and kept cleaning the sword. We were doing some hunting off of Australia. A diving accident? No, he was too good to have an accident. He picked up the can she'd set down, took a swallow. He was murdered. It took Tate a moment. Matthew had spoken so matter-of-factly that the word murder didn't register. My God, how? I don't know for sure. Nor did he know why he had told her. He went down alive. We brought him up dead. Hand me that rag. But...
That was the end of it, he said, and reached for the rag himself. No use dwelling on the past. She had an urge to lay a hand on his scarred one, but judged correctly that he'd snap it off at the wrist. An odd statement from a treasure hunter. Babe, it's what it brings you now that counts, and this ain't bad. Distracted, she looked back down at the hilt. As Matthew rubbed, she began to see the gleam. Silver, she murmured. It's silver, a mark of rank. I knew it. It's a nice piece. Forgetting everything but the find, she leaned closer, let her fingertips skim along the gleam. I think it's 18th century. His eyes smiled. Do you? I'm majoring in marine archaeology. She gave her bangs an impatient push. It could have belonged to the captain. Or any other officer, Matthew said dryly. But it'll keep me in beer and shrimp for a while. Stunned, she jerked back. You're going to sell it? You're just going to sell it for money? I'm not going to sell it for clamshells. But don't you want to know where it came from? Who it came from? Not particularly. He turned the cleaned portion of the hilt toward the sun, watched it glint in the light. There's an antique dealer on St. Bart's who'll give me a square deal. That's horrible. That's... She searched for the worst insult she could imagine. Ignorant. In a flash, she was on her feet. To just sell it that way. For all you know, it may have belonged to the captain of the Isabella or the Santa Marguerite. That would be an historic find. It could belong in a museum. Amateurs, Matthew thought in disgust. It belongs where I put it. He rose fluidly. I found it. Her heart stuttered at the thought of it wasting away in some dusty antique shop, or worse, being bought by some careless tourist who would hang it on the wall of his den. I'll give you a hundred dollars for it. His grin flashed. Red, I could get more than that by melting down the hilt. She paled at the thought. You wouldn't do that. You couldn't. But when he only cocked his head, she bit her lip. The stereo system she envisioned gracing her college dorm room would have to wait. Two hundred, then. It's all I have saved. I'll take my chances on St. Bart's. Color flooded back into her cheeks. You're nothing but an opportunist. You're right, and you're an idealist. He smiled as she stood in front of him, hands fisted, eyes fired. Over her shoulder, he caught movement on the deck of the adventure. And for better or worse, Red, it looks like we're partners. Over my dead body? He took her by the shoulders. For one startled minute, she thought he meant to heave her overboard, but he simply turned her until she faced her own boat. Her heart sank as she watched her father and Buck Lassiter shake hands. Chapter Two A brilliant sunset poured gold and pink across the sky and melted into the sea. The glory was followed by the finger-snapped twilight so usual in the tropics. Over the calm water came the scratchy sound of a portable radio aboard the Sea Devil that did little justice to the bouncy reggae beat. The air might have been redolent with the scent of sautéing fish, but Tate's mood was foul. I don't see why we need partners. Tate propped her elbows on the narrow table in the galley and frowned at her mother's back. Your father took a real shine to Buck. Marla sprinkled crushed rosemary into the pan. It's good for him to have a man near his own age to pal around with. He has us, Tate grumbled. Of course he has. Marla smiled over her shoulder. But men need men, honey. They've just got to spit and belch now and again. Tate snorted at the idea of her impeccably mannered father doing either. The point is, we don't know anything about them. I mean, they just showed up in our space. She was still smarting over the sword. Dad spent months researching these wrecks. Why should we trust the Lassiters? Because they're Lassiters, Ray said as he swung into the galley. Bending over, he planted a noisy kiss on the top of Tate's head. A girl's got a suspicious nature, Marla. He winked at his wife, then, because it was his turn for galley duty, began to set the table. That's a good thing, to a point. It's not smart to believe everything you see, everything you hear, but sometimes you've got to go with the gut. Mine tells me the Lassiters are just what we need to round out this little adventure. How? 
Tate propped her chin on her fist. Matthew Lassiter is arrogant and short-sighted and young, Ray finished with a twinkle in his eye. Marla, that smells wonderful. He slipped his arms around her waist and nuzzled the back of her neck. She smelled of suntan lotion and Chanel. Then let's sit down and see how it tastes. But Tate wasn't willing to let the matter drop. Dad, do you know what he plans to do with that sword? He's just going to sell it to some dealer. Ray sat and pursed his lips. Most salvagers sell their booty, honey. That's how they make a living. Well, that's fine. Tate took the platter her mother offered automatically and chose her portion. But it should be dated and assessed first. He doesn't even care what it is or who it belonged to. To him, it's just something to trade for a case of beer. That's a shame. Marla sighed as Ray poured dinner wine into her glass. And I know how you feel, honey. The Tates have always been defenders of history. And the Beaumonts, her husband put in. It's the Southern way. You have a point, Tate, Ray gestured with his fork. And I sympathize. But I also understand Matthew's side of it, the quick turnaround, the quick profit for his efforts. If his grandfather had taken that route, he'd have died a rich man. Instead, he chose to share his discovery and ended up with nothing. There's a middle ground, Tate insisted. Not for some, but I believe Buck and I have found it. If we find the Isabella or the Santa Marguerite... We'll apply for a lease, if we're not outside the limit. Regardless, we'll share what we salvage with the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, a term he agreed to reluctantly. Ray lifted his glass, eyed the wine. He agreed to it, because we have something he needs. What do we have? Tate wanted to know. We have a strong enough financial base to continue this operation for some time with or without results. We can afford the time, as we agreed you could defer the upcoming fall semester. And if it becomes an issue, we can afford the equipment needed for an extensive salvage operation. So they're using us? Exasperated, Tate pushed her plate aside. That's my point, Dad. In a partnership, one half must have use of the other. Far from convinced, Tate rose to pour herself a glass of fresh lemonade. In theory, she wasn't against partnership. From an early age, she'd been taught the value of teamwork. It was this specific team she worried over. And what are they bringing into this partnership? In the first place, they're professionals. We're amateurs. Ray waved a hand as Tate started to protest. However much I like to dream otherwise, I've never discovered a wreck, only explored those found and salvaged by others. Oh, we've been lucky a few times. He picked up Marla's hand, ran a thumb around the gold ring she wore, brought up trinkets others have overlooked. Since my first dive, I've dreamed of finding an undiscovered ship. And you will, Marla claimed with undiluted faith. This could be the one. Tate dragged a hand through her hair. As much as she loved her parents, their lack of practicality baffled her. Dad, all the research you've done, the archives, the manifests, the letters, the way you worked on the records of the storm, the tides, everything. You've put so much work into this. I have, he agreed. And because of that, I'm very interested that a great deal of Buck's research aligns with mine. I can learn so much from him. Do you know he worked for three years in the North Atlantic in depths of 500 feet and more? Frigid water, dark water. He salvaged in mud, in coral, in the feeding area of a shark. Imagine it. Tate could see he was, the way his eyes unfocused, how his lips curved with dreams. With a sigh, she set a hand on his shoulder. Dad, just because he's had more experience, a lifetime more. Ray reached back patted her hand. That's what he brings to us. Experience, perseverance, the mind of a hunter, and something as basic as manpower. Two teams, Tate, are more efficient than one. He paused. Tate, it's important to me that you understand my decision. If you can't accept it, I'll tell Buck the deal's off. And that would cost him, Tate thought miserably pride, because he'd already given his word, hope, because he was counting on the success of this new team. I understand it, she said, tucking her personal distaste aside. 
and I can accept it. Just one more question. Ask away, Ray invited. How can we be sure that when their team goes down, they won't keep whatever they find to themselves? Because we're splitting the partnership. He stood to clear the table. I'll dive with Buck. You'll dive with Matthew. Isn't that a nice idea? Marla chuckled to herself at her daughter's horrified expression. Who wants a piece of cake? Dawn spread over the water in bronze and rose streaks that mirrored the sky. The air was pure as silver and deliciously warm. In the distance, the high bluffs of St. Kitts awoke to the light in misty greens and browns. Further south, the volcano cone that dominated the little island of Nevis was shrouded in clouds. Sugar-white beaches were deserted. A trio of pelicans skimmed by, then dived with three quick, nearly soundless plops, shooting the water high in a cascade of individual drops. They rose again, skimmed again, dived again, in comical unity. Wavelets lapped lazily against the hull. Slowly, beautifully, the light strengthened and the water was sapphire. Tate's mood wasn't lifted by the scenery as she suited up. She checked her diver's watch, her wrist compass, the gauges on her tanks. While her father and Buck shared coffee and conversation on the foredeck, she strapped her diver's knife onto her calf. Beside her, Matthew mirrored the routine. I'm not any happier about this than you are, he muttered. He hefted her tanks, helped her secure them. That brightens my mood. They attached weight belts, eyeing each other with mutual distrust. Just try to keep up and stay out of my way. We'll be fine. Really? She spat into her mask, rubbed, rinsed. Why don't you stay out of my way? She plastered a smile on her face as Buck and her father sauntered over. Sit, Ray asked her, checking her tank harnesses himself. He glanced at the bright orange plastic bottle that served as a marker. It bobbed quietly on calm seas. Remember your direction. North by northwest, just like Cary Grant. Tate pecked his cheek, sniffed his aftershave. Don't worry. He didn't worry, Ray told himself. Of course he didn't. It was just rare that his little girl went down without him. Have fun. Buck hooked his thumbs in the waistband of his shorts. His legs were stubby trunks knobbed by prominent knees. Covering his bald pate was an oil-smeared Dodgers fielder's cap. His eyes were masked by tinted prescription glasses. Tate thought he looked like an overweight, poorly-dressed gnome. For some reason, she found it appealing. I'll keep an eye on your nephew, Buck. He grinned at that, his laugh like gravel hitting stone. You do that, girl. And good hunting. With a nod, Tate executed a smooth back roll from the rail and headed down. She waited as a responsible partner for Matthew's dive. The moment she saw him enter the water, she turned and swam toward the bottom. Sea fans the color of lilacs waved gracefully in the current. Fish, startled by the intrusion, darted away, a colorful stream of life and motion. If she had been with her father, she might have lingered to enjoy the moment, that always stunning transition between being a creature of the air and one of the sea. She might have taken the time to gather a few pretty shells for her mother, or remained still long enough to coax a fish to glide over and inspect the newcomer. But with Matthew closing the distance between them, Tate was struck less by the wonder of it than by a keen sense of competition. Let's see him try to keep up, she decided, and kicking hard, skimmed westward. The water cooled on descent, but remained comfortable. It was a pity, she thought, that they were far from the more interesting reefs and coral gardens, but there was enough to please the senses, the water itself, the sway of fans, a flashing fish. She kept her eyes peeled for lumps or discoloration in the sand, damned if she'd miss something and let him surface in triumph again. She reached for a broken piece of coral, examined it, discarded it. Matthew swam by her, taking the lead. Though Tate reminded herself the change of lead was basic diving procedure, she fretted until she could once more take the point. They communicated only when strictly necessary. After agreeing to spread out, they kept each other in view, as much, Tate thought, in suspicion as safety. For an hour they combed the area where they had found the sword, Tate's first sense of anticipation began to wane when they discovered nothing more. Once, she fanned away at sand, her heart thumping as she caught a glint. 
Her visions of some ancient shoe buckle or plate faded when she uncovered a 20th century can of Coke. Discouraged, she swam farther north. Here, suddenly, a vast undersea garden of brightly patterned shells and coral with darting fish feeding. Lovely branched coral, too fragile to survive the wave action of shallow water, speared and spread in ruby and emerald and mustard yellow. It was home to dozens of creatures that hid in it, fed on it, or indeed fed it. Pleasures slid through her as she watched a volute with its pumpkin-colored shell creep its laborious way along a rock. A clownfish darted through the purple-tipped tentacles of a sea anemone, immune to their stinging. A trio of regal angelfish glided along, a formation in search of breakfast. Like a kid in a candy store, Matthew thought as he watched her. She was holding her position with slow movements, her eyes darting as she tried to take in everything at once. He'd like to have dismissed her as foolish, but he appreciated the sea's theater. Both the drama and comedy continued around them, the sunny yellow wrasses busily cleaning the demanding queen triggerfish devoted as ladies-in-waiting. There, quick and lethal, the ambushing moray darted from his cave to clamp his jaws over the unwary grouper. She didn't flinch from her up-close seat of instant death, but studied it, and he had to admit she was a good diver, strong, skilled, sensible. She didn't like working with him, but she held up her end. He knew that most amateurs became discouraged if they didn't stumble across some stray coin or artifact within an hour, but she was systematic and apparently tireless, two other traits he appreciated in a diving partner. If they were going to be stuck with each other, at least for a couple of months, he might as well make the best of it. In what he considered a gesture of truce, he swam over, tapped her shoulder, she glanced over, her eyes bland behind her mask. Matthew pointed behind them and watched those eyes brighten with appreciation when she spotted the school of tiny silver-tipped minnows. In a glinting wave, they veered as a mass, barely six inches from Tate's outstretched hand, and vanished. She was still grinning when she saw the barracuda. It was perhaps a yard off, hovering motionless with its toothy grin and staring eyes. This time she pointed. When Matthew noted that she was amused rather than afraid, he resumed his search. Tate glanced back occasionally to be certain their movements didn't attract their audience, but the barracuda remained placidly at a distance. Some time later, when she looked back, he was gone. She saw the conglomerate just as Matthew's hand closed over it, Disgusted and certain only her inattention had kept her from finding it first, she swam another few yards to the north. It irritated her the way he seemed to work in her pocket. If she didn't keep her eye on him, he was practically at her shoulder. In a gesture of dismissal, she kicked away, damned if she'd let him think his misshapen hunk of rock interested her, however promising its pebbly surface. And that's when she found the coin. The small spread of darkened sand drew her closer. She fanned more from habit than enthusiasm, imagining she'd probably unearth someone's pocket change or a rusted tin can tossed from a passing boat. But the blackened disc was barely an inch under the silt. She knew the moment she plucked it up that she was holding a legend. Pieces of eight, she thought, giddy with discovery, a pirate's chant, a buccaneer's booty. Realizing she was holding her breath, a dangerous mistake, she began to breathe slowly as she rubbed at the discoloration with her thumb. There was a dull sheen of silver at the corner of the irregularly shaped coin. With a cautious glance over her shoulder to be certain Matthew was occupied, she tucked it into the sleeve of her wetsuit. Smug now, she began to search for more signs. When a check of her gauge and her watch indicated their time was up, she noted her position and turned toward her partner. He nodded, jerked a thumb, and they began to swim east, ascending slowly. His goodie bag was laden with conglomerate, which he pointed out to her before gesturing to her own empty one. She gave him the equivalent of a shrug and broke the surface just ahead of him. Bad luck, Red. She suffered his superior smile as they headed in. Maybe. Gripping the ladder of the adventure, she tossed her flippers up to where her father waited. Maybe not. How'd it go? Once his daughter was on deck, Ray relieved her of her weight belt and tanks. Noting her empty bag, he struggled to mask disappointment. Nothing worth bringing up, huh? I wouldn't say that.
Matthew commented. He handed Buck his full bag before unzipping his suit. Water dripped from his hair, pooled at his feet. Might be something worthwhile once we chip away at it. The boy's got a sixth sense about these things. Buck set the bag on a bench. His fingers were already itching to start hammering at the conglomerate. I'll work on it, Marla offered. She was wearing her flowered sun hat and a sundress of canary yellow that set off her flame-colored hair. I just want to get some videos first. Tate, you and Matthew have a nice cold drink and something to eat. I know these two want to go down and try their luck. Sure, Tate pushed her wet hair back from her face. Oh, and, um, speaking of luck, she pulled the wrists of her wetsuit. A half dozen coins fell jingling to the deck. I had a little myself. Son of a bitch, Matthew crouched down. He knew by the weight and the shape what she'd found. While the others erupted with excitement, he rubbed a coin between his fingers and looked up coolly into Tate's self-satisfied smile. He didn't begrudge her the find, but he sure as hell hated that she'd managed to make him look like a fool. Where'd you find them? A couple of yards north of where you were harvesting your rocks. She decided the way annoyance narrowed his eyes almost made up for the sword. You were so busy, I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah, I bet. Spanish. Ray stared down at the coin nestled in his palm. 1733. This could be it. The date's right. Could be from the other ships, Matthew responded. Time, current, storms, they spread things out. They could just as easily be from the Isabella or Santa Marguerite. There was a fever in Buck's eyes. Ray and me, we'll concentrate on the area where you found these. He rose from his crouched position, held out a coin to Tate. These'll go in the kitty, but I figure you ought to keep one for yourself. That's it right with you, Matthew. Sure. He shrugged his shoulders before turning to the ice chest. No big deal. It is to me, Tate murmured as she accepted the coin from Buck. It's the first time I've ever found coins. Pieces of eight. She laughed and leaned forward to give Buck an impulsive kiss. What a feeling. His ruddy cheeks darkened. Women had always remained a mystery to him and mostly at a distance. You hold on to it. That feeling. Sometimes it's a long stretch before you have it again. He slapped Ray on the back. Let's suit up, partner. Within thirty minutes, the second team was underway. Marla had spread out a drop cloth and was busily chipping away at the conglomerate. Tate postponed lunch to clean the silver coins. Nearby, Matthew sat on the deck and polished off his second BLT. I tell you, Marla, I might just shanghai you. You sure have a way of putting food together. Anybody can make a sandwich. Her hammer rang in counterpoint to her molasses-drenched voice. You'll have to have dinner with us, Matthew. Then you'll see what cooking's all about. He was sure he heard Tate's teeth gnash. Love to. I can run over to St. Kitts for you if you need any supplies. That's very sweet. She'd changed into work shorts and an oversized shirt and was sweating. Somehow she still managed to look like a southern belle planning a tea party. I could use a little fresh milk to make biscuits. Biscuits? Marla, for homemade biscuits, I'd swim back from the island with the whole cow. He was rewarded by her quick, infectious laughter. Just a gallon will do me. Oh, not this minute, she said, waving him back when he started to rise. Plenty of time. You enjoy your lunch in the sunshine. Stop trying to charm my mother, Tate said under her breath. Matthew scooted closer. I like your mother. You've got her hair, he murmured. Her eyes, too. He picked up another section of sandwich, bit in. Too bad you don't take after her otherwise. I also have her delicate bone structure, Tate said with a clenched-toothed smile. Matthew took his time with his study. Yeah, I guess you do. Suddenly uncomfortable, she shifted back an inch. You're crowding me, she complained, just like you do on a dive. Here, take a bite. He held out the sandwich, nearly plowing it into her mouth so that she had little choice but to accept. I've decided you're my good luck charm. Rather than choke, she swallowed. 
I beg your pardon? There's a nice southern flow to the way you say that, he observed. Just a hint of ice under the honey. My good luck charm, he repeated, because you were around when I found the sword. You were around when I found it. Whatever. There are a couple of things I don't turn my back on. A man with greed in his eyes, a woman with fire in hers. He offered Tate more of the sandwich. And luck, good or bad. I think it would be smarter to walk away from bad luck. Facing it's better, usually quicker. Lassiter's have had a long run of the bad. With a shrug, he finished the sandwich himself. Seems to me you've brought me some of the good. I'm the one who found the coins. Maybe I'm bringing you some, too. I've got something, Marla sang out. Come and see. Matthew rose, and after a moment's hesitation, held out a hand. With matching wariness, Tate took it and let him haul her to her feet. Nails, Marla said, gesturing with one hand as she dabbed a handkerchief over her damp face with the other. They look old, and this... She picked up a small disc from amid the rubble. Looks like some sort of button, copper or bronze, perhaps. With a grunt, Matthew crouched down. There were two iron spikes, a pile of pottery shards, a broken piece of metal that might have been a buckle or pin of some sort. But it was the nails that interested him most. Marla was right. They were old. He picked one up turned it in his fingers, imagining it once being hammered into planks that were doomed to storms and sea worms. Brass, Tate announced with delight as she worked off the corrosion with solvent and a rag. It's a button. It's got some etching on it, a flower, a little rose. It was probably on a dress of a female passenger. The thought made her sad. The woman, unlike the button, hadn't survived. Maybe. Matthew spared the button a glance. Odds are we hit a bounce site. Tate reached for her own sunglasses to cut the glare. What's a bounce site? Just what it sounds like. We probably found the spot where a ship hit while it was being driven in by the waves, the wreck somewhere else. He lifted his gaze, scanned the sea to the horizon. Somewhere else, he repeated. But Tate shook her head. You're not going to discourage me after this. We haven't come up empty-handed, Matthew. One full dive, and we have all this, coins and nails, broken pottery and a brass button. Matthew tossed the nail he held back into the pile. Chump change, Red, even for an amateur. She reached out and took hold of the coin that dangled around his neck. Where there's some, there's more. My father believes we have a chance at a major fine. So do I. She was ready to quiver with anger, he noted. Her chin thrust up, sharp as the spikes at their feet, eyes hard and hot. Christ, why did she have to be a college girl? He moved his shoulder and deliberately gave her a light, insulting pat on the cheek. Well, it'll keep us entertained, but it's more often true that where there's some, that's all. He brushed off his hands and rose. I'll clean this up for you, Marla. You're a real upbeat kind of guy, Lassiter. Tate tugged off her T-shirt. For some reason, the way he'd looked at her, just for an instant, had heated her skin. I'm going for a swim. Moving to the rail, she dove off the side. She's her father's daughter, Marla said with a quiet smile. Always sure hard work, perseverance, and a good heart will pay off. Life's harder on them than it is for those of us who know those things aren't always enough. She patted Matthew's arm. I'll tidy up here, Matthew. I have my own little system. You go on and get me that milk. Chapter 3 Tate found pessimism cowardly. It seemed to her that it was simply an excuse never to face disappointment. It was even worse when pessimism won out. After two weeks of dawn-to-dusk double-team diving, they found nothing but a few more scraps of corroded metal. She told herself she wasn't discouraged and hunted on her shift with more care and more enthusiasm than was warranted. At night, she took to poring over her father's charts, the copies he'd made from his research. The more cavalier Matthew became, the more determined was she to prove him wrong. She wanted the wreck now passionately, if only to beat him.
She had to admit the weeks weren't a total loss. The weather was beautiful, the diving spectacular. The time she spent on the island when her mother insisted on a break was filled with souvenir shopping, exploring, picnics on the beach. She hunted through cemeteries and old churches, hoping she might find another clue to the secret of the wrecks of 1733. But most of all, she enjoyed watching her father with Buck. They were an odd pair, one squat and round and cue ball bald, the other aristocratically lean with a mane of silvering blonde hair. Her father spoke with the slow, sweet drawl of coastal Carolina, while Buck's conversation was pepper-shot with oaths delivered with Yankee quickness. Yet they merged together like old friends reunited. Often when they surfaced after a dive, they were laughing like boys fresh from some misdemeanor, and one always seemed to have a tale to tell on the other. It was illuminating for Tate to watch the friendship bloom and grow so rapidly. On land, her father's companions were businessmen, a suit-and-tie brigade of success, moderate wealth, and staunch southern heritage. Here she watched him bronzing in the sun with Buck, sharing a beer and dreams of fortune. Marla would snap their picture or pull out her ubiquitous video camera and call them two old salts. As Tate prepared for her morning dive, she watched them arguing baseball over coffee and croissants. What Buck knows about baseball you could swallow in one gulp, Matthew commented. He's been boning up so he can fight with Ray. Tate sat down to pull on her flippers. I think it's nice. Didn't say it wasn't. You never say anything's nice. He sat beside her. Okay, it's nice. Hanging with your father's been good for Buck. He's had a rough time the last few years. I haven't seen him enjoy himself so much since... For a long time. Tate let out a long sigh. It was difficult to work up any annoyance with straight sincerity. I know you care about him. Sure I do. He's always been there for me. I'd do anything for Buck. Matthew pressed a securing hand to his mask. Hell, I'm diving with you, aren't I? With that, he rolled into the water. Instead of being insulted, she grinned and rolled in after him. They followed the marker down. They had been moving the search steadily northward. Each time they tried new territory, Tate felt that quickening surge of anticipation. Each time they went down, she told herself today could be the day. The water was pleasantly cool on the exposed skin of her hands and face. She enjoyed the way it streamed through her hair on her descent. The fish had grown used to them. It wasn't unusual for a curious grouper or angel fish to peer into her mask. She'd gotten into the habit of bringing a plastic bag of crackers or breadcrumbs with her and took a few minutes at the start of every dive to feed them and have them swirl around her. Invariably, the barracuda they'd dubbed Smiley came to call, always keeping his distance, always watching. As a mascot, he wasn't particularly lively, but he was loyal. She and Matthew developed an easy routine. They worked in sight of each other, rarely crossing the invisible line both recognized as separating their territories. Still, they shared their glimpses of sea life, a hand signal, a tap on the tank to point out a school of fish, a burrowing ray. He was, Tate decided, easier to tolerate in the silence of the sea than above it. Now and again that silence was broken by the blurred roar of a tourist boat above them. Tate had even heard the eerie echo of music from a blasting portable radio with Tina Turner's raw-throated voice wanting to know what love had to do with it. Singing in her head, Tate aimed for an odd formation of coral. She startled a grouper, who gave her one baleful glance before gliding off. Amused, she glanced over her shoulder. Matthew was swimming west, but was still in her line of vision. She flipped north toward the pretty soft reds and browns of the formation. Tate was on top of it before she realized it wasn't coral, but rocks. Bubbles burst from her mouthpiece. If she had been above the water rather than below, she might have babbled. Ballast rocks. Surely they had to be ballast rocks. From her studies, she knew the color meant galleon. Schooners had used the brittle gray egg rock, the ballast of a galleon, she thought with a dreamy sense of unreality, that had been lost, forgotten, and now found. One of the lost wrecks of 1733 was here, and she had found it. She let out a shout that did nothing more than spray bubbles that blurred her vision. Remembering herself, she slipped her knife from its sheath and rapped sharply on her tank. 
Turning a circle, she saw the shadow of her partner yards away. She thought he was signaling and, impatient, rapped again. Come here, damn it. She rapped a third time, putting as much insistence as she could manage into the one-toned signal. With satisfaction and the beginnings of smugness, she watched him cut through the water toward her. Be as irritated as you like, hot shot, she thought, and be prepared to be humbled. She could see the moment he recognized the stones, the slight hesitation in rhythm, then the quickening of pace. Unable to help herself, she grinned at him and attempted a watery pirouette. Behind his face mask, his eyes were blue as cobalt, intense, with a recklessness that had her heart thudding hard in response. He circled the pile once, apparently satisfied. When he took her hand, Tate gave his fingers a quick, friendly squeeze. She expected they would surface, announce her discovery, but he tugged her back in the direction from where he'd come. She pulled back, shaking her head, jerking her thumb up. Matthew pointed west. Tate rolled her eyes, gestured back toward the ballast pile, and started to kick toward the surface. Matthew grabbed her ankle, shocking her with the familiar way his hands worked up her leg as he drew her back down. She considered swinging at him, but he had her arm again and was towing her. It left her no choice but to go along and to imagine all the vicious things she would say to him once she could speak. Then she saw, and her mouth fell open in reaction. She readjusted her mouthpiece, remembered to breathe, and stared at the cannons. They were corroded, covered with sea life and half buried in the sand, but they were there, the great guns that had once graced the Spanish fleet, defended it against pirates and enemies of the king. She could have wept for the joy of it. Instead, she grabbed Matthew in a clumsy hug and spun him around in what passed for a victory dance. Water swirled around them, and a school of silver fish cut around them like blades. Their face masks bumped, and she bubbled out a giggle, still holding on to him as they kicked toward the surface forty feet above. The moment they broke through, she pushed back her face mask, let her mouthpiece drop. Matthew, you saw it. It's really there. Seems to be. We're the first to find it. After more than two hundred and fifty years, we're the first. His grin flashed, his legs tangling with hers as they tread water. A virgin wreck. And it's all ours, Red. I can't believe it. It's nothing like the other times. Someone else had always been there first, and we just puttered around what they'd overlooked or left behind. But this... She tossed back her head and laughed. Oh, God! It feels wonderful! Enormous! With another laugh, she threw her arms around him, nearly sinking them both, and pressed her lips to his in an innocent kiss of delight. Her lips were wet and cool and curved. The shock of them against his blanked his mind for a full three heartbeats. He wasn't fully aware that he tugged her lips apart with his teeth, slipped his tongue into her mouth to taste that he changed the kiss from innocent to hungry. He felt her breath hitch and her lips soften, then heard her low, catchy sigh. Mistake. The word flashed like neon in his brain, but she was pouring herself into the kiss now in a surrender as irresistible as it was unexpected. She tasted salt and sea and man, and wondered if anyone had ever sampled such potent flavors all at once. Sun-showered golden light, diamonds of it dancing on the water, the water cool and soft and seductive. She thought her heart had stopped, but it didn't seem to matter. Nothing mattered in this strange and lovely world but the taste and feel of his mouth. Then she was cut loose and floundering, the door to that fascinating world slamming shut in her face. She kicked instinctively to keep her head above water and blinked at Matthew with huge, dreamy eyes. We're wasting time. He snapped it at her and cursed himself. When she pressed her lips together as if to recapture the kiss, he bit back a groan and cursed her. What? Snap out of it. Somebody your age has been kissed before. The hard edge of his voice and the insult beneath it cut away the mists. Of course I have. It was just a gesture of congratulations. That shouldn't have left this hollow sensation in the pit of her stomach. Well, save it. We've got to tell the others and put out markers. Fine, she headed toward the boat with a quick, efficient crawl. I don't see what you're so mad about. You wouldn't, Matthew muttered and started after her. Determined not to let him spoil the most exciting day of her life, Tate clambered onto the boat.
Marla was sitting under the awning giving herself a manicure. One hand was already tipped with bright salmon pink. She looked over with a smile. You're early, honey. We didn't expect you up for another hour or so. Where are Dad and Buck? In the pilot house, studying that old map again. Marla's smile began to crumble at the edges. Something's wrong. Matthew? She scrambled out of her chair, panic darting out of her eyes. Her secret, never-voiced fear of sharks clawed at her throat. Is he hurt? What happened? He's fine. Tate unhooked her weight belt. He's right behind me. She heard his flippers hit the deck, but didn't turn to offer him a hand up. Instead, she took a deep breath. Nothing's wrong, Mom. Nothing at all. Everything's great. We found it. Marla had hurried over to the rail to make certain of Matthew's safety. Her heartbeat began to level again when she saw him whole and unharmed. Found what, honey? The wreck? Tate passed a hand over her face, stunned to see her fingers were trembling. There was a roaring in her ears, a flutter in her chest. One of them? We found it. Christ Jesus! Buck stood at the door to the deckhouse. His normally ruddy face was pale, the eyes behind his lenses stunned. Which one? he said in a strained voice. Which one did you find, boy? Can't say. Matthew shrugged off his tanks. His pulse was scrambling fast, but he knew it had as much to do with the fact he'd nearly devoured Tate as it did to the possibilities of treasure. But she's down there, Buck. We found ballast, galleon ballast, and cannon. He looked beyond Buck to where Ray stood, goggling. The other spot was a bounce site, like I figured, but this site has real possibilities. What? Ray had to clear his throat. What was the position, Tate? She opened her mouth, closed it again when she realized she'd been too enthralled to mark it. A flush bloomed on her cheeks. Matthew glanced at her, offered a thin, superior smile, before giving Ray the coordinates. We'll need to put out marker, boys. You guys want to suit up? I'll show you what we have. Then he grinned. I'd say we're going to put that nice new airlift of yours to use, Ray. Yeah. Ray looked at Buck. His dazed expression began to clear. I'd say you're right. With a whoop, he grabbed Buck. The two men hugged, rocking like drunks. They needed a plan. It was Tate who, after the noisy celebration that night, offered the voice of reason. A system was required in order to salvage the wreck and preserve it. Their claim had to be staked legally and concretely, and the artifacts had to be precisely catalogued. They needed a good underwater camera to record the site and the position of artifacts they uncovered, several good notebooks to use for cataloging, slates and graphite pencils for sketching underwater. Used to be, Buck began as he helped himself to another beer, a man found a wreck, and all it held was his. Long as he could hold off pirates and claim jumpers, you had to be cagey, know how to keep your mouth shut, and be willing to fight for what was yours. His words slurred a bit as he gestured with his bottle. Now there's rules and regulations, and every bloody body wants a piece of what you find with your own work and God-given luck. And there's plenty who are more worried about some planks of worm-eaten timber than about a mother load of silver. The historical integrity of a wreck's important, Buck. Ray cruised on his own beer and the possibilities. It's historical value, our responsibility to the past and the future. Shit. Buck lighted one of the ten cigarettes he permitted himself a day. Time was we blurred a kingdom come if that's what it took to get to the mother load. Not saying it was smart. He chuffed out smoke and his eyes grew dim with memory. But it sure as hell was fun. We haven't any right to destroy something to get to something else, Tate murmured. Buck glanced over at Tate, grinned. Wait, girl, till you get a taste of gold fever. It does something to you. You see that glint come out of the sand? It's shiny and bright, not like silver. Could be a coin, a chain, a medallion, some trinket a long-dead man gave his long-dead woman. There it is in your hand, true as the day it was made, and all you can think about is more. Curious, she tilted her head. Is that why you keep going down? 
If you found all the treasure the Isabella and Santa Marguerite held, if you found it all and were rich, would you still go down for more? I'll go down till I die. It's all I know, all I need to. Your father was like that, he added, gesturing to Matthew. Whether he struck the mother load or came back with nothing but a cannonball, he had to go down again. Dying stopped him. That was all that could. His voice roughened as he looked down at his beer again. He wanted the Isabella. Spent the last months he lived figuring how and where and when. Now, we'll harvest her for him. Angelique's curse. What? Ray's brows drew together. Angelique's curse. Killed my brother, Buck said blearily. Damn witch's spell. Recognizing the signs, Matthew leaned forward, plucked the nearly empty beer from his uncle's fingers. A man killed him, Buck. A flesh and blood man, no curse, no spell. Rising, he hauled Buck to his feet. He gets maudlin when he drinks too much, he explained. Next, he'll be talking about Blackbeard's ghost. Saw it. Buck mumbled around a foolish smile. His glasses slid down his nose so that he peered myopically over them. Thought I did. Off the coast of Ocracoke. Remember that, Matthew. Sure, I remember. We've got a long day ahead of us. Better get back to the boat. Want some help? Ray Rose was surprised and a little chagrined to discover he wasn't entirely steady on his feet. I can manage. I'll just pour him into the inflatable, row him across. Thanks for dinner, Marla. Never in my life tasted fried chicken to match yours. Be ready at dawn, kid, he told Tate. And for a taste of real work. I'll be ready. Despite the fact he hadn't asked for help, she went to Buck's other side, draped his arm over her shoulders. Come on, Buck. Time for bed. You're a sweet kid. With drunken affection, he gave her a clumsy squeeze. Ain't she, Matthew? She's a regular sugar cube. I'm going down the ladder first, Buck. If you fall in, I might let you drown. That'll be the day. Buck chuckled, shifting his weight onto Tate as Matthew swung over the side. That boy'd fight off a school of sharks for me. Lassiter's stick together. I know. Carefully rocking a bit under his weight, Tate managed to maneuver Buck over the rail. Hold on now. The absurdity had her giggling as he swayed over the ladder, and Matthew cursed from below. Hold on, Buck. Don't you worry, girl. There isn't a boat been made that I can't board. God damn it, you're going to capsize us, Buck, you idiot. As the dinghy pitched dangerously, Matthew shoved Buck down. Water sloshed in, soaking both of them. I'll bail her out, Matthew. With a good-natured chuckle, Buck began to scoop water out of the bottom with his hands. Just sit still. Matthew took the oars out of the locks, glanced up to see the Beaumonts grinning over the side. I should have made him swim for it. Night, Ray. Buck waved cheerfully as Matthew rowed. There'll be gold doubloons tomorrow. Gold and silver and bright shiny jewels. A new wreck, Matthew. He mumbled as his chin dropped to his chest. Always knew we'd find it. it. Was the Beaumonts brought us the luck. Yeah. After securing the oars in the line, Matthew eyed his uncle dubiously. Can you make the ladder, Buck? Sure I can make the ladder. Got the sea legs I was born with, don't I? Those legs wobbled, as did the small raft as he weaved toward the side of the sea devil. Through more luck than design, he gripped a rung and hauled himself up before he could turn the inflatable over. Soaked to the knees, Matthew joined him on deck. Buck was weaving and waving enthusiastically to the Beaumonts. Ahoy the adventure! All's well! Let's see if you say that in the morning, Matthew muttered, and half carried Buck to the closet-sized wheelhouse. Those are good people, Matthew. First, I was thinking we'd just use their equipment, string them along, then take us the lion's share. Be easy for you and me to go down at night, lay off some of the best salvage. Don't think they'd know the difference. Probably not, Matthew agreed as he stripped the wet pants off his uncle. I gave it some thought myself. Amateurs usually deserve to be fleeced. 
And we fleeced a few, Buck said merrily. Just can't do it to old Ray, though. Got a friend there. Haven't had a friend like that since your dad died. There's his pretty wife, pretty daughter. Nope. He shook his head with some regret. Can't pirate from people you like. Matthew acknowledged this with a grunt and eyed the hammock strung between the cabin's forward and aft walls. He hoped to God he wouldn't have to heft Buck into it. You've got to get into your bunk. Yeah. Gonna play straight with Ray. Like a bear climbing into his cave, Buck heaved himself up. The hammock swayed dangerously before he settled. Should tell him about Angelique's curse. Thinking about it, but never told nobody but you. Don't worry about it. Maybe if I don't tell them, they won't be jinxed by it. Don't want to see anything happen to them. They'll be fine. Matthew unzipped his jeans, peeled them off. Remember that picture I showed you? All that gold, the rubies, the diamonds. Doesn't seem like something so beautiful could be evil. Because it can't. Matthew stripped off his shirt, tossed it after his jeans. He slipped Buck's glasses off his nose, set them aside. Get some sleep, Buck. More than two hundred years since they burned that witch, and people still die, like James. Matthew's jaw set, and his eyes went cold. It wasn't a necklace that killed my father. It was a man. It was Silas Van Dyke. Van Dyke. Buck repeated the name in a voice slurred with sleep. Never prove it. It's enough to know it. It's the curse, the witch's curse. But we'll beat her, Matthew. You and me, we'll beat her. Buck began to snore. Curse be damned, Matthew thought. He'd find the amulet all right. He'd follow in his father's footsteps until he had it. And when he did, he'd take his revenge on the bastard who had murdered James Lassiter. In his underwear, he stepped out of the cabin into the balmy, star-splattered night. The moon hung, a silver coin struck in half. He settled under it in his own hammock, far enough away that his uncle's habitual snoring was only a low hum. There was a necklace, a chain of heavy gold links, and a pendant etched with names of doomed lovers and studded with rubies and diamonds. He'd seen the pictures, read the sketchy documentation his father had unearthed. He knew the legend as well as a man might know fairy tales recited to him as a child at bedtime. A woman burned at the stake, condemned for witchcraft and murder. Her final promise that any who profited from her death would pay in kind. The doom and despair that had followed the path of the necklace for two centuries. The greed and lust that had caused men to kill for it and women to plot. He might even believe the legend but it meant only that the greed and the lust had caused the doom and despair. A priceless jewel needed no curse to drive men to murder. That he was sure of. That he knew too well. Angelique's curse had been the motive behind his father's death. But it was a man who had planned it, executed it. Silas Van Dyke. Matthew could conjure up his face if he needed to, the voice, the build, even the smell. No matter how many years passed, he forgot nothing. And he knew, as he had known as a helpless, grief-ravaged teenager, that one day he would find the amulet and use it against Van Dyke for revenge. It was odd that with such dark and violent thoughts hovering in his mind as he drifted to sleep, he would dream of Tate. Swimming in impossibly clear waters, free of weight, of equipment, slick and agile as a fish, deeper and deeper to where the sun could no longer penetrate. The fans waved and toothy clumps of colors gleamed like jewels and carried bright fish in their pockets. Still deeper to where the colors, reds and oranges and yellows, faded to cool, cool blue. Yet there was no pressure, no need to equalize, no fears, only a bursting sense of freedom that mellowed into complete and utter contentment. He could stay here forever in this soundless world, with nothing on his back, neither tanks nor worries. There, there below him, a child's fairy tale image of a sunken ship, the masts, the hull, the tattered flags waving in the current. It lay tilted in the bed of sand, impossibly whole and impossibly clear. He could see the cannons still aimed against ancient enemies, 
and the wheel, waiting for its captain ghost to take it. Delighted, he swam toward it, through swirls of fish, past an octopus that curled its tentacles and ballooned away under the shadow of a giant ray that danced overhead. He circled the deck of the Spanish galleon, read the proud lettering that christened her the Isabella. The crow's nest creaked above him like a tree in the wind. Then he saw her. Like a mermaid, she hovered just out of reach, smiling a siren's smile, gesturing with lovely, graceful hands. Her hair was long, not a flaming cap, but long silken ropes of fire waving and swirling over her shoulders and naked breasts. Her skin was like a pearl, white and gleaming. Her eyes were the same, green and amused. As if a tide had swept him, he was helpless to do anything but go to her. Her arms went around him, satin chains. Her lips parted for his and were sweet as honey. When he touched her, it was as if he'd waited all his life for that alone. The feel of her skin sliding under his hand, the quiver of muscle as he aroused her, the drum of pulse under flesh. The taste of her sigh was in his mouth, then the slick and glorious heat enveloped as he slid inside her, as her legs wrapped around him and her body bowed back to take him deeper. It was all dreamy movements, endless sensation. They drifted, rolling through the water in a soundless mating that left him weak and stunned and blissfully happy. He felt himself spill into her. Then she kissed him, softly, deeply, and with incredible sweetness. When he saw her face again, she was smiling. He reached for her, but she shook her head and danced away. He gave chase, and they frolicked like children, darting around the sunken ship. She led him to a chest, laughing as she tossed back the lid and revealed the mountain of gold. Coins spilled as she dipped her hand in. The glint was like sunlight, and scattered with it were jewels of great size, diamonds as big as his fist, emeralds larger than her eyes, pools of sapphires and rubies. Their color was dazzling against the cool gray of the world around them. He dragged his hand through the chest, spilled a shower of star-shaped diamonds over her hair, and made her laugh. Then he found the amulet, the heavy gold chain, the blood and tears that studded the pendant. He could feel heat from it as if it lived. Never in his life had he seen anything so beautiful, so compelling. He held it up, looked at Tate's delighted face through the circle of the chain, then slipped it over her head. She laughed, kissed him, then cupped the pendant in her hand. Suddenly fire exploded from it, a spear of violent heat and light that slammed him back like a blow. He watched in horror as the fire grew in size and intensity, covering her in a sheath of flame. All he could see were her eyes, anguished and terrified. He couldn't reach her. Though he fought and he struggled, the water that had been so calm and peaceful was a whirlwind of movement and sound. A tornado of sand funneled up, blinding him. He heard the lightning crack of the mast splitting, the sea-quake roar that burst through the bed of sand and silt to tear through the hull of the ship like cannon fire. Through it he heard screams, hers, his own. Then it was gone. The flames, the sea, the wreck, the amulet. Tate. The sky was overhead, with its half-disk of moon and splatter of stars. The sea was calm and ink-black, barely whispering against the boat. He was alone, on the deck of the sea devil, dripping sweat and gasping for breath. Chapter 4 Tate took two dozen pictures of ballast and cannon as she and Matthew explored. He humored her by posing at the mouth of a corroded gun, or manned the camera himself, to take shots of her among the rocks and patient fish. Together they attached a crusted cannonball to a flotation and sent it up to the second team. Then, after a tug on the line, the work began. Maneuvering an airlift well required skill, patience, and teamwork. It was a simple tool, hardly more than a pipe, four inches in diameter and about ten feet long with an air hose. Pressurized air ran into the pipe, rising and creating suction that would vacuum water, sand, and solid objects. It was as essential to a treasure hunter as a hammer to a carpenter. Used too quickly or with too much power, it could destroy. Used too carelessly, the pipe would become clogged with conglomerate, shells, coral. 
While Matthew ran the airlift, Tate examined and collected its fallout that spewed from the top of the pipe. It was hard and tedious work on both sides. Sand and light debris swirled, obscuring vision in a dirty cloud down current. It took a sharp eye and endless patience to search through the fallout, load the bits and pieces and chunks into buckets to be hauled to the surface. Matthew continued to make test holes with a steady, almost soothing rhythm. Stingrays basked in the fallout, apparently enjoying the massage of sand and small rock. Tate allowed herself to dream, imagining a slew of glinting gold bursting out of the pipe like a jackpot in a slot machine. Fantasies aside, she gathered fused nails, bits of conglomerate, and the shards of broken pottery. They were every bit as fascinating to her as gold bullion. Her college studies in the past year had accented her love of history and the fragments of culture buried in the shifting sea. Her long-term ambitions and goals were very clear. She would study, earn her degree, absorbing all the knowledge she could hold through books, lectures, and most of all by doing. One day, she would join the ranks of scientists who sailed the oceans, plumbed the depths to discover and analyze the relics of doomed ships. Her name would make an impact, and her finds, from doubloons to iron spikes, would matter. Eventually, there would be a museum carrying the Beaumont name filled with artifacts. Now and again, as she worked, she would catch herself falling behind because she'd pause to wonder over a broken cup. What had it held the last time someone sipped from it? When she nicked her finger on a sharp edge, she took it philosophically. The thin drip of blood washed away in the swirl. Matthew signaled her through the cloud. In the hole, perhaps a foot deep, she saw the iron spikes crossed like swords. Caught between their calcified tips was a platter of pewter. Forty feet of water didn't prevent Tate from expressing her glee. She caught his hand, squeezed it, then blew him a kiss. Efficiently, she unhooked her camera from her belt and documented the find. Records, she knew, were essential to scientific discoveries. She might have spent some time examining it, gloating over it unscientifically, but Matthew was already moving off to dig another hole. There was more. Each time they transferred the airlift, they would uncover another discovery, a clump of spoons cemented in coral, a bowl that, even with a third of it missing, caused Tate's heart to slam against her ribs. Time and fatigue ceased to exist. An audience of thousands watched the progress, small fish scanning the disturbed area for exposed worms. If one got lucky, dozens of others would rush in to search for food in a colorful flood of motion. At his usual distance, the barracuda remained like a statue, looking on in grinning approval. Matthew ran the lift like an artist, Tate thought, probing here, then shifting with a delicacy that seemed to remove sand a grain at a time. He brushed away silt clouds with a wave of the pipe. If the wall of sand was parted by an object, he would back off the pipe, work carefully to prevent damage. She saw with dazzled eyes a fragile piece of porcelain, a bowl with elegant rosebuds rimming its cup. He would have left it for the time being, knowing that something that fragile, when cemented to coral or some other object, could be snapped off at the slightest touch. But her eyes were so big with wonder, so bright with delight, he wanted to give her the bowl, see her face when she held it. Signaling her back, Matthew began the tedious and time-consuming process of whispering the sand clear. When he was satisfied, he handed her the pipe. Reaching below the bowl to the coral that had claimed it, Matthew worked it free. It cost him some skin, but when he offered it to her, the nicks and scratches were forgotten. Her eyes glowed, then filled so unexpectedly, both of them stared. Disconcerted, Matthew took the pipe back, jerked a thumb to the surface. He cracked the valve on the airlift, released a torrent of bubbles. Together, they swam up in the spray. She didn't speak, couldn't. Grateful they were hampered by the airlift and her last bucket of conglomerate, she reached the side of the adventure. Her father beamed over the side. You've been keeping us busy. He'd pitched his voice over the roar of the compressor, winced when Buck shut it off. We've got dozens of artifacts, Tate. He hauled up the bucket she held out. Spoons, forks, buckets, copper, coins, buttons. He trailed off when she held up the bowl. My God, porcelain, unbroken. Marla, his voice cracked on the name. Marla, come over here and look at this. 
Reverently, Ray took the bowl from Tate. By the time she and Matthew had gotten aboard, Marla was sitting on deck, surrounded by debris, the flowered bowl in her lap, her video camera beside her. Pretty piece, Buck commented. However casual the words, his voice betrayed his excitement. Tate liked it. Matthew glanced toward her. She was standing in her wetsuit, the tears that had threatened forty feet below, flowing freely. There are so many things, she managed. Dad, you can't imagine, under the sand. All these years under the sand, then you find them. Something like this. After rubbing the heels of her hands over her face, she crouched by her mother, dared to skim a gentle fingertip over the rim of the bowl. Not a chip. It survived a hurricane in more than 250 years, and it's perfect. She rose. Her fingers felt numb as she tugged at the zipper of her wetsuit. There was a platter, pewter. It's caught between two iron spikes like a sculpture. You only had to close your eyes to see it heaped with food and set on a table. Nothing I've been studying comes close to doing it, seeing it. I figure we hit the galley area, Matthew put in. Plenty of wooden utensils, wine jugs, broken dishes. Grateful, he accepted the cold juice Ray offered him. I dug a lot of test holes, about a 30-foot area. The two of you might want to move a few degrees north of that. Let's get started. Buck was already suiting up. Casually, Matthew walked over to pour more juice. Saw a shark cruising, he said in an undertone. It was well known among the partners that Marla paled and panicked at the thought of sharks. Wasn't interested in us, but it wouldn't hurt to take a couple of bang sticks down. Ray glanced toward his wife, who was reverently documenting the latest treasures on video. Better safe than sorry, he agreed. Tate, he called out. Want to reload the camera for me? Twenty minutes later, the compressor was pumping again. Tate worked at the big drop-leaf table in the deckhouse with her mother, cataloging every item they'd brought up from the wreck. It's the Santa Marguerite. Tate fingered a spoon before setting it in the proper pile. We found the ordnance mark on one of the cannons. We found our Spanish galleon, Mom. Your father's dream. And yours? And mine, Marla agreed with a slow smile. Used to be I just went along for the ride. It was such a nice, interesting hobby, I thought. It gave us such adventurous vacations and was certainly a change from our mundane jobs. Tate looked up, a pucker of a frown between her brows. I never knew you thought your job was mundane. Oh, being a legal secretary is fine, except when you start asking yourself why you didn't have the gumption to be a lawyer. She moved her shoulders. The way I was raised, Tate, honey, a woman didn't move in a man's world except to quietly pick up behind him. Your grandma was a very old-fashioned woman. I was expected to work in an acceptable job until I found a suitable husband. She laughed and set aside a pewter cup with a missing handle. I just got lucky on the husband part. Very lucky. This, too, was a new discovery. Did you want to be a lawyer? Never occurred to me, Marla admitted, until I was heading on toward forty. A dangerous time for a woman. I can't say I looked back when your father decided to retire. I did the same, and I thought I was more than content to drift with him, playing at treasure hunting. Now, seeing these things, she picked up a silver coin, makes me realize we're doing something important, valuable in its way. I never thought to make a mark again. Again? Marla looked up with a smile. I made my mark when I had you. This is wonderful, and it's exciting. But you'll always be treasure enough for your father and me. You've always made me feel like I can do anything. Be anything. You can. Marla glanced over. Matthew, come join us. I don't want to interrupt. He felt out of his depth and clumsy stepping into the family unit. Don't be silly. Marla was already on her feet. I bet you'd like some coffee. I've got fresh in the galley. Tate and I are organizing our treasure trove. Matthew scanned the scatter of artifacts over the table. I think we're going to need more room. Marla laughed as she stepped back in with the coffee. 
Oh, I like an optimistic man. Realistic, Tate corrected, and patted the seat on the settee in invitation. My diving partner is far from optimistic. Not certain if he was amused or insulted, Matthew sat beside her and sampled his coffee. I wouldn't say that. I would. Tate dived into the bowl of pretzels her mother set out. Buck's the dreamer. You like the life. Sun, sea, sand. Nibbling, she leaned back. No real responsibilities, no real ties. You don't expect to find some crusted chest filled with gold doubloons, but you know how to make do with the occasional trinket, enough to keep you in shrimp and beer. Tate, Marla shook her head, muffled a laugh. Don't be rude. No, she's hitting it. Matthew bit into a pretzel. Let her finish. You're not afraid of hard work because there's always plenty of time for lying in a hammock, snoozing. There's the excitement of the dive, of the discovery, and always the turnover value rather than the intrinsic value of some small booty. She handed him a silver spoon. You're a realist, Matthew. So when you say we'll need more room, I believe you. Fine. He realized no matter how he waited, he was insulted. He tossed the spoon with a clatter back onto the pile. I figure we can use the sea devil for storage. When she angled her chin, peered down her nose, he sneered at her. Buck and I can bunk here on deck. We can use the adventure for our workstation. We dive from here, we clean the conglomerate and artifacts here, then transport them to the sea devil. That seems very sensible. Marla agreed. After all, we have two boats. We might as well make full use of both of them. All right. If Dad and Buck agree, so will I. In the meantime, Matthew, why don't you help me bring in another load from on deck? Fine. Thanks for the coffee, Marla. Oh, you're welcome, sweetie. I'm going to have to run to St. Kitts later, Kate began as they started out, to have the film developed. Want to come with me? Maybe. She caught the edge to his voice and smothered a smile. Matthew, to stop his progress, she touched a hand to his arm. Do you know why I think we work so well together down there? No. He turned. Her skin was still an impossible alabaster even after weeks at sea. He could smell the cream she used to protect it and the perfume that was salt and sea air that clung to hair. But you're going to tell me. I think it's because you're realistic and I'm idealistic. You're reckless, I'm cautious. Contradicting traits inside ourselves and against each other. Somehow, we make a balance. You really like to analyze things, don't you, Red? I guess I do. Hoping he was unaware of how much courage it took, she shifted closer. I've been analyzing why you were so angry after you kissed me. I wasn't angry. He corrected evenly. And you kissed me. I started it, determined to finish it. She kept her eyes on his. You changed it. Then you got mad because it surprised you. What you felt surprised you. It surprised me, too. Lifting her hands, she spread them on his chest. I wonder if we'd be surprised now. He wanted more than anything he could remember. He wanted to swoop down and plunder that fresh and eager mouth. The hunger to take it came in swift, sharp waves and made his hands rough as they snagged her wrists. You're moving into dark water, Tate. Not alone. She wasn't afraid any longer, she realized. Why, she wasn't even nervous. I know what I'm doing. No, you don't. He shoved her back, arm's length, hardly realizing his hands were still cuffed around her wrists. You figure there aren't any consequences. But there are. If you don't watch your step, you'll pay them. A shiver worked up her spine, deliciously. I'm not afraid to be with you. I want to be with you. The muscles in his stomach twisted. Easy to say, with your mother in the galley. Then again, maybe you're more clever than you look. Furious, he tossed her hands down and strode away. The implication brought a bright bloom to her cheeks. She had been teasing him, she realized, taunting him to see if she could, needing to know if he felt even half of this draw toward her that she felt toward him. Ashamed, contrite, she hurried after him. Matthew, I'm sorry. Really, I... But he was over the side with a splash and swimming toward the sea devil. Tate let out a huff of breath. Damn it. 
The least he could do was listen when she apologized. She dived in after him. When she dragged herself onto the deck, he was popping the top on a beer. Go home, little girl, before I toss you overboard. I said I was sorry. She dragged wet hair out of her eyes. That was unfair and stupid. I apologize. Fine. The quick swim and cold beer weren't doing much to scratch the itch. Hoping to ignore her, he swung into his hammock. Go home. I don't want you to be mad. Determined to make amends, she marched to the hammock. I was only trying to. I was just testing. He set the open beer on the deck. Testing, he repeated, then lunged before she could draw in the breath to gasp. He hauled her onto the hammock atop him. It swung wildly as she clawed at the sides to keep from upending. Her eyes popped wide with shock when his hands clamped intimately over her bottom. Matthew! He gave her a quick, not altogether loving tap, then shoved her off. She landed in a heap on the butt he'd just explored. I'd say we're even now, he stated, and reached for his beer. Her first impulse was to spring to attack. Only the absolute certainty that the result would be either humiliating or disastrous prevented her. Mixed with that was the lowering thought that she'd deserved just what she'd gotten. All right. With calm and dignity, she rose. We're even. He'd expected her to lash at him, at the very least to blubber. The fact that she stood beside him, cool, composed, touched off a glint of admiration in his eyes. You're okay, Red. Friends again? She asked and offered a hand. Partners, anyway. Crisis avoided, she thought, at least temporarily. So, do you want to take a break? Maybe do some snorkeling? Maybe. Couple of masks and snorkels in the wheelhouse. I'll get them. But she came back with a sketchbook. What's this? A silk tie. What does it look like? Overlooking the sarcasm, she sat on the edge of the hammock. Did you do this sketch of the Santa Marguerite? Yeah. It's pretty good. I'm a regular Picasso. I said pretty good. It would have been great to see her like this. Are these figures measurements? He sighed again, thinking of amateurs. If you want to try to figure out how much area the wreck covers, you've got to do some calculations. We hit the galley today. He swung his legs over until he was sitting beside her. Officers' cabins, passengers' cabins. He laid a fingertip on the sketch at varying points. Cargo hold. Best way is to imagine a gull's eye view. To demonstrate, he flipped a page and began to sketch out a rough grid. This is the sea floor. Here's where we found the ballast. So the cannon is over here. Right. In quick, deft moves, he penciled them in. Now we dug test holes from here to here. We want to move more midship for the mother load. Her shoulder bumped his as she studied the sketch. But we want to excavate the whole thing, right? He glanced up briefly, then continued to draw. That could take months, years. Well, yes, but the ship itself is as important as what it holds. We have to excavate and preserve all of it. From his viewpoint, the ship itself was wood and worthless, but he could humor her. We'll be in hurricane season before too much longer. We could be lucky, but we concentrate on finding the mother load. Then you can afford to take as much time as you want on the rest. For himself, he'd take his share and split. With gold jingling in his pocket, he could afford the time to build that boat to finish his father's research on the Isabella, to find Angelique's curse and Van Dyke. I guess that makes sense, she glanced up, startled by the hard, distant gleam in his eye. What are you thinking about? It was foolish, of course, but she thought it looked like murder. He shook himself back. Here and now, he thought, was what mattered most. Nothing. Sure, it makes sense, he continued. Before long, word's going to get out that we've found a new wreck. We'll have company. Reporters? He snorted. They're the least of it. Poachers. But we have a legal claim, Tate began, and broke off when he laughed at her. Legal don't mean jack, Red, especially when you've got the Lassiter luck to deal with. We'll have to start sleeping as well as working in shifts he went on. If we start to bring up gold, Red, hunters will smell it from Australia to the Red Sea. Believe me. I do. And because she did, she hopped down to fetch the snorkeling equipment. Let's check on Dad and Buck. Then I want to get that film developed. 
By the time Tate was ready to go ashore, she had a list of errands in addition to the film. I should have known Mom would give me a grocery list. Matthew hopped into the adventure's little tender with her, cranked the engine. No big deal. Tate merely adjusted her sunglasses. You didn't see the list. Look! She gestured west where a school of dolphin leapt before the lowering sun. I swam with one once. We were in the coral sea and a school of them followed the boat. I was twelve. She smiled and watched them flash toward the horizon. It was incredible. They have such kind eyes. Tate rose as Matthew cut speed. She timed the distance to the pier, braced her legs, and secured the line. Once the boat was secure, they started across the strip of beach. Matthew, if we hit the mother load and you were rich, what would you do? Spend it. Enjoy it. On what? How? Stuff. He moved his shoulders, but he knew by now generalities wouldn't satisfy her. A boat. I'm going to build my own as soon as I have the time and means. Maybe I'd buy a place on an island like this. They moved by guests of the nearby hotel as they baked lazily in the lowering sun. Staff with flowered shirts and white shorts strolled across the sand with trays of tropical drinks. I've never been rich, he said half to himself. It couldn't be too hard to get used to it, to live like this. Fancy hotels, fancy clothes. Being able to pay to do nothing. But still, you'd dive? Sure. So would I. Unconsciously, she took his hand as they walked through the hotel's fragrant gardens. The Red Sea, the Great Barrier Reef, the North Atlantic, the Sea of Japan. There are so many places to see. Once I finish college, I'm going to see them all. Marine archaeology, right? It's right. He skimmed a glance over her. Her bright cap of hair was tousled by the salt and wind. She wore baggy cotton slacks, a skimpy T-shirt, and square black-framed sunglasses. You don't look much like a scientist. Science takes brains and imagination, not looks or fashion sense. Good thing about the fashion sense. Unoffended, she shrugged. In spite of her mother's occasional despair, Tate never gave clothes or style a thought. What's the difference, as long as you've got a good wetsuit? I don't need a wardrobe to excavate, and that's what I'm going to spend my life doing. Imagine getting paid to go on treasure hunts, to examine and study artifacts. She shook her head at the wonder of it. There's so much to learn. I never thought a whole lot of school myself. Of course, they had moved around so much he'd never had a choice. I'm more a fan of on-the-job training. I'm certainly getting that. They took a cab into town where Tate could drop off her film. To her pleasure, Matthew didn't seem to mind when she wanted to poke around the shops, dallying over trinkets. She sighed for a while over a small gold locket with a single pearl dripping from its base. Clothes were for keeping out the weather, but baubles were a nice, harmless weakness. I didn't think you went in for stuff like that, he commented, leaning on the counter beside her. You don't really wear any bangles. I had this little ruby ring Mom and Dad gave me for Christmas when I was sixteen. I lost it on a dive. It really broke my heart, so I stopped wearing jewelry in the water. She tore her eyes away from the delicate locket and tugged on his silver piece. Maybe I'll take that coin Buck gave me and wear it as a charm. Works for me. You want to get a drink or something? She touched her tongue to her top lip. Ice cream. Ice cream. He thought it over. Let's go. Sharing cones, they strolled along the sidewalk, explored narrow streets. He charmed her by plucking a creamy white hibiscus from a bush, tucking it carelessly behind her ear. While they shopped for Marla's essentials, he had her gurgling with laughter over the story of Buck and Blackbeard's ghost. We were off Okra Coke on Buck's birthday, his 50th. The idea of half a century behind him had Buck so depressed he'd finished off half a bottle of whiskey. I helped him work on the other half. I bet. Tate chose a bunch of ripening bananas and added it to her basket. He was going on about all these might-haves. You know what I mean. We might have found that wreck if we'd looked another month. If we'd gotten there first, we might have hit the mother load. If the weather had held, we might have struck it rich. Between the whiskey and the boredom, I passed out on deck. That melon's not ripe. This one. 
He switched fruit, chose the grapes himself. Anyway, the next thing I know, the engines are roaring and the boat's lurching off southeast at a good 12 knots. Bucks at the wheel screaming about pirates scared the shit out of me. I jumped up, tripped, knocked my head on the rail so hard I saw stars, nearly went overboard when he swung to starboard. He's yelling for me and I'm cursing him, fighting to stay upright as he circles the boat. His eyes are about six inches out from his face and white. You know he can't see more than three feet in front of him without his glasses. But he's pointing out to sea and shouting all this pirate can't. Avast, ahoy, shiver me timbers. Tate's laughter turned heads. He did not say shiver me timbers. Hell, he didn't. He nearly capsized us doing a jig and singing yo-ho-ho. The memory of it had a grin tugging at his mouth. I almost had to knock him out to get the wheel away from him. The ghost, Matthew, Blackbeard's ghost, don't you see it? I told him he wasn't going to be seeing anything either after I poked his eyes out. He tells me it's there, right there, ten degrees off the starboard bow. There's not a damn thing there but a little mist. But to Buck, it was Blackbeard's severed head, smoke curling from the beard. He claimed it was a sign, and if we dived there the next day, we'd find Blackbeard's treasure, the one everyone else figured was buried on land. Tate paid for the groceries. Matthew hefted the bags. And you went down the next morning, she said, because he asked you to. That, and because if I hadn't, I'd never have heard the end of it. We didn't find a damn thing, but he sure got over turning 50. It was nearly dusk when they got back to the beach. Matthew stowed the bags and turned to see Tate had rolled up her pant legs so she could stand in the surf. Light gilded her hair, her skin. Suddenly he was painfully reminded of his dream and how she had looked aglow in the water, how she had tasted it's so beautiful here, she murmured. It's like nothing else exists. How can there be anything wrong with the world when there are spots like this, when there are days like this? She was sure he was unaware that this had been the most romantic day of her life. Such simple things as a flower for her hair, a hand to hold as she walked along the beach. Maybe we shouldn't leave here, ever. With a laugh in her voice, she turned. Maybe we should just stay and... She trailed off, her throat closing at the look in his eyes. They were so dark, so intense, so suddenly focused on her, only her. She didn't think, didn't hesitate, but walked to him. Her hands slid up his chest, linked behind his head. His eyes stayed on hers, a dozen frantic pulse beats. Then he dragged her against him and flashed fire in her blood. Yes, She'd been kissed before, but she knew the difference between boy and man. It was a man who held her, drew from her. It was a man she wanted. Eager and quick, she pressed against him, racing her lips over his face in frenzied kisses until they found his again on a sob of pleasure. She was so slim, so willing, so avid to accept any demand. She flowed like water under each pass of his hands, and her mouth clung greedily to his. Each hum and whimper of desire that sounded in her throat cut through him, a blade of fire that ruptured new needs. Tate. His voice was rough, nearly desperate. We can't do this. We can. We are. God, she couldn't breathe. Kiss me again. Hurry. His mouth crushed down on hers. The taste of her seemed to explode inside him. Everything about it was painful, nearly agonizing, as heat would be after cold. This is crazy, he murmured against her mouth. I'm out of my mind. Me too. Oh, I want you, Matthew. I want you. And that struck him hard. He jerked back, gripped unsteady hands on her shoulders. Listen, Tate. What the hell are you smiling at? You want me, too. She lifted a hand, laid it gently against his cheek, and almost unmanned him. For a while I thought you didn't, and it hurt because I want you so much. I didn't even like you at first. I wanted you anyway. Jesus. To gain control of himself, he let his brow rest on hers. I thought you said you were the careful one. Not about you. Full of love and trust. She nuzzled into him, heart to heart. Never about you. When you kissed me the first time, I knew you were what I'd been waiting for. He had no compass, no direction, but he knew it was essential to reverse course. Tate, we have to take this slow. You're not ready for what I'm thinking of, believe me.
You want to make love to me. Her chin came up. Her eyes all at once were a woman's and just as mysterious. I'm not a child, Matthew. Then I'm not ready. And I'm not willing to do something that would hurt your parents. They've been straight with me and Buck. Pride, she thought. Pride, loyalty, and integrity. Was it any wonder she loved him? Her lips curved. All right, we'll take it slow. But it's between us, Matthew, what we decide and what we want. She leaned forward, touched her lips to his. I can wait. Chapter 5 Storms swept in and made diving impossible for the next two days. When the first wave of impatience passed, Tate settled down on the boat deck of the adventure to clean and catalog the pieces of the Santa Marguerite her father and Buck had brought up on the last dive. Rain drummed on the tarp stretched overhead. The islands had vanished in the mist, leaving only restless seas and angry skies. Their world had whittled down to water and each other. In the deck house, a marathon poker game was in progress. Voices, a laugh, a curse drifted out to her over the monotonous patter of rain. Tate cleaned the corrosion from a crudely made silver cross and knew she'd never been happier in her life. With a mug of coffee in each hand, Matthew ducked under the tarp. Want some help? Sure. Just looking at him had her heart cartwheeling into her throat. Is the poker game breaking up? No, but my luck is. He sat beside her, offered a mug. Buck just blew down my full house with a straight flush. I can never keep straight what beats what. I'm better at gin. She held up the cross. Maybe the ship's cook wore this, Matthew. It would have banged against his chest when he beat batter for biscuits. Yeah. He fingered the silver. It was an ugly piece, more likely fashioned by a blacksmith than a jeweler. Neither did it have weight. Matthew dismissed it as little value. What else you got here? These rigging hasps. See, they've still got traces of rope in them. Imagine, she handled the black metal reverently, how they would have fought to save the ship. The wind would have been screaming the sails in tatters. She looked beyond into the mist and saw what had been. Men clinging to lines and masts as the ship healed, passengers terrified, mothers holding their children while the ship pitched and healed and we're finding what's left of them. She set the fitting down and lifted a clay pipe with both hands. A seaman kept this tucked in his pocket, stood on deck after his watch to light it and enjoy a quiet smoke, and this tankard would have been filled with ale. Too bad it's missing the handle. He plucked it up, turned it over. He didn't want to admit her vision had moved him. Devaluates it. You can't just think about the money. He grinned. Sure I can, Red. You take the drama, I'll take the dough. But he cut off her objection with a quick, sneaky kiss. You look so cute when you're indignant. Really? She was young enough and in love enough to be flattered. Picking up her coffee, she sipped, watching him over the rim. I don't believe you're nearly as mercenary as you pretend. Believe it. History's fine if you can make something from it. Otherwise... It's just dead guys. He glanced up, barely noticing her frown. Rain's slowing down. We'll dive tomorrow. Restless? Some. The trouble is, hanging out here, having your mother put a plate under my nose every time I blink. I could get used to it. He lifted a hand, ran it over her hair. It's a different world. You're a different world. Not so different, Matthew she murmured, and turned her lips to his. Maybe just different enough. His fingers tensed, relaxed slowly. She hadn't seen enough of the world, his world, he thought, to know the difference. If he were a good man, a kind one, he knew he wouldn't be touching her now, tempting them both toward a step that could only be a mistake. Tate. He was riding the wire between pushing her away or bringing her closer when Buck stuck his head under the tarp. Hey, Matthew, you... Buck's jaw dropped open as they broke apart. His unshaven cheeks bloomed with color. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Matthew... While Buck searched for what to say, Tate calmly picked up her pen and cataloged the clay pipe. Hi, Buck. Tate sent him a bright, easy smile while the two men eyed each other uncertainly. 
I heard you were having a run of luck at the poker table. Yeah, yeah, I, uh... He jammed his hands into his pockets, shifted his feet. Rain's slacking off, he announced. Me and Matthew, we'll load this stuff up, store it on the sea devil. I'm just finishing cataloging. Meticulously, Tate capped the pen. I'll give you a hand. No, no, we'll do her. Buck dragged his hand out of his pocket long enough to shove his glasses back up his nose. Me and Matthew, we've got to do some tinkering with the engine over there anyhow. Your mama said something about you being on kitchen duty tonight. She's right, Tate said with a sigh. I guess I'll get started. She unfolded her legs and rose before tucking her notebook under her arm. I'll see you at dinner. The men said little as they wrapped and loaded the booty. Matthew's suggestion that they might need to rent a room or a garage for storage was met by a grunt and a shrug. Buck waited until they were putting toward the sea devil before he exploded. Have you lost your mind, boy? Matthew jogged the wheel slightly. I don't need you crawling up my back, Buck. If I've got to crawl up your back to get to your brain, then that's what I'll do. He rose smoothly when Matthew cut the engine. Haven't you got more sense than to mess around with that young thing? I haven't been messing around with her, Matthew said between his teeth. He secured the bow line. Not like you mean. Thank God for that. Agilely, Buck shouldered the first tarp, hooked his foot on the ladder. You got no business playing games with Tate, boy. She ain't a loose one. I know what she is. Matthew hauled the second tarp. And I know what she isn't. Then you remember it. Buck carried his tarp into the wheelhouse, unrolled it carefully on the counter. The Beaumonts are good, decent people, Matthew. And I'm not. Surprised at the bitterness in the tone, Buck looked up as Matthew set down his tarp. Never said you weren't good or decent, boy. But we ain't like them. Never have been. Maybe you figure it's okay to dally around with her before we move on, but a girl like that expects things. He took out a cigarette, lighted it, peering at his nephew through the smoke. You gonna tell me you're thinking about giving them to her? Matthew pulled out a beer, swallowed long to wash some of the anger out of his throat. No, I'm not going to tell you that. But I'm not going to hurt her either. Wouldn't mean to, Buck thought. Change your course, boy. There's plenty of females out there if you've got an itch. He saw the fury flash into Matthew's eyes and met it equably. I'm telling you because I'm the one who's got to. A man hooks up with a wrong woman, it can ruin both of them. Struggling for calm, Matthew set the half-drained bottle of beer aside. Like my mother and father? That's true enough, Buck said, but his voice had gentled. They set sparks off each other, sure. Got themselves tangled before either of them thought it through. Left them both pretty scraped up. I don't think she did a hell of a lot of bleeding, Matthew shot back. She left him, didn't she? And me? Never came back. Never looked back, as far as I can tell. She couldn't take the life. Ask me, most women can't. No use blaming them for it. But Matthew could. I'm not my father. Tate's not my mother. That's the bottom line. I'll give you the bottom line. Eyes heavy with concern, Buck crushed out his cigarette. That girl over there's having herself some fun and excitement for a few months. You're a good-looking man, so it's natural you'd be part of that fun and excitement. But when it's over, she'll go back to college, get herself a fancy job and a fancy husband. That leaves you high and dry. If you forget that and take advantage of the stars in her eyes, both of you'll be the worse for it. It wouldn't occur to you that I might be good enough for her. You're good enough for anybody, Buck corrected. Better than most, but being right for somebody's different. So speaks the voice of experience. Maybe I don't know a goddamn about women, but I know you. Hoping to calm the waters, he laid a hand on Matthew's rigid shoulder. We got a chance at the big time here, Matthew. Men like us look all our lives. Only a few of us find it. We found it. All we have to do is take it. You can make something out of yourself with your share. Once you do, there'll be plenty of time for women. Sure, 
Matthew picked up his beer, tipped it back. No sweat. There you go. Relieved, Buck gave his shoulder a slap. Let's take a look at the engine. I'll be right there. Alone, Matthew stared at the bottle in his hand until he'd willed back the clawing urge to smash it into jagged pieces. There was nothing Buck had told him that he hadn't already told himself, and less kindly. He was a third-generation treasure hunter with a legacy of bad luck that had dogged him like a bloodhound all of his life. He'd lived by his wits and the occasional flip side of that luck. He had no ties but to Buck, no property other than what he could strap on his back. He was a drifter, nothing more, nothing less. The prospect of fortune forty feet beneath his feet would make the drifting more comfortable, but it wouldn't change it. Buck was right. Matthew Lassiter, of no fixed address and less than four hundred dollars tucked into a cigar box, had no right picturing himself with Tate Beaumont. Tate had other ideas. It was frustrating to discover over the next few days that the only time she found herself alone with Matthew was underwater. Their communication and physical contact were hampered. She would change that, she promised herself as she searched the fallout from the airlift, and she would change it today. After all, it was her 20th birthday. Carefully, she picked among the nails, the spikes, the shells, eyes peeled for the valuables that scattered. Ship fittings, a sextant, a small hinged brass box, a silver coin embedded in a hunk of coral, a wooden crucifix, an octant, and a lovely china cup sliced delicately in two. All this she gathered, ignoring the pings of debris against her back, the occasional nick on her hand. A glint of gold shot by her. Tate's heart careened in her chest as she scanned the cloud for the telltale flash of it. The small, quick gleam had her darting forward, dipping toward the sand and sending the burrowing rays rising in a swirling cloud. Her mind was screaming treasure, doubloons, jewels of great price and age. But when her hand closed around the piece of gold, her eyes began to swim. It wasn't a coin or jewelry long buried beneath the waves, not a priceless artifact, but priceless nonetheless. She lifted the gold locket with a single pearl dripping from its point. When Tate turned back, she saw that Matthew was pointing the airlift pipe away and watching her. He sketched letters in the water with his finger. H.B.D. Happy birthday. With a gurgle of laughter, she swam toward him. Undaunted by tanks and hoses, she took his hand, pressed it to her cheek. He let it lay there a moment, then waved her away, his signal an obvious stop loafing. Once more the airlift sucked at sand. Ignoring the fallout, Tate carefully secured the necklace by looping it around her wrist. She went back to work with love soaring in her heart. Matthew concentrated on the offshore end of the ballast mound. Patiently he cut into the sand, creating an ever-widening circle with sloping sides. He was a foot down, then two, while Tate worked busily to pick through the fallout. A school of triggerfish darted by. Matthew glanced up and saw through the murky cloud that the barracuda was grinning at him. On impulse, he shifted his position. He wouldn't have considered himself superstitious. As a man of the sea, he followed signs and lived by lore. The toothy fish hovered in nearly the same spot day after day. It wouldn't hurt to use the mascot as a marker. Curious, Tate looked over as Matthew hauled the airlift several feet north where he was already forming a new hole. Tate let her attention drift and watched a kaleidoscope of fish whirl through the clouded water, hunting for the sea worms displaced by the cut of the pipe. Something clinked against her tank. Efficiently, she turned back to resume her chores. The first glint of gold barely registered. She stared through the roiling water at the bed of sand. The flashes of brightness were scattered around her like flowers that had just bloomed. Stupefied, she reached down and plucked up a doubloon. The long, dead Spanish king stared back at her. The coin dropped from her numbed fingers. In a sudden fever, she began to harvest them, pushing them into her wetsuit, jamming them into her lobster bag, and ignoring the solid objects that drifted down in the thick column of fallout. The conglomerate rained, but she was oblivious to it, face down, scanning the seafloor like a miner panning for gold. Five coins, then ten, twenty and more. Her breath rushed out in a shriek of laughter. She couldn't seem to get enough air. When she looked up, she saw Matthew grinning at her, his eyes dark and wild. 
Behind her mask, her face was bone white. They'd hit the mother load. He gestured to her. As if in a dream, she swam over and her trembling hand reached for his. Sand trickled down into the test hole, but she saw the sparkle of crystal from a perfectly preserved goblet, the sheen of coins and medallions, and everywhere the calcified shapes of artifacts, and there the blackened streak of sand that every hunter knew meant a river of silver. Behind them, the ballast pile loomed, and beneath, the shining prize of the galleon Santa Marguerite and all her treasure. There was a roaring in Tate's ears as she reached down and closed her hand over a thick gold chain. Slowly, she drew it up. From it dangled a heavy cross crusted by sea life and by emeralds. Her vision blurred as she held it out to Matthew. With sudden formality, she carefully lifted the chain over his head. The simple generosity of the gesture touched him. He wished he could have held her, told her. All he could do was point a finger up. He cracked the valve on the airlift and followed her to the surface. She couldn't speak. Even now it took all of her effort just to draw air in and out of her lungs. She was trembling like a leaf when she hoisted herself aboard. Strong arms lifted her. Honey, you okay? Buck's face, lined with worry, loomed over her. Ray, Ray, come on out here. Something wrong with Tate. Nothing's wrong, she managed and sucked in air. Just lie still. Fretting like a mother hen, he eased off her face mask and nearly shuddered with relief when he heard Matthew clattering over the side. What happened down there? He demanded without turning around. Not much. Matthew let his weight belt fall. Not much my ass. Girl's white as a sheet. Ray, get us some brandy here. But Ray and Marla were already rushing out. Voices buzzed in Tate's head. Hands were poking and probing for injury. She got her breath back on a giggle then couldn't stop. I'm all right. She had to press both hands over her mouth to hold back a fresh stream of hysterical laughter. I'm fine. We're both fine, aren't we, Matthew? Fine and dandy, he agreed. We just had a little excitement. Come on, honey. Let's get you out of that suit. With some impatience, Marla shot a glance at Matthew. Just what kind of excitement? Tate shaking. I can explain. Tate snorted behind her hands. I gotta get up. Would you let me up? Tears began to stream from her eyes as she fought to control the laughter. Brushing away restraining hands, she got unsteadily to her feet. Trembling with breathless giggles, she upended her goodie bag, tugged open her suit. Coins rained gold onto the deck. Buck me, Buck croaked and sat down heavily. We found the mother load. Tate threw back her head and screamed at the sun. We've found the mother load! She threw her arms around her father, whirled him into a dance, only to break off and swing her mother. She planted a big smacking kiss on Buck's bald head as he continued to sit and stare at the coins at his feet. With their voices babbling around her, Tate turned a circle and launched herself into Matthew's arms. By the time he'd managed to regain his balance, her mouth was clinging to his. His hands went to her shoulders. He knew he should push her away, keep the kiss a product of the moment's excitement. But a current of helplessness swamped him, and his hands slid to her back, crossed, and braced. So it was she who drew away, her eyes still glowing, her face flushed now and eager. I thought I was going to faint. When I looked down and saw the coins, all the blood drained out of my head. The only other time I've felt like that is when you kissed me. When not a bad team. He ran a hand over her hair. We're a great team. She clamped a hand over his and dragged him to where Buck and Ray were already suiting up. You should have seen it, Dad. Matthew moved the airlift like it was a divining rod. Happily recounting every minute of the discovery, she helped Buck and her father with their tanks. Only Matthew noticed that Marla remained silent, and the warmth in her eyes had been cooled by concern. I'm going down to take pictures, Tate announced, hooking on fresh tanks. We have to document everything. Before we're done, we'll have the cover of National Geographic. Don't go pulling them in yet. Buck sat on the side, rinsed his mask. We gotta keep this quiet. He looked around as if expecting a dozen boats to come speeding in on the claim. Finds like this are one in a million, and there are plenty who'd do whatever it took to get a piece. Tate only grinned. Eat your heart out, Jacques Cousteau, she said, and rolled into the water. Get some champagne, chillin'.
Ray called to his wife. We'll have a double celebration tonight. Tate's earned herself a hell of a birthday party. He flashed a smile at Buck. Ready, partner? Ready and willing, hoss. After lowering the airlift, they disappeared beneath the surface. Matthew fueled the compressor, murmuring a thanks when Marla brought him a tall, frosted glass of lemonade. An exciting day, she commented. Yeah, you don't get many like this. No, twenty years ago today I thought this is the happiest I can ever be. She sat on a deck chair, tilted her sun hat to shade her eyes. But over the years I've had a lot of happy moments. Tate's been a joy to her father and me right from the first. She's bright, eager, generous. And you want me to keep my distance, Matthew concluded. I'm not sure. Marla sighed, tapped her finger against her own glass. I'm not blind, Matthew. I've seen the signs between the two of you. It's natural enough. You're healthy, attractive people, working and living in close quarters. He took off the cross, ran a thumb over the glint of grass-green stones, like Tate's eyes, he thought, and set the chain aside. Nothing's happened. I appreciate your telling me that, but you see, if I haven't given Tate the foundation to know how to make her own decisions, then I've failed as a parent. I don't believe I have. She smiled a little. That doesn't stop me from worrying. She has so much ahead of her. I can't help wanting her to have all of it, and at the right time. I suppose what I'm asking you to do is be careful with her. If she's in love with you, we haven't talked about that, Matthew said quickly. Under other circumstances, Marla might have smiled at the panic in his voice. If she's in love with you, Marla repeated, it will block everything else. Tate thinks with her heart. Oh, she thinks she's practical, sensible, and she is, until her emotions are stirred. So be careful with her. Now she did smile and rose. I'm going to fix you some lunch. Laying a hand on his arm, she lifted to her toes and kissed his cheek. Sit in the sun, honey, and enjoy your moment of triumph. Chapter 6 In a matter of days, the seabed was riddled with holes. The Santa Marguerite gave up her stores generously. Between the airlift and the simple tools of coal shovel and bare hands, the team mined both the spectacular and the ordinary. A wooden worm-eaten bowl, a dazzling gold chain, pipe bowls and spoons, a sumptuous cross crusted with pearls, all were lifted from the sandy vault where they had rested for centuries and hauled into the light in buckets. Now and again a pleasure boat would cruise by and hail the adventure. If Tate was on board, she would lean on the rail and chat. There was no disguising the murky cloud from the airlift that stained the surface. Word of the underwater excavation was spreading. They were careful to downplay their progress, but each day they worked harder and faster as the prospect of rival treasure hunters arriving increased. A legal claim don't mean squat to some of these pirates, Buck told her. He zipped his thick torso into his wetsuit. You gotta be alert and you gotta be tough. He winked at her as he passed her his glasses. And cagey. We'll dig out that mother load, Tate, and we'll play her out. I know we will. She handed him his face mask. We've already found more than I ever imagined. You start imagining bigger. He grinned, spat into his mask. It's good having a couple of young ones like you and Matthew along. Figure you could work 20 hours out of 24 if you had to. You're a good diver, girl, and a good hunter. Thanks, Buck. Don't know many females who can handle it. Her brow shot up as he rinsed out his mask. Really? Now, nah, don't go shooting that equal stuff at me. Just stating a fact. Plenty girls like to dive, all right, but when it comes to pulling their weight on a dig, they ain't got what it takes. You do. She thought it through, then smiled at him. I'll take that as a compliment. Should. Best damn team I ever worked with. He settled into position, slapped a hand on Ray's shoulder. Since I hunted with my old man and my brother... Of course, once we get it all up, I'm going to have to kill Hoss here. Buck grinned as he lowered his mask into place. Figure on beating him to death with his own flippers. I'm on to you, Buck. Ray slipped over the side. 
I've already decided to smother you with a boat cushion. The treasure's mine. He let out a wild, evil laugh. Mine, do you hear? All mine. Rolling his eyes madly, Ray plugged in his mouthpiece and did a surface dive. I'm after you, hoss. Gonna run him through with a coal shovel, Buck promised, and splashed into the water. They're crazy, Tate decided, like a couple of bad little boys playing hooky. She turned to grin at Matthew. I've never seen Dad have so much fun. Buck's not this loose unless he's got a quart of whiskey in him. It's not just the treasure. She held out a hand so that he would join her at the rail. No, I guess it's not. Looking out over the water, Matthew linked his fingers with hers. But it helps. She leaned her head on his shoulder and chuckled. It doesn't hurt, but they'd have clicked without it. So would we. She turned her head so that her lips could graze his jaw. We'd have found each other, Matthew. We were supposed to. Like we were supposed to find the marguerite. No. She turned into his arms. Like this. Her lips were warm and soft, irresistible. He could feel himself sinking into them, slowly, weightlessly, until he was steeped in the seduction that was Tate. She seemed to surround him, tastes and scents and flavors so unique he would have recognized them, recognized her, if he'd been deaf, dumb, and blind. There had never been another woman who could twist his system into such shivering, slippery knots with one quiet kiss. He wanted her so desperately it terrified him. And when she drew away, her eyes dreamy, her lips curved, he knew she had no notion of his need, his desperation, or his terror. What's wrong? Tate lifted a hand to his cheek. You look so serious. No, nothing. Pull yourself together, Lassiter. She's not ready for what's running through your mind. With an effort, he smiled. I was just thinking it's too bad. What is? That after Buck takes care of Ray, I'll have to get rid of you. Oh, willing to play, she tilted her head. And just how do you propose to do that? I figured I'd just strangle you. He circled her throat with his hand, then tossed you overboard. We're going to keep Marla, though. Chain her to the stove. A man's got to eat. Very practical of you. Of course, that only works if I don't get you first. She wiggled her brows, then dug her fingers into his ribs. Helpless laughter buckled his knees. He made a weak grab, but she was darting away. By the time he'd gotten his breath back, she was around the starboard side of the deckhouse. Want to play rough? He charged the port side to cut her off. He'd nearly made the bow when he saw her and the bucket. Before he could dodge, she'd heaved the load of cool seawater. While he choked and dripped, she held her sides. But when he'd blinked the stinging water out of his eyes, she saw their intent. With a shriek, she went into full retreat. Her only mistake was in dropping the bucket. Marla came out of the deck house where she'd been cleaning cob coins and ran headlong into Tate. Goodness, is there a war? Mom! Giddy with laughter, Tate ducked behind her mother just as Matthew rounded the cabin, armed with a freshly loaded bucket. He skidded to a halt. You better stand aside, Marla. This could get messy. Choking with laughter, Tate wrapped her arms around her mother's waist, using her ruthlessly as a shield. She's not going anywhere. Now, children, Marla patted Tate's hand. Behave. She started it. Matthew claimed. He couldn't wipe the grin off his face. It had been years since he had felt this free, this foolish. Come on, coward. Stand clear and take your medicine. No way! Smug, Tate sneered at him. You lose, Lassiter. You wouldn't use that with my mother between us. He narrowed his eyes, frowned down at the bucket. When he looked back up, Tate was fluttering her lashes at him. Sorry, Marla, he said, and drenched them both. Female shrieks rang in his ears as he raced to the side for more ammunition. It was a messy battle, ripe with ambush and retaliation. Since Marla threw herself into the war with an enthusiasm Matthew hadn't anticipated, he found himself outgunned and outmaneuvered. He did the manly thing. He dived overboard. Good aim, Mom, Tate managed, before she collapsed weakly against the rail. Well, Marla fluffed a hand over her tangled hair. I did what had to be done. She'd lost her hat somewhere during combat, and her crisp blouse and shorts were limp and running with water. Still, she was all gracious southern hospitality as she peered over to where Matthew was warily treading water. You give up, Yankee? Yes, ma'am. I know when I'm licked. 
Then haul yourself aboard, honey. I was about to fix up some nice beer-battered shrimp when I was interrupted. He swam toward the ladder, but shot Tate a cautious look. Truce? Truce, she agreed, and held out a hand. When their hands locked, she slitted her eyes. Don't even think about it, Lassiter. He had. The idea of toppling her into the water had its merits, but it wasn't nearly as much fun since she was on to him. Revenge could wait. He dropped lightly on deck, slicked his hair out of his eyes. That cooled us off anyway. I never thought you'd blast Mom, he grinned, settled on a boat cushion. Sometimes the innocent have to suffer. She's terrific, you know. You're lucky. Yeah, Tate settled next to him, stretched out her legs. She couldn't remember ever being more content. You've never mentioned your own mother. I don't remember her much. She took off when I was a kid. Took off? Lost interest, he said with a shrug. We were based in Florida then, and my father and Buck were doing some boat building and repair on the side. Things were pretty lean. I remember them fighting a lot. One day she sent me over to the neighbors, said she had errands to run and didn't want me underfoot. She never came back. It's terrible. I'm so sorry. We got by. And after so many years, the hurt had healed over with only the occasional unexpected throb. After my father died, I found divorce papers and a letter from a lawyer dated a couple of years after she'd left. She didn't want custody or visitation rights. She just wanted her freedom. She got it. You haven't seen her? It was incomprehensible to Tate that a mother, any mother, could walk so carelessly away from a child she had carried and held and watched grow. Never once since then? Nope. She had her life, we had ours. We moved around a lot, up the coast, California, the islands. We did okay. Better than okay now and then. We got work doing straight salvage up in Maine, and my father hooked up with Van Dyke. Who's that? Silas Van Dyke, the man who murdered him. But, she sat up, her face pale and tense. If you know who... I know, Matthew said quietly. They were partners for about a year. Well, maybe not partners so much as my father worked for him. Van Dyke picked up diving as a hobby and got interested in treasure hunting along the way, I guess. He's one of these business tycoons who figures he can buy anything he wants. That's the way he looked at treasure something to buy. He was looking for a necklace, an amulet. He thought he'd traced it to a ship that went down on the Great Barrier Reef. He wasn't much of a diver, but he had money, pots of money. So he hired your father? Tate prompted. The Lassiter still had a rep back then. He was the best, and Van Dyke wanted the best. My father trained him, taught him everything, and got caught up in the legend, Angelique's Curse. What does that mean? she demanded. Buck was talking about that. It's the necklace. Matthew rose to go to the ice chest, fished out two cans of Pepsi. Supposedly, it belonged to a witch who was executed in the 1500s somewhere in France. Gold, rubies, diamonds, priceless. But it's the power it's said to hold that caught Van Dyke's interest. He even claimed he had some sort of family connection way back to the witch. He sat again, passed her a chilled can, Bullshit, of course, but men kill for less. What kind of power? Magic, he said with a sneer. There's a spell on it. Whoever has it and can control it will have untold riches and power, whatever their heart desires. If it controls them, they lose whatever's most precious to them. Like I said, he added, swallowing deep. Bullshit. But Van Dyke's big on control. It's fascinating and she made up her mind to do some research on the legend at the first opportunity. I've never heard the story before. There's not a lot of documentation. Bits and pieces. The necklace bounced around, wreaking havoc, supposedly, and gaining a rep. Like the Hope Diamond? Yeah, if you go for that stuff. He eyed her. You would. It's interesting, she said with some dignity. Did Van Dyke find it? No. He thought my father had got the idea in his head that my father was holding back on him. He was right. Matthew took a long, cold drink. Buck told me that my father had found some papers that made him think the necklace had been sold to this rich Spanish merchant or aristocrat or something. He spent a lot of time researching, really got into it. He decided it was on the Isabella, but kept it between him and Buck. 
because he didn't trust Van Dyke. He should have trusted him less. The memory glinted like a sword in Matthew's eyes. I heard them going at it the night before that last dive. Van Dyke accused him of hiding the necklace. He still figured it was on the wreck they were digging. My father just laughed at him, told him he was crazy. The next day, he was dead. You never told me how he died. He drowned. They said it was bad tanks, that the equipment hadn't been properly rigged. That was a fucking lie. I was in charge of the equipment. There was nothing wrong with it when I checked it that morning. Van Dyke sabotaged it. And when my father was 80 feet down, he was taking in too much nitrogen. Nitrogen narcosis. Rapture of the deep, Kate murmured. Yeah. Van Dyke claimed he tried to get him up when he realized something was wrong, but my father fought him off. There was a struggle, he said. Van Dyke's story is he started up for help, but my father kept pulling him back. I went down right away once the bastard came up with a story, but he was already dead. It could have been an accident, Matthew. A terrible accident. It wasn't an accident. And it wasn't Angelique's curse the way Buck likes to think. It was murder. I saw that bastard's face when I brought my father up. His tensed fingers crushed the can in his hand. He was smiling. Oh, Matthew. To comfort, she cuddled against him. How horrible for you. One day I'll find the Isabella, and I'll find the necklace. Van Dyke will come looking for me. I'll be waiting. She shivered. Don't. Don't think about it. I don't very often. Wanting to change the mood, he draped an arm over her shoulders. Like I said, the past is past, and it's too nice a day to think about it. Maybe we should take some time off later in the week, rent some skis or try some parasailing. Parasailing? She looked up at the sky, relieved that his voice was casual again. Have you ever done it? Sure. The next best thing to being under the water is being over it. I'm game if you are. But if we're going to talk the rest of this crew into a day off, we'd better get to work. Get your hammer, Lassiter. It's back to the chain gang. They'd barely begun to work on conglomerate when they heard a shout over the port side. Tate brushed off her hands and strolled over. Matthew, she said in a thin voice. Come here, Mom. She cleared her throat. Mom, come out. Bring the camera. Oh, God, Hurry. For heaven's sake, Tate, I'm frying shrimp. Exasperated, Marla came on deck with the video camera swinging from her arm. I don't have time to take movies. Tate, with her hand vised on Matthews, turned and grinned idiotically. I think you'll want to take one of this. Marla scooted to Tate's other side, and the three of them looked over the rail. Both Buck and Ray bobbed in the water, faces beaming maniacally. Each gripped the side of a bucket that shimmered and dripped with gold doubloons. Jesus Christ, Matthew breathed. Is that thing full? To the brim, Ray called out, and we filled two more below. You ain't seen nothing like it, boy. We're rich as kings. Water trickled down Buck's face from his eyes. There are thousands of them, thousands just lying there. You gonna haul this up, or do you want us to pitch them to you one at a time? Ray howled with laughter, and the two men batted each other on the head. Coins spilled out of the bucket like loose fish. Wait, wait, I have to get you in frame. Marla fumbled, cursed, laughed. Oh, hell, I can't find the record button. I'll do it. Tate snatched the camera, bobbled it. Hold it steady, guys, and smile. They're going to drown each other. Matthew gripped the rope and drew the bucket up. Christ, it's heavy. Give me a hand here. Marla grunted, nearly upended over the rail, but hauled the rope with him while Tate gleefully recorded the scene. I'm going to go down with the underwater camera. Awed, she plunged her hand into the coins when Matthew set the bucket on deck. God, who would have imagined it? I'm up to my elbow in doubloons. Told you to imagine big, girl. Buck shouted, Marla, you get out your fanciest dress, cause we're going dancing tonight. That's my wife, pal. Not after I kill you, hoss. Gonna get another bucket. Not if I get there first. Tate sprang up and raced for her wetsuit. I'm going down with the underwater camera. I want to get this on film. Give them a hand. I'll be right with you. Marla. Matthew snapped his fingers in front of Marla's glazed eyes. Marla, I think your shrimp's burning. Oh, oh, my Lord.
Still clutching a handful of doubloons, she dashed to the galley. Do you know what this means? Tate demanded as she fought her way into her wet suit. That we're stinking rich. Matthew snatched her off her feet and whirled her around. Think of the equipment we can buy. Sonar, magnetometers, a bigger boat. She gave him a sloppy kiss before wriggling away. Two bigger boats. I'll get a computer for listing artifacts. Maybe we should get a submersible while we're at it. Good. Put that down. One submersible with robotics so we can mine the abyss on our next expedition. He hooked on his weight belt. What about fancy clothes, cars, jewelry? Not a priority, but I'll keep it in mind. Mom, we're going down to give Dad and Buck a hand. See if you can catch me some more shrimp. Marla poked her head out, held a platter filled with blackened blobs. These aren't fit to eat. Marla, I'm going to buy you a trawler of shrimp, another of beer. On impulse, Matthew caught her face in his hands and kissed her full on the mouth. I love you. Might try telling me that. Tate mumbled under her breath and then jumped off the side. She went in feet first, then tucked neatly and began to swim. Following the line, she kicked through the murky cloud and into the clear. There, Ray and Buck hovered at the bottom, a second bucket of gold beside them as they plucked through the pay dirt. She snapped a picture as Buck handed her father a blackened brick that was an ingot of silver. Fish swam around them, a living carousel as they mined the sand. Medallions, more coins, oblong bricks of discolored silver. Ray found a dagger, its handle and blade crusted with sea life. Feigning a dueling stance, he jabbed it playfully at Buck, who hefted an ingot and mimed a defense. Beside Tate, Matthew shook his head, circled his finger around his ear. Yes, she thought they were crazy. And wasn't it great? She swam clear to take her pictures from different angles. She wanted a good composition of the little pyramid of ingots, another of the odd sculpture of coins and metals fused together beside the glinting bucket. National Geographic, she thought gleefully. Here I come. The Beaumont Museum just found its cornerstone. She accepted the dagger her father offered. With her diver's knife, she scraped delicately at the handle. Her eyes rounded at the glint of a ruby. Like a buccaneer, she tucked it into her weight belt. Through signals, Buck indicated that he and Matthew would haul up the next load. Ray pantomimed opening a bottle of champagne, drinking. This met with unanimous agreement. Giving the OK sign, Buck and Matthew kicked toward the surface with a bucket between them. Tate gestured for her father to stand with one flipper poised on the pile of ingots and snapped pictures as he happily hammed it up for her. She was bubbling with laughter when she let the camera drop by its strap, and then she noticed the stillness. It was odd, she thought absently. All the fish were gone. Even Smiley seemed to have whisked himself away. Nothing stirred in the water, and the silence was suddenly and eerily heavy. She glanced up through the murk and saw the shadow of Matthew and Buck as they carried their rich burden to the surface. And then she saw the nightmare. It came so fast, so quiet, that her mind rejected it. First there was nothing but the figures of the men swimming through the cloudy water, the sun fighting through it in thin, misty streams. Then the shadow bulleted out of nowhere. Someone screamed. Later her father would tell her the sound had come from her and had alerted him, but by that time she was already clawing her way up. The shark was longer than a man, perhaps ten feet. In her horror, she could see that its jaw was already open for the kill. She saw the moment they understood the danger and screamed again because she knew it was too late. The men broke apart as if propelled. Gold poured down through the water like dazzling rain. With terror digging talons into her throat, Tate watched the shark take Buck in his vicious mouth, shake him like a dog shakes a rat. The force of the attack ripped off his mask and mouthpiece as the shark tore him through the blood-smeared water. Somehow her knife was in her hand. The shark dived, still thrashing as Matthew plunged his blade into its flesh, aiming for and missing the brain. The desperate jab left a gash, but the fish, frenzied on blood, held on to its prey and rammed his attacker. Lips peeled back from his teeth. Matthew stabbed and hacked. Buck was dead. He knew Buck was dead, and his only thought was to kill. The shark's black glass-like eye fixed on him rolled back white. Buck's body drifted free in the swirling blood as the fish sought fresh prey and mindless revenge. Matthew braced himself, prepared to kill or die, and Tate burst through the hideous murk like a warrior angel, an ancient dagger in one hand, a diver's knife in the other. 
He thought his fear had reached his limit, but it doubled then, almost paralyzed him as the shark turned toward the movement and charged her. Blind with terror, he kicked forward through the curtain of blood, rammed hard against the wounded shark to impede its progress. With a strength born of hot panic, Matthew plunged his knife into its back to the hilt and prayed as he had never known he could. Grimly he held on while the shark rolled and thrashed. He saw that while his blade had found its mark, so had hers. She'd ripped open its belly. Matthew let the carcass go and saw that Ray was struggling toward them with his knife freed in one hand while he hauled Buck's limp body. Knowing what the bloody water could bring, Matthew dragged Tate toward the surface. Get in the boat, he ordered, but her face was chalk white, her eyes beginning to roll back. He slapped her once, twice, until she focused. Get in the fucking boat. Haul anchor. Do it. She nodded, breath sobbing, and struck out in awkward strokes as he dived again. Her hands kept slipping on the ladder, and she'd forgotten to pull off her flippers. She couldn't find the air to call out. Her mother had turned on the radio, and Madonna was slyly claiming to be just like a virgin. Her tanks clattered on the deck, and the noise had Marla strolling over from the starboard side. In an instant, she was crouched beside Tate. Mama! Shark! Tate rolled over to her hands and knees and choked up water. Buck! Oh, God! You're all right! Marla's voice was high and thin. Oh, baby, are you all right? It's Buck. Hospital. He needs a hospital. Pull up the anchor. Hurry. Ray, Tate, your father. He's all right. Hurry. Radio the island. As Marla raced off, Tate pushed herself up. She dragged off her belt, turning her eyes away from the blood on her hands. She stood, swayed, bit her lip hard to keep from passing out. As she ran to the side, she dragged off her tanks. He's alive! Ray grabbed for the ladder. Between them, he and Matthew supported Buck's body. Help us get him on board. His eyes, full of horror and pain, met hers. Hold on to yourself, baby. As they lifted Buck's unconscious form into the boat, she saw why he had warned her. The shark had taken his leg below the knee. Bile rose to her throat. Grimly, she swallowed it, gritting her teeth until the nausea and dizziness passed. She heard her mother gasp, but when she turned, her movement slow and sluggish, Marla was moving forward briskly. We need blankets, Tate, and towels, plenty of towels. Hurry, and the first aid kit. Ray, our radio to head. They're expecting us at Frigate Bay. You'd better take the wheel. She pulled off her blouse, beneath which she wore a pretty white lace bra. Without a wince, she used the crisp cotton to staunch the blood at the stub of Buck's leg. Good girl, she murmured when Tate ran back with armloads of towels. Matthew, pack these around the wound. Hold them firmly against it. Matthew, her voice was dead calm and with enough steel to have his head jerking up. He needs lots of pressure on that leg, understand me? We're not having him bleed to death. He's not dead, Matthew said dully as she took his hands and pressed them to the towels she'd packed against the wound. There was already a sickening pool of blood welling on the deck. No, he's not dead, and he's not going to be. We'll need a tourniquet. Her eyes stung as she noticed Buck was still wearing his left flipper, but her hands were quick and efficient. They never trembled as she fixed the tourniquet above the gory stump of his right leg. We need to keep him warm, she said calmly. We'll have him to the hospital in a few minutes, in just a few minutes. Tate covered Buck with a blanket, then knelt on the bloody deck to take his hand. Then she reached for Matthews and linked the three of them. She held on as the boat flew through the water toward land. Chapter 7 Matthew sat on the floor in the hospital corridor and tried to keep his mind blank. If he let down his guard, for even an instant, he was back in the bloody swirl of water, staring into the doll's eyes of the shark, seeing those wicked rows of teeth slice into buck. He knew he would see it hundreds, thousands of times in his sleep, the blinding scream of bubbles, the thrashing of man and fish, the blade of his own knife plunging and hacking. Each time the scene rolled through his brain, what had taken only minutes stretched hideously into hours. Each movement slowed into horrible clarity. He could see it all, from the first bump when Buck had shoved him out of the shark's attack path and through to the rush and noise of the emergency room. Slowly he lifted his hand, flexed it. He remembered how Buck's fingers had tightened on it, gripped hard on that race to the island. He'd known then that Buck was alive. 
and that was somehow worse, because he couldn't convince himself that Buck would stay that way. It seemed that the sea delighted in taking the people he cared for most. Angelique's curse, he thought on a wave of guilt and grief. Maybe Buck had been right. The fucking necklace was down there just lying in wait for a victim. The search for it had taken two people he'd loved. It wasn't going to get another. He opened his hand, rubbed it hard over his face like a man waking from a long sleep. He thought he must be going a little crazy, thinking this way. A man had killed his father, and a shark had killed Buck. It was a pitiful defense against his own failure to save them that had him blaming an amulet he'd never even seen. However bloody that ancient necklace and the lore surrounding it might be, Matthew knew he couldn't point the guilt at anyone or anything but himself if he'd been quicker— Buck would still be whole. If he'd been smarter, his father would still be alive. As he was alive. As he was whole. He would have to carry that weight for the rest of his life. For a moment, he rested his brow on his knees, fought to clear his head again. He knew the Beaumonts were just down the hall in the waiting room. They'd offered him comfort, support, unity, and he'd had to escape. Their quiet compassion had all but destroyed him. He already knew if Buck had even a slim chance of survival, it wasn't due to him, but due to Marla's quick, calm, and unflinching handling of a crisis. It was she who had taken control, even down to remembering to grab clothes from the boat. He hadn't even been able to fill out the hospital forms, but had only stared at them until she'd taken the clipboard from him, gently asked the questions, and filled in the blanks herself. It was frightening to discover that he was essentially useless. Matthew? Tate crouched in front of him, took his hands and wrapped them around a cup of coffee. Come in and sit down. He shook his head. Because the coffee was in his hands, he lifted it and sipped. He could see that her face was still pale and glossy with shock, her eyes red. But the hand she rested on his updrawn knee was steady. In one terrifying mental blip, he saw her hurtling through the water toward the jaws of the shark. Go away, Tate. Instead, she sat beside him, draped an arm around his shoulders. He's going to make it, Matthew. I know it. What? Are you a fortune teller now on top of everything else? His voice was cold and sharp. Though it wounded, she leaned her head on his shoulder. It's important to believe it. It helps to believe it. She was wrong. It hurt to believe it. Because it did, he jerked away from her, got to his feet. I'm going for a walk. I'll go with you. I don't want you. He whirled on her, letting all the fear, the guilt, the grief explode into fury. I don't want you anywhere near me. Her stomach quaked, her eyes stung, but she held her ground. I'm not leaving you alone, Matthew. You better get used to it. I don't want you, he repeated, and stunned her by putting a hand just under her throat and pushing her against the wall. I don't need you. Now why don't you go get your nice, pretty family and take off? Because Buck matters to us. Though she managed to swallow the tears, they roughened her voice. So do you. You don't even know us. Something was screaming inside him to get out. To keep it hidden, even from himself, he pushed her. His face, inches from hers, was hard, cold, merciless. You're just out for a lark, taking a few months in the sun to play at treasure hunting. You got lucky. You don't know what it's like to go month after month, year after year, and have nothing to show for it, to die and have nothing. Her breath was hitching now, no matter how she fought to control it. He's not going to die. He's already dead. The fury died from his eyes like a light switched off and left them blank and flat. He was dead the minute he pushed me out of the way. The goddamned idiot pushed me out of the way. There it was, the worst of it, out, ringing on the sterilized hospital air. He turned from it, covered his face, but couldn't escape it. He pushed me out of the way, got in front of me. What the hell was he thinking of? What were you thinking of? Matthew demanded, spinning back to her with all the helpless anger rolling back into him like a riptide, coming at us that way. Don't you know anything? When a shark's got blood, it'll attack anything. You should have headed for the boat. With that much blood in the water, we were lucky it didn't draw a dozen sharks in to feed. What the hell were you thinking of? You? She said it quietly and stayed where she was, backed against the wall. I guess both Buck and I were thinking about you. 
I couldn't have handled it if anything had happened to you, Matthew. I couldn't have lived with it. I love you. Undone, he stared at her. There had been no one in his whole life who had said those three words to him. Then you're stupid, he managed, and pulled unsteady fingers through his hair. Maybe. Her lips were trembling. Even when she pressed them hard together, they vibrated with the power of her roiling emotions. I guess you were pretty stupid, too. You didn't leave Buck. You thought he was dead and you could have gotten away while the shark had him. You didn't. Why didn't you head for the boat, Matthew? He only shook his head. When she stepped forward to put her arms around him, he buried his face in her hair. Tate. It's all right, she murmured, running soothing strokes up his rigid back. It's going to be all right. Just hold on to me. I'm bad luck. That's foolish. You're just tired now and worried. Come in and sit down. We'll all wait together. She stayed beside him. The hours passed in that dream state so common to hospitals. People came and went. There was the soft flap of crepe-soled shoes on tile as nurses passed the doorway, the smell of overbrewed coffee, the sharp tang of antiseptic that never quite masked the underlying odor of sickness. Occasionally there was the faint swish as the elevator doors opened and closed. Then softly, gently, rain began to patter on the windows. Tate dozed with her head pillowed on Matthew's shoulder. She was awake and aware the instant his body tensed. Instinctively, she reached for his hand as he looked toward the doctor. He came in quietly, a surprisingly young man with lines of fatigue around his eyes and mouth. His skin, the color of polished ebony, looked like folded black silk. Mr. Lasita. Despite the obvious weariness, his voice was as musical as the evening rain. Yes. Braced for condolences, Matthew pushed himself to his feet. I am Dr. Farge. Your uncle has come through the surgery. Please sit. What do you mean, come through? He has survived the operation. Farge sat on the edge of the coffee table, waited for Matthew to settle. His condition is critical. You know he lost a great deal of blood, more than three liters. If he had lost even a fraction more, if it had taken you even ten minutes longer to get him here, there would have been no chance. However, his heart is very strong. We're optimistic. Hope was too painful. Matthew simply nodded. Are you telling me he's going to live? Every hour his chances improve. And those chances are? Farge took a moment to measure his man. With some, kindness didn't comfort. He has perhaps a 40% chance of surviving the night. If he does, I would upgrade that. Further treatment will be necessary, of course, when he is stabilized and stronger. When this time comes, I can recommend to you several specialists who have good reputations in treating patients with amputated limbs. Is he conscious? Marla asked quietly. No. He will be in recovery for some time, then in our critical care unit. I would not expect him to be alert for several hours. I would suggest that you leave a number where you can be reached at the nurse's station. We'll contact you if there's any change. I'm staying, Matthew said simply. I want to see him. Once he is in CCU, you'll be able to see him, but only for a short period. We'll get a hotel, Ray rose, laid a hand on Matthew's shoulder. We'll take shifts here. I'm not leaving. Matthew, Ray squeezed gently. We need to work as a team. He glanced at his daughter, read what was in her eyes. Marla and I will find us some rooms, make the arrangements. We'll come back and relieve you and Tate in a few hours. There were so many tubes snaking out from the still figure in the bed. Machines beeped and hummed. Outside of the thin curtain, Matthew could hear the quiet murmurings of the nurses, their brisk steps as they went about the business of tending lives. But in this room, narrow and dim, he was alone with Buck. He forced himself to look down at the sheet, at the odd way it lay. He would have to get used to it, he thought. They would both have to get used to it, if Buck lived. He barely looked alive now, his face slack, his body so strangely tidy in the bed. 
Buck was a tosser, Matthew remembered, a man who tugged and kicked at sheets, one who snored violently enough to scrape the paint from the walls. But he was as still and silent now as a man in a coffin. Matthew took the broad, scarred hand in his, a gesture he knew would have embarrassed both of them had Buck been conscious. He held it, studying the face he'd thought he knew as well as his own. Had he ever noticed how thick Buck's eyebrows were, or how the gray peppered them? And when had the lines around his eyes begun to crisscross that way? Wasn't it strange that his forehead, which rose into that egg-shaped skull, was so smooth, like a girl's? Jesus, Matthew thought, and squeezed his eyes tight. His leg was gone. Fighting off panic, Matthew leaned down. He was nearly comforted by the sound of Buck's breathing. That was a damn stupid thing to do. You made a mistake getting in front of me that way. Maybe you figured on wrestling with that shark, but I guess you're not as quick as you used to be. Now you probably figure I owe you. Well, you've got to live to collect. He tightened his grip. You hear that, Buck? You've got to live to collect. Think about that. You kick off on me, you lose, and me and the Beaumonts will just split your share of the marguerite on top of it. Your first big strike, Buck. And if you don't pull out of this, you won't get to spend the first coin. A nurse parted the curtain, a gentle reminder that the time was up. It'd be a real shame if you didn't get to enjoy some of that fame and fortune you've always wanted, Buck. You keep that in mind. They're tossing me out of here, but... I'll be back. In the corridor, Tate paced, as much from nerves as the need to keep herself awake. The moment she saw Matthew come through the door, she hurried over. Did he wake up at all? No. Taking his hand, Tate struggled with her own fears. The doctor said he wouldn't. I suppose we were all hoping otherwise. Mom and Dad are going to take a shift now. When he started to shake his head, she squeezed his fingers impatiently. Matthew, listen to me. We're all a part of this, and I think he's going to need all of us, so we may as well start now. You and I are going to the hotel. We're going to get a meal, and we're going to sleep for a few hours. As she spoke, she drew him down the corridor. After sending her parents a bolstering smile, she steered Matthew toward the elevators. We're all going to lean on each other, Matthew. That's the way it works. There has to be something I can do. You're doing it, she said gently. We'll be back soon. You just need to rest a little. So do I. He looked at her then. Her skin was so pale it seemed he could pass his hand through it. Smudges of exhaustion bruised her eyes. He hadn't been thinking of her, he realized, nor had he considered that she might have needed to lean on him. You need sleep. I could use a couple of hours. Keeping her hand on his, she stepped into the elevator car, pushed the button for the lobby. Then we'll come back. You can sit with Buck again until he wakes up. Yeah. Matthew stared blankly at the descending numbers. Until he wakes up. Outside, the wind kicked at the rain, swept through palm fronds. The cab bumped along the narrow, deserted streets, its tires sluicing at puddles. It was like driving through someone else's dream, the dark, the huddle of unfamiliar buildings shifting in the glare of headlights, the monotonous squeak of the wipers across the windshield. Matthew fished Caribbean bills from his wallet as Tate climbed out. In seconds, the rain plastered her hair to her head. Dad gave me the room keys, she began. It's not the Ritz. She tried another smile as they entered the tiny lobby, crowded with wicker chairs and leafy plants. But it's close to the hospital. We're on the second floor. They took the steps with Tate jingling the keys nervously in her hand. This is your room. Dad said we were right next door. She looked down at the keys, studied the number. Matthew, can I come in with you? I don't want to be by myself. She shifted her gaze to his. I know it's stupid, but... It's okay. Come on. He took the key from her, unlocked the door. There was a bed with a spread of brightly colored orange and red flowers, a small dresser. The lamp's shade was askew. Marla had brought him a kit from the boat and had left it neatly at the foot of the bed. Matthew switched on the lamp. Its glow was yellowed by the crooked shade. Rain beat against the window in angry fists. It's not much, Tate murmured. Compelled, she reached out to straighten the lampshade as if the little homemaker's gesture would make the room less sad. Not what you're used to, I guess. 
Matthew strode into the adjoining bath and came out with a thin towel the size of a placemat. Dry your hair. Thanks. I know you need to sleep. I should probably leave you alone. He sat on the side of the bed, concentrated on removing his shoes. You can sleep in here if you want. You don't have to worry about anything. I wouldn't be worried. You should. On a sigh, he rose and, taking the towel, rubbed it briskly over her hair himself. But you don't have to. Take off your shoes and stretch out. You'll lie down with me? He glanced over as she sat and fumbled tiredly with the laces of her sneakers. He knew he could have her. One touch, one word. He could lose himself and all of this misery in her. She would be soft and willing and sweet, and he would hate himself. Saying nothing, he turned down the spread. He stretched out on the sheet, held out a hand to her. Without hesitation, she lay down beside him, curled her body to his, pillowed her head on his shoulder. There was one keen slice of need low in his gut. It mellowed to a dull ache as she settled her palm on his chest. He turned his face into her rain-scented hair and found a baffling mix of comfort and pain. Safe, lulled by trust, she let her eyes close. It's going to be all right. I know it's going to be all right. I love you, Matthew. She slipped into sleep as easily as a child. Matthew listened to the rain and waited for dawn. The shark shot through the water, a sleek gray bullet armed with ready teeth and a lust for blood. The water was red and roiling, choking her as she struggled to escape. She was screaming, gasping for air she couldn't find. Those jaws opened hideously wide, then closed over her with a pain too excruciating to name. She came awake with a scream locked in her throat. Curling into a ball, she fought her way out of the nightmare. She was in Matthew's room, she reminded herself. She was safe. He was safe. And she was alone. Lifting her head, she saw the murky sunlight just easing in the window. Panic came first that he had somehow gotten word that Buck had died and had gone back to the hospital without her. Then she realized what she thought was rain was the shower. The storm was over, and Matthew was here. She let out a long breath, pushed at her disheveled hair. She could be grateful he hadn't been with her when she'd had the nightmare. He was already carrying so much weight, she thought. She wouldn't add to it. She would be brave and strong and give him whatever support he needed. When the bathroom door opened, Tate had a smile ready. Despite her worries, her heart did a quick tumble at the sight of him, damp from his shower, bare-chested, his jeans carelessly unfastened. "'You're awake.' Matthew hooked his thumbs into his front pockets and tried not to think about how she looked sitting with her arms wrapped around her knees in the middle of the bed. I thought you might sleep a while longer. No, I'm fine. Suddenly awkward, she moistened her lips. The rain stopped. I noticed. Just as he noticed how big and soft and aware her eyes had become. I'm going to head back to the hospital. We're going back to the hospital, she corrected. I'll go shower and change. She was already climbing off the bed, picking up her key. Mom said there was a coffee shop next door. I'll meet you there in ten minutes. Tate? He hesitated when she stopped at the door, turned back. What could he say? How could he say it? Nothing. Ten minutes. They were back at the hospital in thirty. Both Ray and Marla rose from the bench outside of CCU where they had taken up the watch. They looked, Matthew thought, rumpled. It had always impressed him that no matter what the circumstances, the Beaumonts were so neatly groomed. Now their clothes were wrinkled and limp. Ray's face was shadowed by a night's growth of beard. In all the weeks they'd worked together, he'd never seen Ray unshaven. For reasons Matthew couldn't pinpoint, he focused on that one small fact. Ray hadn't shaved. They won't tell us much, Ray began, only that he had a restful night. They let us go in for a few minutes every hour. Marla took Matthew's hand, gave it a squeeze. Did you get some rest, honey? Yeah. Matthew cleared his throat. She hadn't brushed her hair, he thought foolishly. Ray hadn't shaved, and Marla hadn't brushed her hair. I want to tell both of you how much I appreciate. Don't insult us. Marla deliberately laced a scold into her voice. Matthew Lassiter, you use that polite tone with that polite phrase on strangers when you feel obligated, not with friends who love you. He'd never known anyone else who could shame and touch him at the same time. 
What I meant was I'm glad you're here. I think his color's better. Ray put an arm around his wife, gave her a quick, warm hug. Don't you, Marla? Yes, I do. And the nurse said Dr. Farge would be looking in on him shortly. Matthew and I will take over now. I want the two of you to go get some breakfast and a little more sleep. Ray studied his daughter's face, judged her fit, and nodded. We'll do just that. You call the hotel if there's any change. Otherwise, we'll be back by noon. When they were alone, Tate took Matthew's hand. Let's go see him. Maybe his color was better, Matthew thought a few moments later when he stood over his uncle's bed. Buck's face was still drawn, but that horrible gray wash had faded. His chances go up every hour, Tate reminded him, and slipped her hand over Buck's. He made it through surgery, Matthew, and he made it through the night. The dim glow of hope was more painful than despair. He's tough. See that scar there? With a fingertip, Matthew traced a jagged pucker along Buck's right forearm. Barracuda. Yucatan. I was running the airlift, and Buck and the fish ran into each other in the fallout cloud. Went and got himself stitched up. Was back in the water within an hour. He's got a butte on his hip where... Matthew. Tate's voice was shaky. Matthew, he squeezed my hand. What? He squeezed my hand. Look, look at his fingers. They flexed on Tate's, a slow curl. Matthew's skin went cold, then hot as he looked at his uncle's face. Buck's eyelids fluttered. I think he's coming around. A tear leaked out of the corner of Tate's eye as she gave Buck's hand an answering squeeze. Talk to him, Matthew. Buck? With his heart skidding in his chest, Matthew leaned closer. God damn it, Buck. I know you hear me. I'm not going to waste my time talking to myself. Buck's eyelids fluttered again. Shit. Shit, Tate began to weep quietly. Did you hear that, Matthew? He said shit. He would. Matthew grabbed Buck's hand as his throat burned. Come on, you candy ass, wake up. I'm wake. Jesus. Buck opened his eyes, saw blurs. Shapes swam and shivered. He had the sensation of floating, found it not altogether unpleasant. His vision cleared enough for him to make out Matthew's face. What the hell? Thought I was dead. That makes two of us. He didn't get you, did he? Buck's voice slurred as he struggled to get the words around his tongue. That bastard didn't get you. No. Guilt crashed down on Matthew like cold honed steel. No, he didn't get me. It was a tiger, about a ten-footer, he said, understanding that Buck would want to know. We killed him, Tate and me. He's fish bait now. Good. Buck closed his eyes again. Fucking hate sharks. I'll go tell the nurse, Tate said quietly. Fucking hate em, Buck repeated. Ugly bastards. Probably a rogue, but make sure we got bats and bang sticks. He opened his eyes again. Gradually, the machines and the tubes came into focus. His brow puckered. Not the boat. Matthew's heart began to thud in his throat. No. You're in the hospital. Eight hospitals? Goddamn doctors. Boy, you know I hate hospitals. I know. Matthew concentrated on soothing the panic he saw in Buck's eyes. He'd worry about his own reaction later. Had to bring you in, Buck. The fish hurt you. A couple of stitches. Matthew could see the instant Buck began to remember. Take it easy, Buck. You've got to take it easy. Got hold of me. The sensations rushed back. One tumbled over another like nasty children in a street brawl. Fear, pain, horror, and a skittering dread that triumphed over the rest. He remembered the agony, the helplessness of being shaken and torn, choking on his own blood, blinded by it. That last clear memory of staring into those black, hate-filled eyes as they rolled up white with cold pleasure. Son of a bitch, got hold of me. Buck's voice jerked as he fought against Matthew to sit up. How bad? How bad he get me, boy? Calm down. You've got to calm down. Struggling to keep his hands gentle, Matthew pinned Buck to the bed. It was pitifully easy. If you act like this, they'll knock you out again. Tell me. Panic darting in his eyes, Buck took a fistful of Matthew's shirt. The grip was so weak, Matthew could have shaken it off with a shrug. But he didn't have the heart. You tell me what that bastard did to me. Of all the things that had been between them, there had never been lies. 
Matthew covered Buck's hands with his, looked him square in the eyes. He took your leg, Buck. The fucker took your leg. Chapter 8 You're not going to blame yourself. Tate stopped her restless pacing to sit beside Matthew on the bench outside CCU. It had been a full day since Buck had regained consciousness. The better the outlook for his recovery, the deeper Matthew sank into depression. I don't see anyone else around here to blame. Things sometimes happen that aren't anyone's fault. Matthew... Patience, she warned herself. The snap of her temper wouldn't help him. What happened was horrible. Tragic. You couldn't stop it. You can't change it now. All you can do, all we can do, is see him through it. He lost his goddamn leg, Tate. And every time he looks at me, we both know it should have been me. Well, it wasn't you. The thought that it could have been haunted her relentlessly. And thinking it should have been is stupid. Weary of reasoning, drained from the struggle to stay strong and supportive, she dragged a hand through her hair. He's afraid now, and he's angry and depressed. But he isn't blaming you. Isn't he? Matthew looked up, grief now warred with bitterness in his eyes. No, he's not, because he isn't as shallow and self-important as you. She sprang up from the bench. I'm going in to see him. You can sit here and wallow in self-pity by yourself. Head high, she sailed across the corridor and through the doors to critical care. The moment she was out of Matthew's sight, she stopped, took time to compose herself. After fixing on a sunny smile, she nudged Buck's curtain aside. His eyes opened when she came in. Behind his thick lenses, his eyes were dull. Hey! As if he'd greeted her with a wink and a wave, she marched over to kiss his cheek. I hear they're moving you down to a regular room in a day or two, one with a TV and better-looking nurses. Said they might. He winced as pain in his phantom leg plagued him. Thought you and the boy had gone back to the boat. No, Matthew's right outside. Do you want him? Buck shook his head. He began to pleat the sheet between his fingers. Ray was in before. Yes, I know. Said there was some specialist in Chicago I'm supposed to go to once they let me out of here. Yeah, he's supposed to be brilliant. Not smart enough to put my leg back on. They'll give you an even better one. She knew her voice was over bright but couldn't control it. Did you ever see that show, Buck? The one with the bionic man? I loved it when I was a kid. You'll be bionic, Buck. The corner of his mouth twitched briefly. Yeah, sure, that's me, bionic Buck. King of the cripples. I'm not going to stay if you talk that way. He shrugged a shoulder. He was too tired to argue, almost too tired to feel sorry for himself. Better if you didn't. You should get back to the boat. Got to get that booty up before somebody else does. You shouldn't worry about that. We've got our claim. You don't know nothing. He snapped at her. That's the trouble with amateurs. Word's out by now. It's out all right after this, especially. Shark attacks are always news, especially in tourist waters. They'll be coming. His fingers began to drum a quick tattoo on the mattress. You locked up what we already got, didn't you? Someplace nice and tight? I... She hadn't given the treasure a thought in two days. Doubted anyone had. Sure. She had to swallow on the lie. Sure, Buck, don't worry. Got to go down, get the rest up quick. Did I tell Ray? His eyes fluttered, and he forced them open again. Did I tell him? Fucking medication makes my head foggy. Got to get it up, all that gold like blood to sharks. He laughed as his head lolled back on the pillow. Like blood to sharks. Ain't that a kick in the ass? Got the treasure. Only cost me my goddamn leg. Get it up. Lock it away, girl. You do that. Okay, Buck. Gently, she stroked his brow. I'm going to take care of it. Rest now. Don't go down alone. No, of course not, she murmured and slipped his glasses off. Angelique's curse. She don't want anyone to win. Be careful. I will. Just rest. When she was sure he was asleep, she went out quietly. Matthew was no longer on the bench nor in the corridor. A check of her watch told her that her parents would be there in less than an hour. She hesitated, then walked decisively to the elevators. She'd take care of things herself. She felt at home the moment she stepped aboard the adventure. Someone, her mother, she imagined, had washed down the decks. 
There was no trace of blood, and the equipment was once again tidily stowed away. Rather than try to remember what they had left aboard before Buck's accident, she ducked into the deckhouse for her notebook. The moment she did, she knew something was wrong. Everything was tidy. The cushions were plumped, the table gleaming, the galley beyond the living area was spotless. But there was no notebook on the table. There were no artifacts carefully set there or on the counter for cleaning and cataloging. After the first shiver of alarm had passed, she told herself her parents had probably done just what she had come to do. They had gathered up the booty and taken it to the hotel, or out to the sea devil. The boat was more logical, she decided. They would keep it all together, wouldn't they? She looked back to shore, wondering if she should go and find them. But here, alone, Buck's urgency began to claw at her. She would go out to the sea devil and check for herself. It was a short trip, one she could easily handle alone. Calmer now that she had a goal, she went to the bridge, weighed anchor. An hour, she thought. No more for a quick round trip. Then she could reassure Buck that everything was taken care of. As she cruised out to open sea, her tension dissolved. Life always seemed so simple with a deck under her feet. Overhead, gulls swooped and scolded, and the sea, the sheer blue stretch of it, beckoned. With the wind on her face and the wheel under her hands, she wondered if she would have found this fascinating world if she'd had different parents. Would the lure have been there if she'd been raised conventionally, without tales of the sea and treasures as her bedtime stories? Just then, with the sea shimmering around her, she was sure she would. Destiny, she thought, was a patient master. It waited. She had found hers earlier than some, she supposed. Already she could see her life with Matthew unfolding before her. Together they would sail the world, unlocking secrets from the sea's vault, partners, she mused, in every way. In time he would come to learn that the value of what they did went beyond the flash of gold. They would build a museum and bring the thrill and the pulse of history to hundreds of people. One day they would have children, make a family, and she would write a book about their adventures. He'd come to understand that there was nothing they couldn't do, nothing they couldn't be with each other. Like destiny, Tate would be patient. She was smiling over her daydreams when she caught sight of the sea devil. The smile faded into puzzlement. Anchored off its port was a gleaming white yacht. It was a stunner, a hundred feet of luxury and shine. She could see people on the deck, a uniformed man carrying a tray of glasses, a woman sunbathing lazily and apparently naked, a seaman polishing the bright work on the foredeck, glass that ribboned the deck house and bridge tossed back the sun. Under different circumstances she would have admired it, the lovely, somehow feminine lines, the celebration ripple of the brightly striped umbrellas and awnings, but the tell-tale murk on the surface of the water had already caught her eye. Someone was below, running an airlift. Almost shaking with fury, Tate cut her speed, maneuvered the adventure to starboard of the Sea Devil. With quick efficiency she moored her boat. Now she could smell it, the unmistakable rotten egg scent that was perfumed to treasure hunters, the gases released from a wreck. Without hesitation, she darted from the bridge. Taking time only to pry off her sneakers, she dived over the side and swam to the sea devil. Shaking her wet hair out of her eyes, she hauled herself on deck. The tarp she and Matthew had used to cover the booty from the Santa Marguerite were in place, but it took only one swift glance to see that much of what they had recovered was missing. It was the same in the cabin, the emerald cross, the bucket that had been filled with silver coins, the fragile porcelain, the pewter she and her mother had carefully cleaned, gone. Teeth gritted, she looked back toward the yacht. Armed with temper and a sense of righteousness, she dived back in the water. She was snarling by the time she climbed the ladder onto the glossy mahogany deck of the yacht. A blonde wearing sunglasses, a headset, and a thong bottom lounged in a padded chaise. Tate marched to her, wrapped her sharply on the shoulder. Who's in charge here? Qu'est-ce que c'est? After a huge yawn, the blonde tipped down the oversized glasses and studied Tate over them with bored blue eyes. Que le diable est du? Who in the hell are you? Tate shot back in angry, fluent French. And what do you think you're doing with my wreck? The blonde moved a creamy shoulder and slipped off her headphones. American she decided in poor and irritated English. You Americans are so tedious. Allez, go away. You're dripping on me. I'm going to do more than drip on you in a minute, Fifi. Yvette. With an amused cat smile, she took a long brown cigarette from the pack at her elbow and struck the flame on a slim gold lighter. 
Ah, what a noise, she stretched, the movement as feline as her smile. All the day and half the night. Tate set her teeth. The noise Yvette complained about was the compressor busily running the airlift. We have a claim on the Santa Marguerite, and you have no right to work her. Marguerite. Ce qui c'est Marguerite. She blew out a fragrant stream of smoke. I am the only woman here. Lifting a brow, she scanned Tate from head to toe. The only, she repeated. Her gaze drifted beyond Tate and warmed. Mon cher, we have company. So I see. Tate turned and saw a slim man in crisp, buff-colored shirt and slacks, a tie of muted pastel stripes knotted handsomely at his neck. He wore a Panama at a rakish angle over pewter-colored hair. Gold winked against his tanned skin at his wrist and neck. His face, as smooth as a boy's, glowed with health and good cheer. It was strikingly handsome with its long, narrow nose, neatly arched silver brows, and thin, curved mouth. His eyes, a translucent blue, were bright with interest. Tate's first impression was of money and manners. He smiled and offered a hand so charmingly that she nearly accepted before she remembered why she was there. Is this your boat? Yes, indeed. Welcome aboard the Triumphant. It isn't often we have visits from water nymphs. Andre, he called out, his voice cultured and vaguely European. Bring a towel for the lady. She's quite wet. I don't want a damn towel. I want you to get your divers up here. That's my wreck. Really? How odd. Won't you sit down, miss? No, I won't sit down, you thieving pirate. He blinked, and his smile never wavered. It seems you've mistaken me for someone else. I'm sure we can clear up this little misunderstanding in a civilized manner. Ah, he took the towel from a uniformed steward. We need champagne, Andre. Three glasses. It's going to get real uncivilized, Tate warned. If you don't cut off that compressor... It does make conversation difficult. He nodded to his steward, then sat. Please, do sit down. The longer he talked in that calm, lovely voice, smiled that easy, charming smile, the more she felt like a clumsy fool. As a sop to her dignity, she sat stiffly on a deck chair. She would, she determined, be cool, logical, and as mannered as he. You've taken property off my boats, Tate began. He lifted a brow, turning his head so that he could study the sea devil. That unfortunate thing is yours. It belongs to my partners, Tate muttered. Beside the triumphant, the sea devil resembled a second-hand garbage scow. A number of items are missing from the sea devil and the adventure, and... My dear girl. He folded his hands, smiled benignly. A square-cut diamond the size of a scrabble tile winked on his pinky. Do I look as though I need to steal? She said nothing as the steward uncorked a bottle of champagne with a rich echoing pop. Her voice was as honeyed as the breeze. Not everyone steals because they need to. Some people simply enjoy it. Now his eyes rounded with delight. Astute, as well as attractive. Impressive attributes for one so young. Yvette mumbled something uncomplimentary in French, but he only chuckled and patted her hand. Ma Belle, do cover yourself. You're embarrassing our guest. While Yvette pouted and fastened a scrap of electric blue over her magnificent breasts, he offered Tate a flute of champagne. She had her hand around the stem before she realized she'd been maneuvered. Listen, I'd be happy to, he agreed. He sighed as the compressor fell silent. Ah, that is better. Now, you were saying you're missing some property. You're well aware of it. Artifacts from the Santa Marguerite. We've been excavating for weeks. We have a legitimate claim. He studied her face with obvious interest. It was always a pleasure for him to observe someone so animated and bold, particularly when he had already won. He pitied those who didn't appreciate the true challenge of the business deal and the true triumph of winning. There may be some confusion about that. The claim. He pursed his lips, then sampled his champagne. We are in free water here. The government often disputes such things, which is why I contacted them several months ago to apprise them of my plans to dig here. He drank again. It's unfortunate you weren't informed. Of course, when I arrived, I did notice that someone had been poking about. But then there was no one here. 
Several months ago, my ass, Tate thought, but forced herself to speak calmly. We had an accident. One of our team is in the hospital. Oh, how unfortunate. Treasure hunting can be a dangerous business. It's been a hobby of mine for some years now. I've been quite lucky, all in all. The sea devil was left here, Tate continued. Our markers were here. The rules of salvage... I'm willing to overlook the impropriety. Her mouth fell open. You're willing? The hell with calm. You jump our claim. You steal artifacts and records from our boats. I don't know anything about this property you're missing, he interrupted. His voice firmed as it would with a difficult underling. I suggest you contact the authorities on St. Kitts or Nevis about that. You can be sure I will. Sensible. He plucked the champagne from its silver bucket, poured more into his glass, into Yvette's. Don't you care for Tatinger's? Tate set the flute down with a snap. You're not going to get away with this. We found the Marguerite. We worked her. One of our team nearly died. You're not going to sail in and take what's ours. Ownership in such matters is a foggy area. He paused a moment to study the wine in his glass. And ownership, of course, was what life was all about. You can, of course, dispute it, but I'm afraid you'll be disappointed with the outcome. I have a reputation for winning. He beamed at her and stroked a fingertip down Yvette's gleaming arm. No, he said and rose. Perhaps you'd like a tour. I'm very proud of the triumphant. She has some very unique features. I don't give a damn if you've done the head in solid gold. Her own control surprised her as she rose and stared him down. Fancy boats and a European flair don't negate piracy. Sir, the steward cleared his throat politely. You're wanted forward. I'll be along in a moment, Andre. Yes, Mr. Van Dyke. Van Dyke, Tate repeated, and her stomach trembled. Silas Van Dyke? My reputation precedes me. He seemed only more pleased that she knew of him. How remiss of me not to have introduced myself, Miss. Beaumont. It's Tate Beaumont. I know who you are, Mr. Van Dyke, and I know what you've done. That's flattering. He lifted his glass, toasting her before finishing off the frothy wine. But then I've done many things. Matthew told me about you. Matthew Lassiter. Oh, yes, Matthew. I'm sure he has spoken none too kindly of me. And since he has, you're probably aware that there is one particular item that interests me. Angelique's curse. Her palms might have been damp, but Tate lifted her chin. Since you already killed for it, stealing shouldn't be an obstacle. Ah, young Matthew's been filling your head with nonsense, he said pleasantly. It's understandable that the boy had to blame someone for his father's accident, particularly when his own negligence might have caused it. Matthew isn't negligent, she snapped back. He was young and hardly to blame. I might have offered to help them financially at the time, but I'm afraid he was unreachable. He moved his shoulders gently. And as I said, Miss Beaumont, treasure hunting is a dangerous business. Accidents happen. I can make one thing very clear for all of us, however. If the amulet is on the Marguerite, it's mine, as is anything else she holds. The light in his eyes was brighter now, chillingly gracious. And I always take and treasure what's mine. Isn't that true, ma belle? Yvette ran a hand down one gleaming thigh. Always true. You don't have it yet, do you? Tate walked to the rail. And we'll see who holds the rights to the Santa Marguerite. I'm sure we will. Van Dyke turned the empty flute in his hands. Oh, and Miss Beaumont, be sure to give the Lassiters my regards and my regrets. Tate heard him chuckling as she dived into the water. Silas. Yvette lighted another cigarette and snuggled down in her chairs. What was that annoying American babbling about? Did you find her annoying? With a pleased smile, Silas watched Tate swim strongly back to the adventure. I didn't. I found her fascinating. Young, foolishly bold, and rather sweetly naive. In my circles, I rarely come across such qualities. So? Yvette blew out smoke, sulked. 
You think she's attractive with her skinny body and hair like a boy. Because his mood was mellow, Van Dyke sat on the edge of the chaise and prepared to placate. Hardly more than a child. It's women who interest me. He touched his lips to Yvette's pouty ones. You who fascinate me, he murmured, reaching behind to tug loose the knot of her brief top. That's why you're here, ma chère amie. And would be, he thought, as he cupped one of her perfect breasts in his hand, until she began to bore him. Leaving Yvette's feathers smoothed, Van Dyke rose. With a smile, he watched Tate pilot the adventure toward St. Kitts. There was something to be said for youth, he thought. It was something even his money and his business skills couldn't buy. He had a feeling it would take a long, long time for someone as fresh as Tate Beaumont to grow tedious. He strolled forward, a hum on his lips. There, his divers had spread the latest haul over a tarp. His heart began to sing. What was there, corroded, calcified, or gleaming, was his. Success, profit for investment. It was only more thrilling that it had belonged to the Lassiters. No one spoke as Van Dyke knelt and began to pick through the booty with his jeweled and manicured fingers. It was so satisfying for him to know that he had brought up treasure while the brother of James Lassiter had been fighting for his life. It only enhanced the legend, didn't it, he mused, as he lifted a cob coin, turned it in his hand. Angelique's curse would strike them down, strike all down who searched for it, but him, because he'd been willing to wait, to bide his time, to use his resources. Time and again his business sense had told him to forget it, to cut his losses, which had been considerable to date, yet the amulet remained always in the back of his mind. If he didn't find it, own it, he would have failed. Failure was simply unacceptable, even in a hobby. He could justify the time and the money. He had more than enough of both. And he hadn't forgotten that James Lassiter had laughed at him, had tried to outwit him on a deal. If Angelique's curse haunted him, there was a reason for it. It belonged to him. He glanced up. His divers waited. The crew looked on in silence, ready to obey any order. Such things, Van Dyke thought with contentment, money could buy. Continue the excavation. He rose, brushed fussily at the knees of his sharply creased slacks. I want armed guards, five on deck, five at the wreck. Deal discreetly but firmly with any interference. Satisfied, he flicked a glance out to sea. Don't harm the girl, should she return. She interests me. Piper? With a crook of his finger, he gestured to his marine archaeologist. Van Dyke moved briskly through the forward doors and into his office, with Piper on his heels like a loyal hound. Like the rest of the yacht, Van Dyke's floating office was stylish and efficient. The walls were paneled in glossy rosewood, the floor gleamed with its polish of hot wax. The desk, securely anchored, was a nineteenth-century antique that had once graced the home of a British lord. Rather than typical seafaring decor, he preferred the feel of a manor house, complete with a Gainsborough and heavy brocade drapes. Due to the tropical weather, the small marble fireplace housed a thriving bromeliad rather than crackling logs. The chairs were buttery leather in tones of burgundy and hunter green. Antiques and priceless artifacts were displayed with taste that just edged toward opulence. With a practical nod to the twentieth century, the office was fully outfitted with the finest electronic equipment. Never one to shrug away work, Van Dyke had crowded his desk with charts and logs and copies of the documents and manifests that guided him on his search for treasure. Hobby or business, knowledge was control. Van Dyke sat behind his desk, waited a few beats. Piper wouldn't sit until he was told. That small and vital twist of power pleased. Prepared to be benign, Van Dyke gestured to a chair. You've finished transferring the notebooks I gave you on to disc? Yes, sir. Piper's thick lensed glasses magnified the dog-like devotion in his brown eyes. He had a brilliant mind that Van Dyke respected, and an addiction to cocaine and gambling Van Dyke detested and used. You found no mention of the amulet? No, sir. Piper folded his always nervous hands, pulled them apart. Whoever was in charge of the cataloging did a first-class job, though. Everything, down to the last iron spike, is listed, dated. The photographs are excellent, and the notes and sketches detailing the work are clear and concise. 
They hadn't found the amulet, he mused. He had known it, of course, in his heart, in his gut, but he preferred tangible details. That's something. Keep whatever might be of use and destroy the rest. Considering, Van Dyke tugged at his earlobe. I'll want a full accounting of today's haul by ten tomorrow morning. I realize that will keep you busy most of the night. He unlocked a drawer, took out a small vial of white powder. Necessity overcame disgust as he saw the desperate gratitude on Piper's face. Use this sensibly, Piper, and privately. Yes, Mr. Van Dyke. The vial disappeared into Piper's baggy pocket. You'll have everything by morning. I know I can count on you, Piper. That's all for now. Alone, Van Dyke leaned back. His eyes scanned the papers on his desk as he sighed. It was possible that the Lassiters had simply lucked onto a virgin wreck, and it had nothing to do with the amulet. Years of indulging in his hobby and the search had given him a true appreciation for luck. If that was the case, he would simply take what they'd found and add to his own fortune. But if the amulet was on the Santa Marguerite, it would soon be his. He would excavate every inch of her and the surrounding sea until he was sure. James had found something, he mused, tapping his steepled fingers to his lips, something he had refused to share, and oh, how that grated still. After all this time, the search around Australia and New Zealand had gone cold. There was a piece of documentation missing. Van Dyke was sure of it. James had known something, but had he had the time or the inclination to share that something with his fool of a brother or the son he left behind? Perhaps not. Perhaps he had died clutching the secret to him. He detested not being sure, detested knowing he might have miscalculated. The fury of that, the slim chance that he had mistaken his man, had Van Dyke bawling his pampered hands into fists. His eyes darkened with temper, his handsome mouth thinned and trembled while he fought back the tantrum as a man might fight a wild beast snapping at his throat. He recognized the signs, the thundering heartbeat, the pounding of blood in his head, behind his eyes, the roaring in his ears. The violent moods were coming on him more often, as they had when he'd been a boy and had been denied some wish. But that had been before he'd learned to use his strength of will, before he'd groomed his power to manipulate and win. The vicious, furious waves of black rage rolled over him, taunted him to drum his heels, to scream, to break something, anything. Oh, how he despised being thwarted, how he loathed losing the upper hand. Still... He would not give in to weak and useless emotions, he ordered himself. He would, under all circumstances, stay in control, stay cool and clear-headed. Losing the grip on emotions made a man vulnerable, caused him to make foolish mistakes. It was vital to remember it, and to remember how his mother had lost that battle and had lived her last years drooling on her silk blouses in a locked room. His body shivered once with the final effort to battle back rage. He took a long, steadying breath, straightened his tie, massaged his tensed hands. It was possible, he thought with utter calm now, that he had been a bit impatient with James Lassiter. It wasn't a mistake he would make with the others. Years of search had only strengthened him, added wisdom and knowledge, made him more aware of the value of the prize, the power of its possession. It waited for him, just as he waited for it, he reminded himself, and saw that his hands were again perfectly steady. Neither he nor Angelique's curse would tolerate any interlopers, but interlopers could be used before they were discarded. Time would tell, Van Dyke thought, and closed his eyes. There was no sea, no ocean, no pond where the Lassiters could sail without him being aware. One day they would lead him to Angelique's curse, and the one fortune that continued to elude him. Chapter 9 Out of breath and pale with fury, Tate rushed into the hospital. She spotted her parents and Matthew in a huddle at the end of the corridor and barely prevented herself from calling out. She headed for them at a jog that had her mother turning and staring. Tate, for goodness sake, you look as though you've been swimming in your clothes. I have. We have trouble. There was a boat. They're excavating. There was nothing I could do to stop them. Slow down, Ray ordered, and put both hands on her shoulders. 
Where have you been? I went out to the site. There's a boat there, a hell of a boat, luxury yacht, fully loaded, first-class excavation equipment. They're working the marguerite. Saw the airlift cloud. She paused half a second to catch her breath. We have to get out there. They've been aboard the Adventure and the Sea Devil. My catalogs are gone, and a lot of the artifacts are missing. I know he took them. He'll deny it, but I know. Who? Tate shifted her gaze from her father and looked at Matthew. Van Dyke. It's Silas Van Dyke. Before she could speak again, Matthew gripped her arm, whirled her to face him. How do you know? His steward called him by name. The fear she'd experienced on board the Triumphant was nothing compared to seeing murder leap into the eyes of the man she loved. He knew you. He knew what happened to Buck. He said, Matthew. Alarm trembled in her voice as he strode down the hall. Wait! She managed to catch him, brace herself in front of him. What are you going to do? What I should have done a long time ago. His eyes were cold and flat and frightening. I'm going to kill him. Get a hold of yourself. Though Ray's voice was calm, he had Matthew's arm in a surprisingly strong grip. Tate recognized the tone and breathed a small sigh of relief. Little or nothing got past her father in this mood, not even murderous rage. We have to be careful, and we have to be sensible, he continued. There's a lot at stake. That bastard isn't going to walk away this time. We'll go out. Marley, you and Tate wait here. Matthew and I will straighten this out. I'm not waiting here. Neither of us is waiting here, Marla ranged herself with her daughter. This is a team operation, Ray. If one goes, we all go. I don't have time for family debates. Matthew shook himself free. I'm going now. You can hang here and see if you can control your women. You ignorant, Tate. Marla took a deep breath to control her own temper. Let's consider the circumstances. She aimed a look at Matthew that could have melted steel. When she spoke again, the southern honey in her voice was frozen over ice. You're right about one thing, Matthew. We're wasting time. With this, she sailed to the elevator, jabbed the down button. Idiot, was all Tate said. When they were aboard the adventure, Tate joined her mother at the rail. Ray and Matthew were at the bridge, piloting the boat, and, she imagined, discussing strategy. The insult of it burned in her blood. More frightened than she wanted to admit, Marlet turned to her daughter. What was your impression of this man, this Van Dyke? He's slick. It was the first word to come to Tate's mind. With a nasty layer under the shine. Smart, too. He knew there was nothing I could do, and he enjoyed that. Did he frighten you? He offered me champagne and a tour of the boat, genial host to welcomed guest. He was reasonable, entirely too reasonable. Tate flexed her hand on the rail. Yes, he frightened me. I could see him as a Roman emperor nibbling on sugared grapes while the lions tore the Christians to shreds. He'd enjoy the show. Marla suppressed a shudder. Her daughter was whole and safe and here, she reminded herself, but she kept a hand over Tate's as reassurance. Do you believe he killed Matthew's father? Matthew believes it. There, she lifted a hand to point. There's the boat. On the bridge, Matthew studied the triumphant. It was new, he noted, more luxurious than the rig they had used in Australia. As far as he could see, the decks were deserted. I'm going over, Ray. Let's take this one step at a time. Van Dyke's already taken too many steps. We'll hail him first. Ray maneuvered the boat between the triumphant and the sea devil, cut the engines. Get the women in the cabins, keep them there. Matthew picked up a diving knife. And what are you going to do? Ray demanded. Clamp that between your teeth and swing over on a rope? Use your head. Hoping the scathing tone worked, he left the bridge. On deck, he glanced at his wife and daughter before going to the rail. Ahoy, the triumphant, he called out. There was a woman, Tate supplied. The hair on her arms and neck began to tingle as Matthew joined them. Crew, seamen, and stewards, divers. Now the triumphant looked like a ghost ship, silent but for the flap of awnings and lap of the water on its hull. I'm going over, Matthew said again, as he readied to dive into the water. Van Dyke strolled out on deck. Good afternoon, his beautiful voice carried over the water. 
Gorgeous day for a sail, isn't it? Silas Van Dyke. Like a pose, Van Dyke leaned on the rail, ankles crossed, arms folded. Yes, indeed. And what can I do for you? I'm Raymond Beaumont. Ah, of course. In a gallant gesture, he tipped the brim of his Panama. I've met your charming daughter. Lovely to see you again, Tate, and you must be Mrs. Beaumont. He bowed slightly in Marla's direction. I see where Tate gets her fresh and intriguing beauty, and it's young Matthew Lassiter, isn't it? How interesting to meet you here. I knew you were a murderer, Van Dyke, Matthew called out, but I didn't know you'd sink to piracy. You haven't changed? Van Dyke's teeth flashed. I'm glad. It would be a shame to have all those rough edges polished away. I'd invite you all on board, but we're rather busy at the moment. Perhaps we can arrange a little dinner party for later in the week. Before Matthew could speak, Ray clamped a hand on his arm, fingers vicing. We have first claim on the Santa Marguerite. We discovered her, and we've been working her for several weeks. The necessary paperwork was filed with the government of St. Kitts. I'm afraid we disagree. Gracefully, Silas took a slim silver case from his pocket, chose a cigarette. You're welcome to check with the authorities if you find it necessary. Of course, we are beyond the legal limit, and when I arrived, there was no one here. Just that unfortunate and empty boat. My partner was seriously injured a few days ago. We had to postpone the excavation. Ah, Van Dyke lighted his cigarette, took a contemplative drag. I heard about poor Buck's accident. How difficult for him, for you all. My sympathies. However, the fact remains that I'm here and you're not. You took property from our boats, Tate shouted out. That's a ridiculous accusation and one you'll have a great deal of difficulty proving. Of course, you're welcome to try. He paused to study and admire a pair of pelicans in their dance from sky to sea and back again. Treasure hunting is a frustrating business, isn't it? He said conversationally. And often heartbreaking. Do give my best regards to your uncle, Matthew. I hope this bad luck that runs in your family ends with you. Fuck this. Even as Matthew vaulted to the rail, Tate sprang to stop him. He'd barely shaken her off when Ray shoved him back. Top deck, he murmured. Four wooden aft. The two men had stepped into view, each with rifles shouldered and aimed. I believe in guarding my possessions, Van Dyke explained. A man in my position learns that security isn't merely a luxury, but a vital business tool. Raymond, I'm sure you're a sensible man. Sensible enough to keep young Matthew from getting himself hurt over a few trinkets. Well satisfied with the situation, he took another drag on his cigarette as the pelicans plopped gleefully into the water between them. And I would be devastated if a stray bullet happened to strike you or either of those precious jewels beside you. His smile spread. Matthew would be the first to tell you that accidents, tragic accidents, happen. Matthew's fingers were bone white on the rail. Everything inside him screamed to take his chances to dive in. Get them inside. If he shoots you, what happens to Buck? Matthew shook his head, riding on the rush of blood to his head. I only need ten seconds. Ten goddamn seconds. And a knife across Van Dyke's throat. What happens to Buck? Ray insisted. You're not going to ask me to walk away from this. No, I'm telling you. Fear and fury helped Ray muscle Matthew back from the rail. This isn't worth your life, and it sure as hell isn't worth the lives of my wife and daughter. Take the wheel, Matthew. We're heading back to St. Kitts. Even the thought of retreat made him ill. If he'd been alone, but he wasn't. Saying nothing, he turned on his heels and headed for the bridge. Very wise, Raymond, Van Dyke commented with a glint of admiration in his voice. Very wise. The boy is a tad reckless, I'm afraid, not as mature and sensible as men like us. It was a pleasure to meet you all, Mrs. Beaumont, Tate. 
he tipped the brim of his hat again. Good sailing. Oh, Ray. As the boat circled around, Marla crossed to her husband on jellied knees. They would have killed us. Feeling unmanned, helpless, Ray stroked her hair and watched the dashing figure of Van Dyke grow smaller with distance. We'll go to the authorities, he said quietly. Tate left them, rushed to the bridge. There Matthew gripped the wheel, the course set. There was nothing we could do, she began. Something about his stance warned her against touching him in any way. When he said nothing, she stepped closer, but kept her hands locked together. He would have had them shoot you, Matthew. He wanted to. We'll report him as soon as we dock. And what the fuck do you think that will do? There was something mixed with the bitterness in his voice, something she didn't recognize as shame. Money talks. We went through all the proper channels, she insisted. The records. He cut her off with one flaming look. Don't be stupid. There won't be any records. There won't be anything. He doesn't want to be there. He'll take the wreck. He'll strip or take it all. And I let him. I stood there, just the way I did nine years ago, and I did nothing. There was nothing you could do. Ignoring her own instincts, she laid a hand on his back. Matthew? Leave me alone. But Matthew? Leave me the hell alone. Hurt and helpless, she did what he asked. That evening, she sat alone in her room. She imagined this was what was meant by being shell-shocked. The day had been a series of hard slaps, ending with her father's shaken announcement that there was no record of their claim. None of the paperwork they had so meticulously filed existed, and the clerk Ray had worked with personally denied ever having seen him before. There was no longer any doubt that Silas Van Dyke had won. Again. Everything they had done, all the work, the suffering Buck had endured was for nothing. For the first time in her life, she was faced with the fact that being right and doing right didn't always matter. She thought of all the beautiful things she had held in her hands, the emerald cross, the porcelain, the bits and pieces of history she had lifted out of its blanket of sand and brought into the light. She would never touch them again, or study them, see them winking behind glass at a museum. There would be no discreet card heralding them as pieces of the Beaumont Lassiter collection. She would not see her father's name in National Geographic or pore over photographs she'd taken herself on those glossy pages. They'd lost. And it shamed her to realize how much she had wanted those flashes of glory. She'd imagined herself going back to college, impressing her professors, sailing through to her degree on a wave of triumph, or simply sailing off with Matthew, riding on the current of their victory on the way to the next. Now there was nothing but bitter failure. Too restless to stay in her room, she headed out. She would walk on the beach, she decided, try to clear her head and plan the future. It was there she found him, standing with his face to the sea. He'd chosen the spot where they had once come onto the island, where she had looked, seen him look, and had known she loved him. Her heart squeezed with sorrow for him, then settled, for she was sure now what to do. She walked to his side and stood, letting the breeze ruffle her hair. I'm so sorry, Matthew. It's nothing new. Bad luck's my usual kind. This had to do with cheating and stealing, not with luck. It always has to do with luck. If I'd had better, I'd have gotten to Van Dyke alone. And done what? Rammed his boat? Boarded it? Fought off his armed crew single-handedly? It didn't matter now how foolish she made it sound. I'd have done something. Gotten yourself shot? she agreed. A lot of good that would have done any of us. Buck needs you, Matthew. I need you. He hunched his shoulders. A poor defense, he thought. Being needed didn't suit him. I'll see to Buck. We'll see to him. There are other wrecks, Matthew, waiting. When he's better, we'll find them. Needing to let hope surge, she took his hands. He can even dive again if he wants to. I talked to Dr. Farge. They're doing amazing things with prostheses. We can take him to Chicago next week. The specialist there will have him up and around in no time. Right. As soon as he figured out how to pay for a trip to Chicago, a specialist, therapy. When he gets the go-ahead, we'll go someplace warm where he can recuperate. That'll give us time to research another wreck. The Isabella, if it's still what he wants, what you want. You can't spend time researching wrecks in college. I'm not going back to college.
What the hell are you talking about? I'm not going back. Delighted with her decision, she threw her arms around his neck. I don't know why I thought I needed to. I can learn everything I have to learn by doing. What difference does a degree make? That stupid talk, Tate. He reached up to pry her arms loose, but she pressed against him. No, it's not. It's absolutely logical. I'll stay with you and Buck in Chicago until we decide where to go next. Then we'll go. She touched her lips to his. Anywhere. As long as we're together. Can't you see it, Matthew, sailing wherever we want, whenever we want on the sea devil? Yeah. The fact that he could all too well made his limbs weak. Mom and Dad will join us when we find another wreck, and we will find one better than the Marguerite. Van Dyke won't beat us, Matthew, unless we let him. He already has. No. With her eyes closed, she laid her cheek against his. Because we're here, we're together, and we have everything ahead of us. He wants the amulet, but he doesn't have it, and I know, I just know he never will. Whether we find it or not, Matthew, we have more than he ever can. You're dreaming. What if I am? She drew back and was smiling again. Isn't that what hunting for treasure's all about? Now we can dream together. I don't care if we never find another wreck. Let Van Dyke take it all, every last doubloon. You're what I want. She meant it. The certainty of that made him giddy with need, terrified with guilt. He had only to snap his fingers and she would go with him wherever he asked. She would leave everything she had or could have behind. And before long, she would hate him nearly as much as he hated himself. Seems to me you're not giving a lot of thought to what I want. His voice was cool as he tipped up her chin and gave her a careless kiss. I don't know what you mean. Listen, Red, things went to hell here. I put in a lot of work and had to watch it slip right through my fingers. That sucks, but it's not even the worst of it. I'm already saddled with a cripple. What makes you think I want to take you on as well? The cut was so quick, so sharp, she barely felt it. You don't mean that. You're still upset. Upset doesn't cover it. If you and your by-the-book family hadn't gotten in the way, I wouldn't be standing here empty-handed. Ray just had to go through channels. How the hell do you think Van Dyke got onto us? Color leached from her cheeks. You can't blame him. Hell, I can't. He tucked his hands into his pockets. Me and Buck, we ran a different kind of operation. But you had the dough. Now we've got nothing. All I have left after months of work is a gimpy uncle. That's a horrible thing to say. Plain fact, he corrected and ignored the coating of disgust in his throat. I'll get him set up somewhere. I owe him that. But you and me, Red, that's a different can of worms. Passing the time for a few weeks, a little entertainment on the side to break the monotony is one thing, and it's been fun. But you hanging around my neck now that the deal's in the toilet, that cramps my style. She felt as if someone had hollowed her out in one vicious scoop. He was looking at her with a faint grin on his mouth, cool amusement in his eyes. You're in love with me, she insisted. You're dreaming again. Hey, you want to weave a little romantic fantasy with me in the starring role? Fine. But don't expect to sail off into the sunset. It had to be worse, he decided. He had to be worse. Words alone wouldn't shake her loose, wouldn't save her from him. Even as his own actions revolted him, he cupped his hands over her hips, drew her intimately close. I didn't mind playing the game, honey. Hell, I enjoyed every minute of it. As lousy as things turned out, why don't we try to cheer each other up, end things with a real bang? He clamped his mouth over hers, hard. He wanted nothing soft or sweet in the kiss. It was greedy, demanding, and just a little mean. Even as she started to struggle, he slipped a hand under her blouse, closed it over her breast. Don't! This was wrong, she thought frantically. It wasn't supposed to be like this. It couldn't be like this. You're hurting me. Come on, baby. Christ, her skin was like satin. He wanted to stroke it, savor it, seduce it. Instead, he bruised her, knowing whatever marks he left there would fade much sooner than the ones he was leaving on himself. You know we both want it. No. Sobbing, she shoved and clawed herself free. In defense, she hugged her arms tight. Don't touch me. Just a tease after all. He forced himself to meet her haunted eyes. All talk, no action, Tate. She could barely see him for the tears spilling out of her eyes. You don't care about me at all. Sure I do. 
He heaved a sigh. What's it going to take to get you in the sack? You want poetry? I can dig some up. Too shy to do it on the beach? Fine. I've got a room your old man's paying for. None of us meant anything to you. Hey, I pulled my weight. I loved you. We all can't. Already past tense, he thought. It wasn't so hard to kill love. Big fucking deal. Partnerships dissolved. You and your parents go back to your nice, tidy lives. I go on with mine. Now, do you want to go bounce on the mattress a while, or do I go find somebody else? Part of her mind wondered that she could still stand, still speak, when he had torn out her heart. I never want to see you again. I want you to stay away from me and my parents. I don't want them to have to know what a bastard you are. No problem. Run on home, kid. I got places to go. She told herself she wouldn't, that she would walk head high. But after a few steps, she did just that. She fled, with her tattered heart bleeding. When she was gone, Matthew sat down in the sand, lay his aching head on his knees. He figured he'd just completed the first heroic act of his life by saving hers. And he decided, as the ache pulsed through him, that he wasn't cut out to be a hero. Chapter 10 I can't imagine where Matthew could be. Marla spoke in undertones, fretting as she paced the hospital corridor. It's not like him to miss his visit to Buck, and especially today when they're transferring Buck to a regular room. Tate shrugged. Even that hurt, she discovered. She'd spent a sleepless night mourning a broken heart, giving it every tear inside her. Still, in the end, she had salvaged her pride and now braced against it. He probably found a more interesting way to spend his day. Well, it's not like him. Marla glanced over when Ray stepped out of Buck's room. He's settling in. The bolstering smile did little to erase the concern in Ray's eyes. He's a little tired, doesn't really feel up to visitors. Matthew come in yet? No. Marla looked down the hall, as if she could will the elevator doors to open up and Matthew to stroll out. Ray, did you tell him about Silas Van Dyke, the treasure? I didn't have the heart. Wearily, Ray sat down. The last ten minutes with Buck had sapped him. I think it's just beginning to sink in about his leg. He's angry and bitter. Nothing I said seemed to help. How could I tell him everything we'd worked for is gone? It can wait. Knowing there was little else they could do, Marla sat down beside him. Don't start blaming yourself, Ray. I keep going over that moment in my mind, he murmured. One instant we were flying, we were kings, Midases turning everything we touched into gold. Then there was horror and fear. Could I have done something, Marla, moved faster? I don't know. It all happened in a heartbeat. Angelique's curse. Ray lifted his hands, let them fall. That's what Buck keeps saying. It was an accident, Marla insisted, though a shiver raced through her. It has nothing to do with curses or legends. You know that, Ray. I know Buck's lost his leg, and the dream that was just at our fingertips turned into a nightmare. There's nothing we can do about it. That's the worst of it. There's nothing we can do. You need rest. Briskly, Marla rose, took his hands. We all do. We're going back to the hotel and putting all of this aside for a few hours. In the morning, we'll do whatever needs to be done. Maybe you're right. You two go ahead. Tate tucked her hands in her pockets. The idea of sitting in her room for the rest of the afternoon was far from appealing. I think I'll go for a walk. Maybe sit on the beach a while. That's a good idea. Marla slipped an arm around Tate's shoulders as they walked to the elevators. Get yourself some sun. We'll all feel better for a little break. Sure. Tate managed to smile as they stepped into the elevator, but she knew nothing was going to make her feel better for a long, long time. As the Beaumonts went their separate ways, Matthew sat down in Dr. Farge's office. Already that day, he'd put into play several of the decisions he'd made during the night, decisions, he felt, that were necessary for everyone. I need you to contact that doctor you told me about, the one in Chicago, Matthew began. I have to know if he'll take care of Buck. I can do that for you, Mr. Lasita. I'd appreciate it. And I need an accounting of what I owe here, plus what it's going to cost to transfer him. Your uncle is without medical insurance? That's right. 
Matthew braced his shoulders against the fresh weight. It was always humiliating to owe more than you could pay. He doubted a professional treasure hunter was a prime candidate for a loan. I'll give you what I've got. I'll have more tomorrow. From the sale of the sea devil and most of the equipment. I'll need some sort of payment schedule for the rest. I've made some calls myself. I've got a line on a couple of jobs. I'm good for it. Farge sat back, rubbed a finger along the side of his nose. I'm sure we can make arrangements. In your country, there are programs. Buck's not going on welfare, Matthew interrupted, a bite of fury in his voice. Not as long as I can work. Just figure up the bottom line. I'll deal with it. As you wish. Mr. Lassiter, it's fortunate that your uncle is a strong man. I have no doubt that he will recover physically. He could, in fact, dive again, if he chooses, but his emotional and mental recovery will be slower even than the physical. He'll need your support. You will need help, too. I'll deal with it, Matthew repeated and rose. At the moment, he didn't think he could stand hearing about psychiatrists and social workers. The way I figure it, you saved his life. I owe you for that. Now I've got to take it from here. It's a great deal to shoulder alone, Mr. Lasita. That's the breaks, isn't it? Matthew said with cool dispassion. For better or worse, mostly worse, I'm all he's got. That was his personal bottom line, Matthew thought as he headed down to Buck's floor. He was the only family Buck had left, and Lassiter's, whatever their failings, paid their debts. Oh, maybe they skipped out on a bar bill now and again when times were lean, and he'd been known to fleece a tourist or two by inflating the price and history of a clay pipe or broken jug. If some idiot paid through the nose for some chipped wine jar just because a stranger claimed it was from Jean Lafitte's personal stash, they deserved what they got. But there were matters of honor that couldn't be shaken. Whatever it took, Buck was his responsibility. The treasure was gone, he thought, giving himself a moment in the corridor before going into Buck. The sea devil was history. All he had left were clothes, his wetsuit, flippers, mask, and his tanks. He'd hustled the sails. Hustling was something that came easily, he thought with a thin smile. The money in his pocket would get them to Chicago. After that, well, after that, they'd see. He pushed open Buck's door, relieved to find his uncle alone. Wondered if you'd show... Buck scowled and fought back the bitter tears that stung his eyes. Least you could do is be around when they go poking and prodding and wheeling me all over hell and back in this place. Nice room. Matthew glanced toward the curtain that separated Buck from the patient in the next bed. It's crap. I'm not staying here. Not for long. We're taking a trip to Chicago. What the hell is there in Chicago for me? A doctor who's going to fix you up with a new leg. New leg, my ass. The leg was gone, and only the nagging pain was left to remind him he'd once stood like a man. Piece of plastic with hinges. We could always strap a peg on you instead. Matthew pulled a folding chair to the bedside and sat. He couldn't remember the last time he'd really slept. If he could get through the next couple of hours, he promised himself he'd zero out for another eight. I thought the Beaumonts might be around. Ray was in. Buck frowned tugged on his sheet. Send him away. Don't need his damn long face in here. Where's that damn nurse? Buck fumbled for his call button. Always around when you don't want him sticking needles in you. I want my pills, he barked the minute the nurse stepped in. I'm in pain here. After your meal, Mr. Lassiter, she said patiently, your dinner will be here in a few moments. I don't want any of that goddamn slop. The more she tried to placate him, the louder he shouted until she stalked off with blood in her eye. Nice way to make friends, Buck, Matthew commented. You know, if I were you, I'd be a little more careful with a woman who could come back at me with a six-inch needle. You're not me, are you? You got two legs. Yeah. Guilt ate a ragged hole in his gut. I got two legs. Lot of good the treasure's gonna do me now, Buck muttered. Finally got all the money a man could ever want, and it can't make me whole again. What am I gonna do? Buy some big fucking boat and spin around it in a wheelchair? Angelique's curse is what it is. Goddamn witch gives with one hand and takes the best away with the other. We didn't find the amulet. 
It's down there. It's down there, all right. Buck's eyes began to glimmer with bitterness and hate. It didn't even have the goodness to kill me. Better if it had. Nothing but a cripple. A rich cripple. You can be a cripple if you want, Matthew said wearily. That part's up to you. But you're not going to be rich. Van Dyke's taken care of that. What the hell are you talking about? The color Fury had pumped into Buck's cheeks drained away like water. What about Van Dyke? Do it now, Matthew ordered himself. All at once. He jumped our claim, and he's taken it all. It's our wreck. Me and Ray, we even registered it. Funny thing about that. The only paperwork anybody can find is Van Dyke's. All he had to do was bribe a couple of clerks. To lose it all now was unthinkable. Without his share of the treasure, he'd not only be a cripple, he'd be a helpless one. You gotta stop him. How? Matthew shot up, pressed his hands against Buck's shoulders to keep him in bed. He's got a full crew, armed. They're working around the clock. I'll guarantee he's already transported what he's brought up and what he took off the sea devil and the adventure. You're just gonna let him get away with it? Fueled by desperation, Buck gripped Matthew by the shirt front. You're just gonna turn around and walk away from what's ours? It cost me my leg. I know what it cost you. And yeah, I'm walking away. I'm not going to die for a wreck. Never thought you'd turn coward. Buck released him, turned his head away. If I wasn't laid up here. If you weren't laid up here, Matthew thought, I wouldn't have to walk away. It looks like you'd better work at getting up and out of here so you can handle it your way. Meantime, I'm in charge, and we're going to Chicago. How the hell are we going to get there? We've got nothing. Unconsciously, he reached down to where his leg should have been. Less than nothing. The sea devil, the equipment, and some odds and ends brought in a few thousand. Glassily pale, Buck turned back. You sold the boat? What right did you have to sell the boat? The sea devil belonged to me, boy. It was half mine, Matthew said with a shrug. When I sold my share, yours went with it. I'm doing what I have to do. Running away, Buck said, and turned his head again. Selling out. That's right. Now I'm going to go book us a flight to Chicago. I ain't going to Chicago. You're going to go where I tell you. That's the way it is. Well, I'm telling you to go to hell. As long as we go by way of Chicago, Matthew said, and walked out. The bottom line, Matthew learned, was a great deal steeper than he had imagined. Swallowing his pride left his throat raw. He soothed it with a cold beer while he waited for Ray in the hotel lounge. His life, he decided, was about as bad as it could get. Funny, a few months before, he'd had basically nothing. A boat that had seen better days, a little cash in a tin box, no urgent plans, no urgent problems. Looking back, he supposed he'd been happy enough. Then suddenly he'd had so much. A woman who loved him, the prospect of fame and fortune. Success, the kind he'd never really believed in, had been briefly his. Revenge, which he'd dreamed of for nine years, had been almost within his grasp. Now he'd lost it all. The woman, the prospects, even the bits of nothing he'd once considered more than enough. It was so much harder to lose once you'd won. Matthew? He looked up at the clap on his shoulder. Ray slid onto the stool beside him. Thanks for coming down. Glad to. I'll have a beer, he told the bartender. Another for you, Matthew? Yeah, why not? It was only the beginning of what Matthew planned for one long night of stinking drunkenness. We've been missing each other over the last few days, Ray began, then tapped his bottle against Matthew's fresh one. Kept figuring we'd run into you at the hospital, though we haven't been there as much as we'd like. Buck's not feeling up for company much. No. Matthew tipped the bottle back, let the chilled beer run down his throat. He won't even talk to me. I'm sorry, Matthew. He's wrong taking it out on you this way. There was nothing you could have done. I don't know which he's taking harder. The leg or the marguerite? Matthew moved his shoulder. I guess it doesn't matter. He'll dive again, Ray stated, and stroked a fingertip down the condensation on the bottle. Dr. Farge told me his physical recovery is ahead of schedule. That's one of the things I need to talk to you about. There was no way to put it off any longer. 
Matthew reminded himself. He would have preferred getting roaring drunk first, but that little pleasure would have to wait. I've got the go-ahead to take him to Chicago. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Torn between pleasure and alarm, Ray set his beer down with a clack. That's so quick. I had no idea arrangements were already made. Farge says there's no reason to delay it. He's strong enough to make the trip, and the sooner he gets hooked up with his specialist, the better. That's great, Matthew, really. You'll keep in touch, won't you? Let us know about his progress. Marla and I, we'll take a trip up ourselves as soon as you think he's up to it. You're, you're the best friend he ever had, Matthew said carefully. It would mean a lot if you come to see him when you can manage it. I know he's hard to deal with right now, but don't worry about that, Ray spoke quietly. A man lucky enough to make that kind of a friend, he doesn't toss it away because times are rough. We'll come, Matthew. Tate's decided to start college in September after all, but I'm sure she'd like to go up with us on her first break. She's going back to college in September, Matthew murmured. Yes, Marla and I are pleased she's decided not to defer after all. She's so down about this whole business right now that I can't think of anything better for her than getting back into routine. I know she's not sleeping well. Tate's so young to have to face all we've had to face these last few days. Concentrating on her studies is the best thing for her. Yeah, you're right. I don't want to pry, Matthew, but I get the feeling you and Tate have had some sort of disagreement. No big deal. Matthew signaled for another beer. She'll land on her feet. I don't doubt it. Tate's a strong-willed and sensible girl. Ray frowned down at the circles of damp his bottle left on the bar. Rings within rings, he thought. Matthew, I'm not blind. I realize the two of you were becoming involved. We had a few laughs, Matthew interrupted. Nothing serious. He looked at Ray and answered the unspoken question. Nothing serious, he repeated. Relieved, Ray nodded. I'd hoped I could trust both of you to be responsible. I know she's not a child anymore, but a father still worries. And you wouldn't want her to hook up with someone like me. Ray glanced over, met the cool derision in Matthew's eyes with some surprise. No, Matthew. I'd be sorry at this point in her life to see her hooked up seriously with anyone. With the right motivation, Tate would throw everything she'd hoped to accomplish to the winds. I'm grateful she's not doing that. Fine. Terrific. Ray let out a long breath. Something he hadn't even considered had just jumped out and slapped him in the face. If she knew you were in love with her, she wouldn't be going back to North Carolina. I don't know what you're talking about. I told you we had a few laughs but the compassion in Ray's eyes had him turning away, dropping his face in his hands. Shit, what was I supposed to do? Tell her to pack it up and come with me? You could have, Ray said quietly. I've got nothing for her but bad times and worse luck. Once I get back to Chicago, I'm taking a job on a salvage boat off Nova Scotia. Lousy conditions but decent pay. Matthew, but he shook his head. The thing is, Ray... It's not going to be enough, money-wise. Especially at first. I can pretty well square things here. Back in the States, with a fancy doctor and the fancy treatment, it's going to be another story. Farge worked it out so they'd cut us a break. Buck's kind of an experiment, he added with a sneer. And they're talking about Social Security and Medicaid or Medicare or some such shit. Even with that, he swallowed more beer along with his pride. I need money, Ray. There's nobody else I can ask for it, and I gotta say, it doesn't go down real good to have to ask you. Buck's my partner, Matthew, and my friend. Was your partner, Matthew corrected. Anyway, I need 10,000. All right. The mild tone slashed like a blade across the throat of his pride. Don't agree so fast, God damn it. Would it really help if I made you beg for it? If I outlined terms and conditions? I don't know. Matthew gripped the bottle, fighting furiously the need to hurl it, hear it shatter like that pride. It's going to take me some time to pay it back. I'm going to pay it back, he said between his teeth before Ray could speak. 
I need enough to set Buck up for the operation for the therapy and the prosthesis. He's going to need a place to live after, but I've got work, and when that job peters out, I'll get another one. I know you're good for the money, Matthew. Just as you know, I don't care about being paid back. I care. Yes, I understand that. I'll write you a check on the condition that you keep me apprised of Buck's progress. I'll take the check on the condition that you keep this between the two of us, just the two of us, Ray, all of it. In other words, you don't want Buck to know, and you don't want Tate to know. That's right. You're hoeing a hard row for yourself, Matthew. Maybe. But that's the way I want it. All right, then. If it was all he could do, he would do it as he was asked. I'll leave the check at the front desk for you. Thanks, Ray. Matthew offered a hand. For everything. Mostly, it was a hell of a summer. Mostly, it was. There'll be other summers, Matthew. Other wrecks. The time might come when we'll dive for one together again. The Isabella's still down there. With Angelique's curse, Matthew shook his head. No, thanks. She cost too much, Ray. The way I'm feeling right now, I'd just as soon leave her for the fish. Time will tell. Take care of yourself, Matthew. Yeah. Tell... Tell Marla I'll miss her cooking. She'll miss you. We all will. And Tate, anything you want me to tell her? There was too much to tell her and nothing to tell her. Matthew only shook his head. Alone at the bar, Matthew shoved his beer aside. Whiskey, he told the bartender. And bring the bottle. It was his last night on the island. He couldn't think of one good reason to spend it sober. Part two, present. The now, the here, through which all future plunges to the past. James Joyce. Chapter 11. There were 27 crew members aboard the Nomad. Tate was delighted to be one of them. It had taken her five years of intense year-round work and study to earn her master's degree in the field of marine archaeology. Friends and family had often worried, told her to slow down, but that degree had been the one goal she felt she could control. She had it, and in the three years since had put it to use. Now, through her association with the Poseidon Institute and her assignment with Sea Search aboard the Nomad, she was taking the next step to earning her doctorate and her reputation. Best of all, she was doing what she loved. This expedition was for science as well as profit. To Tate's mind, that was the proper and only logical rank of priority. The crew quarters were a bit on the spare side, but the labs and equipment were state-of-the-art. The old cargo vessel had been meticulously refitted for deep-sea exploration and excavation. Perhaps it was slow and unhandsome as ships went, she mused, but she'd learned long ago that an attractive outer layer meant nothing compared to what was within. One summer of naive dreams had taught her that and more. The nomad had a great deal within. She was manned by the top scientists and technicians in the field of ocean research, and she was one of them. The day was as fine as anyone could ask for. The waters of the Pacific gleamed like a blue jewel, and beneath it, fathoms deep where the light never reached and man could never venture, lay the side-wheeler Justine and her treasure trove. In her deck chair, Tate settled her laptop on her knees to complete a letter to her parents. We'll find her. The equipment on this ship is as sophisticated as any I've seen. Dodd and Bowers can't wait to put their robot to use. We've dubbed it Chauncey. I'm not sure why, but we're putting a lot of faith in the little guy. Until we find the Justine and begin to excavate, my duties are light. Everybody pitches in, but there's a lot of free time just now. And the food, Mom, is incredible. We're expecting an airdrop today. I've managed to charm a few recipes from the cook, though you'll have to cut them down from the bulk necessary to feed almost thirty people. After nearly a month at sea, there have been squabbles. Family-like, we snipe and fight and make up. There are even a couple of romances. I think I told you about Lorraine Ross, the chemist who shares a cabin with me. The assistant cook, George, has a major crush on her. It's kind of sweet. Other flirtations are more to pass the time, I think, and will fade away once the real work begins. So far, the weather's been with us. I wonder how it is back home. I imagine the azaleas will bloom within a few weeks, and the magnolias. I miss seeing them, and I miss seeing you. 
I know you'll be leaving for your trip to Jamaica soon, so I hope this letter reaches you before you ship out. Maybe we can mesh schedules in the fall. If things go well, my dissertation will be complete. It would be fun to do a little diving back home. Meanwhile, I should get back. Hayden's bound to be poring over the charts again, and I'm sure he could use a little help. We don't have a mail drop until the end of the week, so this won't go out until then. Right back, okay? Letters are like gold out here. I love you, Tate. She hadn't mentioned the tedium, Tate thought, as she took the laptop back to the cabin she shared with Lorraine, or the personal loneliness that could strike without warning when you were surrounded by mile after mile of water. She knew a great many of the crew were beginning to lose hope. The time, the money, the energy that was tied up in this expedition were extensive. If they failed, they would lose their backers, their share of the trove, and perhaps most important, their chance to make history. Once inside the narrow cabin, Tate automatically scooped up the shirts and shorts and socks scattered over the floor. Lorraine might have been a brilliant scientist, but outside of the lab she was as disorganized as a teenager. Tate piled the clothes on Lorraine's unmade bunk, her nose twitching at the musky perfume that haunted the air. Lorraine, Tate concluded, was determined to drive poor George insane. It still amazed and amused her that she and Lorraine had managed to become friends. Certainly no two women were more different. Where Tate was neat and precise, Lorraine was careless and messy. Tate was driven. Lorraine was unapologetically lazy. Over the years since college, Tate had experienced one serious relationship that had ended amicably, while Lorraine had gone through two nasty divorces and innumerable volatile affairs. Her roommate was a tiny, fairy-like woman with a curvy body and a halo of golden hair. She wouldn't so much as turn on a Bunsen burner unless she was wearing full makeup and the proper accessories. Tate was long, lean, and had only recently let her straight red hair grow to her shoulders. She rarely bothered with cosmetics and was forced to agree with Lorraine's statement that she was fashion-impaired. She didn't think to glance in the full-length mirror Lorraine had hung on the door of the head before she left the cabin. Turning left, she proceeded to the metal stairs that would take her to the next deck. The clattering and wheezing above made her smile. Hey, Dart! Hey! Dart came to a red-faced halt at the base of the stairs. Unlike his name, he was anything but slim and sharp. Pudgy, with all his edges softly rounded, he resembled an overweight St. Bernard. His thin, sandy brown hair flopped into his guileless brown eyes. When he smiled, he added another chin to the two he habitually carried. How's it going? Slow. I was going up to see if Hayden wanted some help. I think he's up there buried in his books. Dart flipped his hair back again. Bowers just relieved me at ground zero, but I'm going back in a couple of minutes. Tate's interest peaked. Something interesting on the screen? Not the Justine, but Litz is up there having multi-orgasms. Dart referred to the marine biologist with a shrug. Lots of interesting critters when you get down below a couple thousand feet. Bunch of crabs really got him off. That's his job, Tate pointed out, though she sympathized. No one was fond of the cold, demanding Frank Litz. Doesn't make him less of a creep. See ya. Yeah. Tate made her way forward to Dr. Hayden Deal's workroom. Two computers were humming. A long table bolted to the floor was covered with open books, notes, copies of logs and manifests, charts held down with more books. Hunkered over them and peering through black horn rims, Hayden ran fresh calculations. Tate knew he was a brilliant scientist. She had read his papers, applauded his lectures, studied his documentaries. It was a bonus, she thought, that he was simply a nice man. She knew he was roughly forty. His dark brown hair was sprinkled with gray and tended to curl. Behind the lenses, his eyes were the color of honey and usually distracted. There were character-building lines that fanned from his eyes and scored his brow. He was tall, broad-shouldered, and just a little clumsy. As usual, his shirt was wrinkled. Tate thought he looked a bit like Clark Kent approaching middle age. Hayden? He grunted. As that was more than she'd expected, Tate took a seat directly across from him, folded her arms on the table, and waited until he'd finished muttering to himself. Hayden, she said again. Huh? What? Blinking like an owl, he looked up. His face became quietly charming when he smiled. Hi. Didn't hear you come in. I'm recalculating the drift. I think we're off, Tate. Oh, by much? 
It doesn't take much out here. I decided to start from the beginning. As if preparing for one of his well-attended lectures, he tapped papers together, folded his hands over them. This side-wheeler, Justine, left San Francisco on the morning of June 8, 1857, en route to Ecuador. She held 198 passengers, 61 crew. In addition to the passengers' personal belongings, she carried $20 million in gold, bars and coins. It was a rich time in California, Tate murmured. She'd read the manifests. Even for a woman who had spent most of her life studying and diving for treasure, it had boggled her. She took this route, Hayden continued, tapping keys on the computer so that the graphics mirrored the doomed ship journey south through the Pacific. She went into port at Guadalajara, discharging some passengers, taking on others. She pulled out on June 19th with 202 passengers. He pushed through copies of old newspaper clippings. She was a bright ship, he quoted, and the mood was celebrational. The weather was calm and hot, the sky clear as glass. Too calm, Tate said, well able to imagine the mood, the hope. Elegantly dressed men and women parading the decks, children laughing, perhaps watching the sea for a glimpse of a leaping dolphin or sounding whale. One of the survivors noted the brilliant, almost impossibly beautiful sunset on the night of June 21st. Hayden continued. The air was still and very heavy, hot. Most put it down to their nearness to the equator. But the captain would have known then. Would have or should have. Hayden moved his shoulders. Neither he nor the log survived. But by midnight on the evening of that beautiful sunset, the winds came and the waves. Their route and speed put them here. He took the computer-generated Justine south and west, we have to assume he would have headed for land, Costa Rica by most accounts, hoping he could ride it out. But with 50-foot swells battering his ship, there wasn't much of a chance. All that night and all the next day they fought the storm, Tate added. Terrified passengers, crying children. You'd hardly be able to tell day from night or hear your own prayers. If you were brave or frightened enough to look, all you would see would be wall after wall of water. By the night of the 22nd, the Justine was breaking apart. Hayden continued, There was no hope of saving her or of reaching land in her. They put the women, the children, the injured in lifeboats. Husbands kissing their wives goodbye, Tate said softly. Fathers holding their children for the last time, and all of them knowing it would take a miracle for any of them to survive. Only fifteen did. Hayden scratched his cheek. One lifeboat outwitted the hurricane. If they hadn't, we wouldn't even have these small clues as to where to find her. He glanced up, noticed with alarm that Tate's eyes were wet. It was a long time ago, Tate. I know. Embarrassed, she blinked back the tears. It's just so easy to see it, to imagine what they went through, what they felt. For you it is. He reached over and gave her hand an awkward pat. That's what makes you such a fine scientist. We all know how to calculate facts and theories. Too many of us lack imagination. He wished he had a handkerchief to offer her, or better yet, the nerve to brush away the single tear that had escaped to trail down her cheek. Instead, Hayden cleared his throat and went back to his calculations. I'm going to suggest we move ten degrees south-southwest. Oh, why? Delighted she'd asked, he began to show her. Tate Rose moved behind him to view his screens and his hastily scribbled notes over his shoulder. Occasionally she laid her hand on it or leaned closer to get a better look or ask a question. Each time she did, Hayden's heart would stutter. He called himself a fool, even a middle-aged fool, but it didn't stop the hitch. He could smell her, soap and skin. Each time she laughed in that low, carelessly sexy way, his mind would cloud. He loved everything about her her mind, her heart, and when he let himself fantasize, her wonderfully willowy body. Her voice was like honey poured over brown sugar. Did you hear that? How could he hear anything but her voice when he was all but swimming in it? What? That, she pointed overhead toward the sound of engines. Plain, she realized, and grinned. It must be the food drop. Come on, Hayden, let's go up top, get some sun, and watch them. Well, I haven't quite finished my... Come on, 
Laughing, she grabbed his hand and pulled him to his feet. You're like a mole in here. Just a few minutes on deck. He went with her, of course, feeling very much like a mole chasing a butterfly. She had the loveliest legs. He knew he shouldn't stare at them, but they were the most incredible shade of alabaster. And there was that enchanting little freckle just above the back of her right knee. He'd like to press his mouth just there. The thought of doing it, of perhaps being invited to do it, made his head swim. He cursed himself for being an idiot, reminding himself he was thirteen years her senior. He had a responsibility to her and to the expedition. She was on board the Nomad due to his agreement with the recommendation that had come straight from Trident through its Poseidon arm. He'd been delighted to agree. After all, she'd been his best and brightest student. Wasn't it wonderful the way the sun gilded the flame of her hair? Here comes another one, Tate shouted, and cheered along with the other crew that had gathered as the next package splashed off the stern. We'll eat like kings tonight, Lorraine, her lush little body stuffed into a snug halter and shorts, leaned over the rail. Below, crew were manning a dinghy. Don't leave anything behind, boys. I put in a request for some fumé blanc, Tate. She winked, then turned to flutter her gilded lashes at Hayden. Doc, where have you two been hiding out? Hayden's running new figures. Tate leaned over the rail to shout encouragement as the dinghy putted out to retrieve the supplies. I hope they remembered the chocolate. You only eat sweets because you're repressed. You're just jealous because M&M's go straight to your thighs. Lorraine pursed her lips. My thighs are terrific. She ran a fingertip along one, slanted Hayden a sly look. Aren't they, Doc? Leave Hayden alone, Tate began, then squealed when she was grabbed from behind. Break time. Bowers, tough and sinewy, scooped her up. While others applauded, he dashed to one of the ropes they'd rigged. We're going swimming, baby cakes. I'll kill you, Bowers. She knew their robotics and computer expert loved nothing better than to play. Still laughing, she struggled weakly. This time I mean it. She's nuts about me. With one muscled arm, he snagged the rope. Better hold on, honey child. She looked down as his eyes rolled in his glossy ebony face. He bared his teeth, made her giggle helplessly. How come you always pick on me? Because we look so fine together. Grab hold, me Tarzan, you Jane. Tate gripped the rope, sucked in her breath. With Bowers' wild Tarzan yell ringing in her ears, she pushed off with him into space. She screamed because it felt good. The wide, wide sea tilted beneath her, and as the rope arched, she let go. The air whisked over her. The water rushed up. She heard Bowers cackling like a loon an instant before she hit. It was bracingly cool. She let it bathe her before kicking her way to the surface. Only an 8.4 from the Japanese Judge Beaumont, but they're picky devils. Bowers winked at her, then shaded his eyes. Oh, Christ almighty, here comes Dart. Everybody out of the pool. From the rail, Hayden watched Tate and his associates play like children freshly released to recess. It made him feel old and more than a little stodgy. Come on, Doc. Lorraine gave him her quick, flirtatious smile. Why don't we take a dip? I'm a lousy swimmer. So, wear a flotation, or better yet, use Dart as a raft. That made him smile. At the moment, Dart was bobbing around in the Pacific like a bloated cork. I think I'll just watch. Keeping her smile in place, Lorraine shrugged her bare shoulders. Suit yourself. More than 3,000 miles away from where Tate frolicked in the Crystal Pacific, Matthew shivered in the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. The fact that he headed the salvage team was a small point of pride. He'd worked his way up in fricky salvage over the years, taking on all and any assignments that paid. Now he was in charge of the underwater dig and hauled in ten percent of the net profits, and he hated every minute of it. There wasn't a nastier cut to the pride of a hunter than crewing a big ugly boat on straight metal salvage. There was no gold, no treasure to be discovered on the Reliant. The World War II vessel was crusted with the icy mud of the North Atlantic, its value solely in its metal. Often when his fingers felt like icicles and the exposed skin around his mouth was blue with cold, Matthew dreamed about the days when he dived for pleasure as well as profit. In warm, mirror-like water, in the company of jeweled fish, he remembered what it had felt like to see that flash of gold or a blackened disk of silver. 
but treasure hunting was a gamble, and he was a man with debts to pay. Doctors, lawyers, rehab centers. Jesus, the more he worked, the more he owed. Ten years before, if anyone had suggested his life would turn out to be a cycle of work and bills to be paid, he would have laughed in their faces. Instead, he'd discovered that life was laughing in his. Through the murk, he signaled to his team. It was time to start the slow rise to the surface. The damned ugly reliant lay on its side, already half hacked away by the crew. Matthew poured salt on his own wounds by studying it as he stopped at the first rest point. To think he'd once dreamed of galleons and man o wars, privateers bursting at the seams with bullion. Worse, he'd had one, only to lose it, and everything else. Now he was little better than a junkyard dog, harvesting and guarding scraps. Here the sea was a cave, dark, hostile, almost colorless, cold as fish blood. A man never felt quite human here, not free and weightless as a diver felt in the live waters, but distant and alien, where there was little to see that wasn't eating or being eaten. A careless movement sent an icy spurt of water down the neck of his suit, reminding him that, like it or not, human he was. He kicked to the next point, knowing better than to hurry. However cold the water, however tedious the dive, biology and physics were kings here. Once, five years before, he'd watched a careless diver collapse on deck and die painfully from the bends because he'd hurried the rest stops. It wasn't an experience Matthew intended to have. Once he'd boarded, Matthew reached for the hot coffee a galley mate offered. When his teeth stopped chattering, he gave his orders to the next team, and he damn well intended to tell Fricky that the men were getting a bonus on this trip. It pleased him that Fricky, the miserly bastard, was just enough afraid of him to dip a little deeper into his tight pockets. Mail came in. The mate, a scrawny French Canadian who went only by LaRue, shouldered Matthew's tanks. Put yours in your cabin. He grinned, showing a gleaming gold front tooth. One letter, many bills. Me, I get six letters from six sweethearts. I feel so bad. Maybe I give one to you. Marcella, she not so pretty, but she fuck you blind, deaf, and dumb, eh? Matthew peeled off the hood of his wetsuit. The chill Atlantic air breathed frigidly on his ears. I'll pick my own women. Then why don't you? You need a good bounce or two, Matthew. LaRue, he can spot these things. Matthew brooded out toward the cold gray sea. Women are a little scarce out here. You come with me to Quebec, Matthew. I show you where to get a good drink and a good lay. Get your mind off sex, LaRue. At this rate, we're going to be out here another month. If my mind's all I can get on sex, then he's going to stay there. LaRue called out as Matthew stalked away. Chuckling to himself, he took out his precious tobacco pouch to roll one of his favorite fat, foul-smelling cigarettes. The boy needed guidance, the wisdom of an older man, and a good fuck. What Matthew wanted were warm clothes and another shot of coffee. He found the first in his cabin. After he'd tugged on a sweater and jeans, he poked through the envelopes braced under a rock on the small table that served as his desk. Bills, of course. Medical, the rent on Buck's apartment in Florida, the lawyer Matthew had hired to square things when Buck had wrecked a bar in Fort Lauderdale, the last statement from the last rehabilitation center he'd hauled Buck into in hopes of drying out his uncle. They wouldn't break him, he mused, but they sure as hell weren't going to leave him a lot to play with. The single letter gave him some pleasure. Ray and Marla, he thought, as he sat down with the rest of his coffee to enjoy it. They never failed. Once a month, rain or shine, wherever they happened to be, they'd get a letter to him. Not once in eight years had they let him down. As usual, it was a chatty letter of several pages. Marla's looping feminine handwriting was offset by Ray's quick scrawl in notes and messages in the margins. Nearly five years earlier, they'd moved to the outer banks of North Carolina and built a cottage on the sound side of Hatteras Island. Marla would pepper the letters with descriptions of Ray's puttering around the house, her luck, good or bad, with her garden. Woven through were details of their adventures at sea, their trips to Greece, Mexico, the Red Sea, their impulsive dives along the coast of the Carolinas. And, of course, they wrote of Tate. Matthew knew she was nearing 30, working on her Ph.D., joining varying expeditions. Yet he still saw her as she'd been that long-ago summer, young and fresh and full of promise, 
Over the years, when he thought of her, it was with a vaguely pleasant nostalgic tug. In his mind, she and those days they'd spent together had taken on a burnished golden hue, almost too perfect for reality. He'd long ago stopped dreaming of her. There were debts to be paid, and plans still in the dim future to be settled. Matthew savored each word on each page. The expected invitation for him to visit touched a chord, making him both wistful and bitter. Three years before, he'd browbeaten Buck into making the trip. The four-day visit had been anything but a success. Still, he could remember how quietly at home he felt, looking at the serene waters of the Sound through the fan of pines and bay trees, smelling Marla's cooking, listening to Ray talk of the next wreck and the next shot at gold until Buck had managed to hitch a ride over to Ocracoke on the ferry and get himself stinking drunk. There wasn't any point in going back, Matthew thought, humiliating himself, putting the Beaumonts in that miserable position. The letters were enough. When he shuffled the last page to the front, Ray's crab-like handwriting shot Tate and that summer in the West Indies into sharp and painful focus. Matthew, I've got some concerns I haven't shared with Marla. I will, but I wanted to get your thoughts first. You know Tate is in the Pacific working for Sea Search. She's thrilled with the assignment, we all were. But a few days ago, I was researching some stocks for an old client. I had an impulse to invest in Sea Search myself, a kind of personal tribute to Tate's success. I discovered that the company is an arm of Trident, which in turn is a part of the Van Dyke Corporation. Our Van Dyke. Obviously, this concerns me. I don't know if Tate is aware. I strongly doubt it. There's probably no need for me to worry. I can't imagine Silas Van Dyke would take a personal interest in one of his marine archaeologists. It's doubtful he even remembers her or would care. And yet, I'm uncomfortable knowing she's so far away and even remotely associated with him. I haven't decided if I should contact Tate and let her know what I've learned or leave well enough alone. I'd very much like your thoughts on this. Matthew, I'd like them in person, if you can find a way to come to Hatteras. There's something more I want very much to discuss with you. I made an incredible find only a few weeks ago, something I've been searching for for nearly eight years. I want to show it to you. When I do, I hope you'll share my excitement. Matthew, I'm going back for the Isabella. I need you and Buck with me. Please come to Hatteras and take a look at what I've put together before you reject the idea. She's ours, Matthew. She's always been ours. It's time for us to claim her. Fondly, Ray. Jesus. Matthew skipped back to the beginning of the page and read it a second time. Ray Beaumont didn't believe in dropping his bombshells lightly. In a couple of quick paragraphs, he had set off charges that exploded from Tate to Van Dyke to the Isabella. Go back? Suddenly, fiercely angry, Matthew slapped the letter down on the table. Damned if he'd go back and dredge up his most complete and horrendous failure. He was making his life, wasn't he? Such as it was. He didn't need old ghosts tempting him back toward that glint of gold. He wasn't a hunter anymore, he thought as he lunged out of the chair to pace the small cabin. He neither wanted nor needed to be. Some men could live on dreams. He had once, and didn't intend to do so again. It was money he needed, he fumed. Money and time. When both were in his pocket, he would finish what was begun half a lifetime ago over his father's body. He would find Van Dyke and he would kill him. And as for Tate, she wasn't his problem. He'd done her a good turn once, Matthew remembered, and scowled down at the letter on the table. The best turn of her life. If she'd screwed it up by getting hooked into one of Van Dyke's schemes, it was on her head. She was a grown woman now, wasn't she, with a potload of education and fancy degrees. God damn it, she owed him every bit of it, and no one had the right to make him feel responsible for her now. But he could see her, as she'd been then, awed by a simple silver coin, glowing in his arms, courageously attacking a shark with a diver's knife. He swore again, viciously, then again, quietly. Leaving the letter and the mug where they were, he headed out to the radio room. He needed to make some calls. Tate entered the room the crew had dubbed Ground Zero. It was crammed with computers, keyboards, monitors. The sonar dial glowed green as the needle swept. Remotes for the cameras that took stereo photos were easily at hand. At the moment, however, the area was more of a rec room for adolescents than a scientific lab. 
Dart was in a corner with Bowers, relieving tedium by trouncing the computer at a game of mortal combat. It was late, nearly midnight, and she'd have been better off in her cabin getting a good night's sleep or working on her dissertation. But she was restless, and Lorraine had been edgy. The cabin had seemed too small for both of them. Taking a handful of Dart's candy, she settled down to watch the monitor that showed the sweep of the sea floor. It was so dark, she mused, cold, tiny luminescent fish hunted food. They moved slowly, surrounded by points of phosphorescence that resembled stars. The soft, even sediments of the sea plain were featureless, yet there was life. She saw a sea worm, hardly more than a primitive stomach, glide by the camera's range. The huge eyes of a cystosoma made her smile. It was, in its own way, a kind of fairyland, she thought, hardly the wasteland a number of oceanographers had once thought, and certainly not the dumping ground certain industries chose to regard it as. It was colorless, true, but those magically transparent, pulsing fish and animals turned it into an eerie wonder. Tate was comforted by it, the continuity, the antiquity. The monitor lulled her like an old late-night movie until she was nearly dozing in the chair. Then she was blinking, her subconscious struggling to transmit to her eyes what she was viewing. Coral, crabs, they would colonize any handy structure, and they were busily doing so. It was wood, she realized, leaning forward. It was the hull of a ship, encrusted with life of the deep sea. Bowers? Just a minute, Tate. I gotta finish ragging on this boy. Bowers, now! What's the hurry? Forehead furrowed. He swiveled back to her. Nobody's going anywhere. Holy hell. Staring at the monitor, he slipped his chair forward, hitting the necessary controls to stop the camera's sweep. But for the beep of the equipment, the room was silent as the three of them stared at the screen. It could be her. Tate's voice was thin with excitement. Could be, Bowers replied, and got to work. Handle the digital start. Tate, signal the bridge for a full stop. They didn't speak again for several moments. While the tapes ran, Bowers zoomed in closer and sent the camera on a slow sweep. The wreck was teeming with life. Tate imagined that Litz and the other biologists on board would soon be singing hosannas. With her lips pressed together, she held her breath, then let it out on an explosive puff. Oh, Christ, look! Do you see it? Dart's answer was a nervous giggle. It's the wheel. Look at that honey lying there, just waiting for us to come along and find her. She's a side-wheeler, Bowers. It's the goddamn beautiful Justine. Bowers halted the camera. Children, he said, and got shakily to his feet. At a moment like this, I believe I should say something profound. He laid a hand on his heart. We've done did it. With one wild hoot, he grabbed Tate and did a fast boogie. Laughter and excitement had tears rushing to her eyes. Let's wake up the ship, she decided and dashed off. She raced to her own cabin first to rouse a cranky Lorraine. Get down to ground zero now. What? Are we sinking? Go away, Tate. I'm busy being seduced by Harrison Ford. He'll wait. Get down there. To ensure obedience, Tate ripped the sheet off Lorraine's curled, naked body. But for God's sake, put a robe on first. Leaving Lorraine swearing at her, she dashed down the corridor to Hayden's cabin. Hayden? Struggling with giggles, she pounded on his door. Come on, Hayden. Red alert. All hands on deck. Get the lead out. What is it? his eyes owlishly wide without his glasses, his hair sticking straight up and a blanket held modestly around his waist, he blinked at Tate. Is somebody hurt? No, everybody's wonderful. In that moment, she was sure he was quite simply the sweetest man she had ever met. Following impulse, she threw her arms around him, nearly knocking him down, and kissed him. Oh, Hayden, I can't wait to... The first shock of his mouth closing hungrily over hers had her going still. She knew desire when she tasted it on a man's lips, knew need when she felt it trembling in a man's arms. For both of them, she relaxed, lifting a hand gently to his cheek until the kiss played out. Hayden? I'm sorry. Appalled, he stepped stiffly back. You caught me off guard, Tate. I shouldn't have done that. It's all right. She smiled, laid both hands on his shoulders. Really, it's all right, Hayden. I'd say we caught each other off guard. And it was nice. As associates, he began, terrified he might stammer. As your superior, I had no right to make an advance. She suppressed a sigh. Hayden, 
It was only a kiss, and I kissed you first. I don't think you're going to fire me over it. No, of course not. I, I only meant... You meant you wanted to kiss me? You did, and it was nice. Patiently, she took his head. Let's not go crazy over it, especially since we've got a lot more to go crazy over. You want to know why I beat on your door, dragged you out of bed, and threw myself at you? Well, I... He pushed at glasses he wasn't wearing and poked himself in the nose. Yes. Hayden, we found the Justine. Now hold on to yourself, she warned, because I'm going to kiss you again. Chapter 12 The droid did the work, and that was the problem. A week into the excavation of the Justine, Tate found herself struggling with a vague sense of dissatisfaction. It was everything they'd hoped for. The wreck was rich. There were gold coins, gold bars, some of them a full sixty pounds. Artifacts were transferred to the surface in abundance. The droid worked busily, digging, lifting, shifting booty with Bowers and Dart working the controls at ground zero. Now and again, Tate took a break from her own work to watch the monitor and observe how the machine would haul a heavy load in his mechanical arms or snag a sea sponge delicately with his pinchers for the biologist to study. The expedition was a complete success. Tate was suffering through a profound sense of envy for an ugly metal robot. At her station in a forward cabin, she photographed, examined, and cataloged the bits and pieces of mid-nineteenth century life. A cameo brooch, bits of crockery, spoons, a pewter inkwell, a child's worm-eaten wooden top, and, of course, the coins. Both silver and gold were stacked on her work table. They glittered, thanks to Lorraine's work in the lab, as though they were freshly minted. Tate picked up a five-dollar gold piece, a beautiful little disc dated 1857, the year the Justine sank. How many hands had it passed through, she wondered. Perhaps only a few. It might have been tucked into a lady's purse or a gentleman's pocket. Maybe it had paid for a bottle of wine or a Cuban cigar, a new hat. Or maybe it had never been used, only held in anticipation of some small treat it could buy at the end of the journey. Now it was in her hand, part of so many lost treasures. Pretty, isn't it? Lorraine came in. She carried a tray of artifacts, newly decalcified and cleaned in her lab. Yeah. Tate replaced the coin, logged it in her computer. There's enough work here for a year. You sound real happy about it. Curious, Lorraine tilted her head. Scientists are supposed to be pleased when they have themselves steady field work. I am pleased. Tate meticulously logged the brooch, set it aside in a tray. Why wouldn't I be? I'm involved in one of the most exciting finds of my career, part of a team of top scientists. I have the very best equipment, better than average working and living conditions. She picked up the child's toy. I'd be crazy not to be pleased. So why don't you tell me why you're crazy? Lips pursed. Tate gave the toy a quick spin. You've never dived. It's hard to explain to someone who's never gone down, never seen it. Lorraine sat down, tipped her feet up on the edge of the table. A tattoo of a unicorn rode colorfully over the inside of her ankle. I've got some time. Why don't you try? This isn't hunting for treasure, she began, her voice sharp with annoyance, fully self-directed. It's computers and machines and robotics, and it's marvelous in its way. We'd never have found the Justine or been able to study her without the equipment, obviously. A fresh wave of restlessness had her pushing back from her work table, pacing to the porthole that was her miserly view of the sea. It couldn't be excavated or studied without it. The pressure and temperature at that depth make diving impossible. It's basic biology, basic physics, I know it. But damn it, Lorraine, I want to go down. I want to touch it. I want to fan away the sand and find some piece of yesterday. Bowers' droids having all the fun. Yeah, he's always bragging about it. I know it sounds stupid. Because it did, Tate was able to smile as she turned back. But diving a wreck, being there's an incredible high. And this is all so sterile. I didn't know I'd feel this way, but every time I come in here to work, I remember what it was like. My first dive, my first wreck, work in the airlift, hauling up conglomerate. All the fish, the coral, the mud and sand. The work, Lorraine, the physical strain of it. You feel like you're part of it. She spread her arms, let them fall. This seems so removed, so cold and intrusive somehow. So scientific, Lorraine put in. 
Science without participation, for me anyway. I remember when I found my first coin, a silver piece of eight. We had a virgin wreck in the West Indies. She sighed, sad again. I was twenty. It was a very eventful summer for me. We found a Spanish galleon and lost it. I fell in love and had my heart broken. I've never been that involved with anything or anyone again. I haven't wanted to be. Because of the ship or the man? Both. In a few weeks, I experienced absolute joy and absolute grief. A difficult ride at twenty. I went back to college that fall with my goals very well defined. I would get my degree and be the very best in my field. I would do exactly what I'm doing now and keep a logical, professional distance. And here I am, eight years later, wondering if I've made some terrible mistake. Lorraine cocked a brow. You don't like your work? I love my work. I'm just having a hard time letting machines do the best part of it for me, keeping me at that logical, professional distance. It doesn't sound like a crisis to me, Tate. It just sounds like you need to strap on your tanks and have a little fun. She studied the nails she'd recently manicured. If that's the way you define fun, when's the last time you took a vacation? Oh, let's see. Tate leaned back, closed her eyes. It would have been about eight years ago, unless we count a couple of quick weekends and Christmases at home. We don't, Lorraine said definitely. Dr. Lorraine's prescription is very simple. What you've got here is a case of the blues. Take a month off when we're done here. Go someplace with lots of palm trees and spend lots of time with fish. Lorraine developed a sudden avid interest in her manicure and studied the coral pink enamel. If you wanted company, Hayden would jump at the chance to go with you. Hayden? To use a technical term, the man's nuts about you. Hayden? Yes, Hayden. Lorraine jerked back so that her feet slapped on the floor. Christ, Tate, pay attention. He's been mooning over you for weeks. Hey, Tate began before she caught herself. We're friends, Lorraine, associates. Then she remembered the way he'd kissed her the night they'd found the Justine. Well, hell. He's a terrific man. Of course he is. Baffled, Tate dragged a hand through her hair. I just... Never thought about him that way. He's thinking about you that way. It's not a good idea, Tate murmured. Not a good idea to get involved with someone you're working with. I know. Your choice, Lorraine said carelessly. I just thought it was time somebody gave the guy a break and let you know. I'm also supposed to let you know that some reps from Sea Search and Poseidon are coming to examine and transport some of the loot, and they're bringing a film crew. A film crew? Automatically, Tate filed the problem of Hayden in the back of her mind. I thought we were doing our own video records. They'll use ours as well. We're going to be a cable documentary, so don't forget your mascara and lipstick. When do they do? They're on their way. Hardly realizing it, Tate picked up the wooden top, cupped it possessively in her hands. They're not moving anything I haven't finished studying and cataloging. You be sure to tell them that, champ. Lorraine headed for the door. But remember, we are just the hired help. The hired help, Tate thought, and set the top carefully aside. Maybe that was the crux of it. Somehow she'd gone from being an independent woman looking for adventure to a competent drone who worked for a faceless corporation. It made her work possible, she reminded herself. Scientists were always beggars, and yet... There were a lot of and yets in her life, she realized... She was going to have to take some time and decide which ones mattered. Matthew decided he'd lost his mind. He'd quit his job, a job he hated, but one that had paid the bills and left enough to spare to keep a couple of small dreams from dying. Without the job, the boat he'd been building bit by bit over the years would never be completed. His uncle would be forced to live on subsidies, and he would be lucky to be able to afford a decent meal in six months' time. Not only had he quit his job, but he'd been maneuvered into taking LaRue along with him. The man had simply packed up and shipped out with him with no encouragement at all. As Matthew saw it, he was now stuck with two dependents, two men who spent most of their time arguing with each other and pointing out his flaws. So here he sat, outside a trailer in southern Florida, wondering when he had gone mad. It was the letter from the Beaumonts that had started it. The mention of Tate, of Van Dyke, and, of course, the Isabella. 
It had brought back too many memories, too many failures, and too much hope. Before he'd let himself think through the consequences, he'd been packing his gear. Now that his bridges were burning at his back, Matthew had plenty of time to think. What the hell was he going to do with Buck? The man's drinking was out of hand again. Big surprise, Matthew thought. Every year he came back to Florida and spent his month on shore struggling to get his uncle dry. And every year he went back to sea, hampered with guilt, regrets, and the grief that he would never be able to make a difference. Even now he could hear Buck's voice lifted in drunken bitterness. Despite the rain that was falling in steady, sodden sheets, Matthew remained outside under the rusted, leaking awning. What is this slop? Buck demanded, clattering into the tiny kitchen. LaRue didn't bother to glance up from the book he was reading. It is bouillabaisse, a family recipe. Slop, Buck said again. French slop. Unshaven, wearing the clothes he'd slept in, Buck slammed open a cabinet door in search of a bottle. I don't want it smelling up my house. In answer, LaRue turned a page. Where the fuck's my whiskey? Buck stabbed his hand into the cupboard, knocking over and scattering the meager supplies. I had a bottle in here, goddammit. Me? I prefer a good Beaujolais, LaRue commented, at room temperature. He heard the screen door open and marked his place in his Faulkner novel. The evening show was about to begin. You been stealing my whiskey, you fucking Canuck. As LaRue's tooth gleamed in a snarl, Matthew stepped in. There isn't any whiskey. I got rid of it. Hampered more from his morning's drinking than by his prosthesis, Buck turned on him. You got no right to take my bottle. Who was this man, Matthew thought, this stranger? If Buck was somewhere in that bloated, unshaven face, in those red-rimmed, bleary eyes, he could no longer see him. Right or not, he said calmly, I got rid of it. Try the coffee. In response, Buck grabbed the pot from the stove and hurled it against the wall. So don't try the coffee. Because he was tempted to ball them into fists, Matthew tucked his hands into his pockets. You want a drink, you're going to have to do it somewhere else. I'm not going to watch you kill yourself. What I do is my business, Buck muttered, crunching over broken glass and slopped coffee. Not while I'm around. You're never around, are you? Buck nearly skidded on the wet tile, righted himself. His face went pink with humiliation. Every step he took was a reminder. You blow in here when you please and blow out the same way. You got no business boy telling me what to do in my own house. It's my house, Matthew said softly. You're just dying in it. He could have dodged the blow. He took Buck's fist on his jaw philosophically. In some perverse part of his brain, he was pleased to note that his uncle could still pack a punch. While Buck stared at him, Matthew wiped the blood from his mouth with the back of his hand. I'm going out, he said and left. Go away! Walk away! Buck shambled to the door to shout after him over the drumming rain. Walking away's what you're best at. Why don't you keep walking? Nobody here needs you. Nobody needs you. LaRue waited until Buck lumbered back toward the bedroom, then rose to turn down the heat on his stew. He took his jacket and Matthew's and slipped out of the trailer. They had been in Florida three days, but LaRue knew just where Matthew would go. Adjusting the brim of his cap so that the rain sluiced off in front of his face, he made his way down to the marina. It was nearly deserted, and the lock was off the door of the concrete garage that Matthew rented by the month. He found Matthew inside, sitting in the bow of a nearly finished boat. It was a double hull, almost as wide as it was long. LaRue's first glimpse of it after they'd arrived had impressed him. It was a pretty thing, not dainty by any means, but sturdy and tough the way LaRue preferred his boats and his women. Matthew had designed the deck section to lay across the top of the hulls so that it would stay clear in rough seas. Each bow had an inward curve that would create a cushioning effect and lead to not only a smoother ride, but a faster one. There was plenty of storage area and seating, but the genius of the design, in LaRue's opinion, was the 60 square feet of open deck forward. Treasure room, LaRue thought. All it lacked were the finishing touches, the paint and bright work, the bridge equipment, navigational devices, and, LaRue thought, a suitable name. He climbed up, impressed again by the sharp, cutting look of the bows. It would take the water, he mused. It would fly. So, when you finish this thing, eh? I've got the time now, don't I? Matthew envisioned the rails, brass and teak. All I need's the money. Me? 
I got plenty of money. Thoughtfully, LaRue took out a leather pouch and began the slow, and to him, pleasurable process of rolling a cigarette. What do I spend it on but women? And they don't cost so much as most men think. So maybe I give you the money to finish it, and you give me part of the boat. Matthew let out a sour laugh. What part do you want? LaRue leaned into the backrest, carefully sealing the cigarette paper around the tobacco. A boat a man builds is a good place to come when he wants to brood. Tell me this, Matthew. Why did you let him hit you? Why not? Seems to me it'd be better if you hit him. Right, that would be great. It would do a lot of good for me to knock down a cripple. LaRue finished mildly. No, you never let him forget he's not what he was. Furious, surprised into hurt, Matthew lunged to his feet. Where the hell do you come off saying that? What the hell do you know about it? I've done everything I can for him. You've done. LaRue struck a match, let it flare on the edge of the neatly rolled cigarette. You pay for the roof over his head, the food in his belly, the whiskey he kills himself with. All it costs him is his pride. What the hell am I supposed to do? Toss him out into the street? LaRue shrugged. You don't ask him to be a man, so he's not a man. Butt out. I think you like your guilt, Matthew. It keeps you from doing what you want and maybe failing at it. He only grinned when Matthew hauled him up by the shirt front. See, me you treat like a man. He cocked up his chin, not entirely sure it wouldn't be broken in the next ten seconds. You can hit me. I'll hit you back. When we are finished, we'll make a deal for the boat. What the hell are you doing here? In disgust, Matthew shoved him back. I don't need company. I don't need another partner. You do, yes. And I like you, Matthew. LaRue sat again, neatly tapping the ash from his cigarette into his palm. And I figure this. You're going to go back for that ship you once told me about. Maybe you'll go after this Van Dyke you hate so much. Maybe you'll even go back for the woman you want. I'm going because I don't mind being rich. I like to see a good fight. And me... I have a soft spot for romance. You're an asshole, LaRue. Christ knows why I ever told you about that shit. He lifted his hands, rubbed them over his face. I must have been drunk. No, you never let yourself get drunk. You were talking to yourself, mon ami. I was just there. Maybe I'll go back for the wreck. And maybe if I get lucky, I'll cross paths with Van Dyke again. But there's no woman anymore. There's always a woman, if not one, another. LaRue shrugged his bony shoulders. Me, I don't understand why men lose their minds over a woman. One leaves, another comes along. But an enemy, that's worth working for. And money? Well, it's easier to be rich than poor. So we finish your boat, eh? And go looking for fortune and revenge. Wary, Matthew eyed LaRue. The equipment I want isn't cheap. Nothing worthwhile is cheap. We may never find the wreck. Even if we do, mining her is going to be hard, dangerous work. Danger is what makes life interesting. You've forgotten that, Matthew. Maybe, he murmured. He began to feel something stir again. It was the blood he'd let settle and cool over the years. He held out a hand. We finished the boat. It was three days later when Buck made his way into the garage. He'd gotten a bottle somewhere, Matthew deduced. The sour stench of whiskey surrounded him. Where the hell you think you're going to take this tub? Matthew continued to lovingly sand the teak for the rail. Hatteras to start. I'm hooking up with the Beaumonts. Shit. Amateurs. A little rocky on his feet, Buck walked to the stern. What the hell did you build a catamaran for? Because I wanted to. Single hull's always been good enough for me. Good enough for your father, too. It's not your boat. It's not his boat. It's mine. That stung. What kind of color is this you're painting her? Damn sissy blue. Caribbean blue, Matthew corrected. I like it. Probably sink the first time you hit weather. Buck sniffed and stopped himself from caressing one of the hulls. I guess all you and Ray are good for now is pleasure sailing. Experimentally, Matthew ran the pad of his thumb over the teak. It was satin smooth. We're going after the Isabella. Silence sparked like naked wires crossed. Matthew hefted the sanded rail over his shoulder and turned. 
Buck had a hand on the boat now, braced as he swayed like a man already at sea. The hell you are. Ray's decided to go. He found something he wants to show me. As soon as I can get things done here, I'm heading up. Regardless of what Ray's come up with, I'm going after her. It's long past time I did. Are you out of your mind, boy? Do you know what she cost us? Cost me. Matthew set the rail aside for varnishing. I've got a pretty good idea. You had a treasure, didn't you? You let her go. You let that bastard Van Dyke dance off with it. You lost it for me when I was half dead. Now you think you're going back and leaving me here to rot? I'm going. What you do is your business. Panicked, Buck slammed the heel of his hand into Matthew's chest. Who's going to see to what I need here? You go off like this, the money will be gone in a month. You owe me, boy. I saved your worthless life. I lost my leg for you. I lost everything for you. The guilt still came, waves of it a strong man could drown in. But this time, Matthew shook his head. He wasn't going under again. I'm finished owing you, Buck. Eight years I've worked my ass off so you could drink yourself into a coma and make me pay for every breath I took. I'm done. I'm going after something I'd convinced myself I couldn't have, and I'm going to get her. They'll kill you. The Isabella and Angelique's curse. And if they don't, Van Dyke will. Then where will I be? Just where you are now. Standing on two legs. One of them I paid for. He didn't take the punch this time. Instead, he caught Buck's fist in his hand an inch before it struck his face. Without thinking, he shoved back so that Buck stumbled into the stern of the boat. Try that again and I'll take you down, old man or not. Matthew planted his feet, prepared to face off if Buck lunged again. In ten days, I'm leaving for Hatteras with LaRue. You can pull yourself together or you can go fuck yourself at your choice. Now get the hell out. I've got work to do. With a shaking hand, Buck wiped his mouth. His phantom leg began to throb, a nasty, grinning ghost that never quite gave up the haunting. Sick at heart... He hurried off to find a bottle. Alone, Matthew hefted another section of rail and went to work like a man possessed. Chapter 13 As far as Silas Van Dyke was concerned, Manzanillo was the only place to spend the first breaths of spring. His cliff house on the western Mexican coast afforded him the most spectacular view of the restless Pacific. There was nothing more relaxing than standing by his wall of windows and watching the waves crash and spew. Power never failed to fascinate him. As an Aquarian, he considered water his element. He loved the sight of it, the smell of it, the sound of it. Though he traveled extensively for both business and pleasure, he could never be away from his element for long. All of his homes had been bought or built near some body of water. His villa in Capri his plantation in Fiji, his bungalow on Martinique. Even his brownstone in New York afforded him a view of the Hudson. But he had a particular fondness for his hideaway in Mexico. Not that this particular trip was one of leisure. Van Dyke's work ethic was as disciplined as the rest of him. Rewards were earned, and he had earned his. He believed in labor, the exercise of the body as well as the mind. It was true that he had inherited a great deal of his wealth, but he had not whiled away his time or whittled away his resources. No, he had built on them doggedly and shrewdly until he had easily tripled the legacy passed to him. He considered himself discreet and dignified. No publicity-seeking Trump, Van Dyke pursued his personal and business affairs quietly and with a subtle flair that kept his name out of the press and tabloid news. Unless he put them there... Publicity of the proper type could shade a business deal and tip the scales when necessary. He had never married, though he admired women greatly. Marriage was a contract, and the negating of that contract was too often messy, too often public. Heirs were often a result of that contract, and heirs could be used against a man. Instead, he chose his companions with care, treated them with the same respect and courtesy as he would treat any employee, and when a woman ceased to entertain him, she was generously dispatched. Few complained. The little Italian socialite he had recently grown weary of had been a bit of a problem. The icy diamonds he'd offered as a parting gift hadn't cooled her hot temper. She'd actually threatened him. With some regret, he'd arranged for her to be taught a lesson— but he'd given strict orders that there were to be no visible scars. 
After all, she had a lovely face and body that had given him a great deal of pleasure. It seemed to him that violence, well-skilled violence, was a tool no successful man could afford to ignore. In the last few years, he had used it often, and he thought quite well. The oddest thing was that it gave him so much more pleasure than he had expected. A kind of cheap emotional profit, he decided. Privately, he could admit that by paying for it, he often soothed those black tempers that raged over him. So many men he knew, men who, like him, controlled great wealth and managed responsibilities, lost their edge by accepting certain failures, making too many concessions. Or they simply burned themselves out by fighting to stay on top. Frustrations, he thought, unreleased, festered. A wise man took his relief and always, always counted the profit. Now he had business to attend to, business to entertain him. At the moment, his priority was the nomad, its crew, and its brilliant find. As he'd ordered, the reports were on his desk. He'd hand-picked the team for his expedition, from the scientists to the technicians and down to the galley staff. It pleased him to know that once again his instincts had been on target. They hadn't failed him. When the expedition was complete, Van Dyke would see to it that each and every member of the nomad team received a bonus. He admired scientists tremendously, their logic and discipline, their vision. He was more than satisfied with Frank Litz, both as a biologist and as a spy. The man kept him up to date on the personal dynamics and intimacies of the nomad's crew. Yes, he thought Litz a happy find, particularly after the disappointment of Piper. The young archaeologist had had potential, Van Dyke mused, but that one little flaw had made him sloppy. Addictions led to a lack of order— why, he himself had given up smoking years before simply to make a point. Inner strength equaled power over personal environment. A pity Piper had lacked inner strength. In the end, Van Dyke had harbored no regrets in offering him the uncut cocaine that had killed him. In truth, it had been rather thrilling, the ultimate termination of an employee. Settling back, he studied the reports from Litz and his team of marine biologists on the ecosystem, the plants and animals that had colonized the wreck of the Justine. Sponges, gold coral, worms. Nothing was beneath Van Dyke's interest. What was there could be harvested and used. With the same respect and interest, he studied the reports of the geologists, the chemist, those of the representatives he had sent to observe the operation and its results. Like a child with a treat, he saved the archaeologist's report for last. It was meticulously organized, thorough and clear as new glass. No detail was omitted, down to the last shard of crockery. Each artifact was described, dated, and photographed. Each item cataloged according to the date and time it was discovered. There was a cross-reference with the chemist's report as to how the article was treated, tested, cleaned. A father's pride swept through Van Dyke as he read the carefully typed pages. He was glowingly pleased with Tate Beaumont, considered her a protege. She would make a fine replacement for the unfortunate Piper. Perhaps it had been impulse that had urged him to have her education monitored over the years, but the impulse had more than paid off. The way she had faced him on board the triumphant, with fury and intelligence firing her eyes, oh, he admired that. Courage was a valuable asset, when tempered with a well-ordered mind. Tate Beaumont possessed both. Professionally, she had more than exceeded his early expectations of her. She'd graduated third in her class, publishing her first paper in her sophomore year. Her postgraduate work had been simply brilliant. She would earn her doctorate years before the majority of her contemporaries. He was thrilled with her. So thrilled, he had opened several doors for her along the way doors that even with her skills and tenacity might have been difficult for her to unlatch. Her opportunity to research in a two-man sub off Turkey in depths of 600 feet had come through him, though like an indulgent uncle he had taken no credit, yet. Her personal life earned his admiration as well. Initially he'd been disappointed that she hadn't remained attached to Matthew Lassiter. A continued connection would have been one more method of keeping tabs on Matthew. Yet he'd been pleased that she'd shown the obvious good taste to shrug off a man so clearly beneath her. She'd concentrated on her studies, her goals, as he would have expected from his own daughter, had he a daughter. Twice she had explored relationships, the first no more than the rebellion of youth, in Van Dyke's opinion. 
The young man she'd attached herself to in the initial weeks after her return to college had been little more than an experiment, he was sure. But she'd soon shaken herself loose from the muscle-bound, empty-headed jock. A woman like Tate required intellect, style, breeding. Indeed, after graduation, she had been drawn into a liaison with a fellow postgraduate student who shared many of her interests. That had lasted just under ten months and had caused Van Dyke some concern. But that, too, had ended when he'd arranged to have the man offered a position at his Oceanographic Institute in Greenland. To fully realize her potential, he felt Tate needed to limit her distractions, as he had over the years. Marriage and family would only tilt her priorities. He was delighted that she was now working for him. He intended to keep her on the fringes for the present. In time, if she continued to prove worthy, he would draw her into the core. A woman of her intelligence and ambitions would recognize the debt she owed him and would understand the value of what he could continue to offer. One day they would meet again, work side by side. He was a patient man and could wait for her. As he waited for Angelique's curse... His instincts told him that when the time was finally right, one would lead him to the other. Then he would have everything. Van Dyke glanced over as his facts began to hum. Rising, he poured himself a large tumbler of freshly squeezed orange juice. If he hadn't had such a full schedule that day, he would have added just a dollop of champagne. Such small luxuries could wait. He lifted a brow as he picked up the facts. It was his latest report on the Lassiter's. So, he mused, Matthew had jumped ship and gone back to his uncle. Perhaps he would stick the drunken fool in another rehab center. It continued to surprise him that Matthew didn't simply leave the old man to wallow in his own vomit and disappear. Family loyalty, he thought, shaking his head. It was something Van Dyke knew existed but had never experienced. If his own father hadn't conveniently died at fifty, Van Dyke would have implemented his plans for a takeover. Fortunately, he had no siblings to rival with, and his mother had faded quietly away in an exclusive mental hospital when he'd been barely thirteen. He had only himself, Van Dyke thought, sipping the chilled juice, and his fortune. It was well worth using a small part of it to keep an eye on Matthew Lassiter. Family loyalty, he thought again with a small smile. If it ran true, Matthew's father had found a way to pass his secret to his son— Sooner or later, Matthew would be compelled to hunt for Angelique's curse, and Van Dyke, patient as a spider, would be waiting. Rough weather hit the nomad and halted excavation for 48 hours. High seas had half the crew down for the count, despite seasick pills and patches. Tate and her cast-iron constitution rode out the storm with a thermos of coffee at her work table. She'd left the cabin to a moaning, green-faced Lorraine, The rock and roll of the boat didn't stop her from cataloging the newest additions to the trove. I thought I'd find you here. She looked up, let her fingers pause on her keyboard, and smiled at Hayden. I thought you were lying down, she tilted her head. You're a little pale yet, but you've lost that interesting green tinge. Her smile widened wickedly. Want a cookie? Feeling smug? Warily, he kept his eyes averted from the plate of cookies on the table. I hear Bowers is having a great time finding new ways to describe pork to dart. Hmm. Bowers and I and a few of the others enjoyed quite a hearty breakfast this morning, she laughed. Rest easy, Hayden. I won't describe it to you. Have a seat. It's embarrassing for the team leader to lose his dignity this way. Grateful, he lowered himself into a folding chair. Too much time in the classroom. Not enough in the field, I guess. You're doing okay. Happy to have company, she turned away from the monitor. The entire film crew's down. I hate to be pleased with anyone's misfortune, but it's a relief not to have them hovering for a couple of days. A documentary will pump up interest in this kind of expedition, he pointed out. We can use the exposure and the grants. I know. It isn't often you have the benefit of a privately funded expedition or one that pays off so successfully. Look at this, Hayden. She lifted a gold watch, complete with chain and fob. Beautiful, isn't it? The detail of etching on the cover. You can practically smell the roses. Lovingly, she rubbed a thumb over the delicately etched sprig of buds before carefully opening the clasp. To David, my beloved husband, who makes time stop for me. Elizabeth, 2449. 
Her heart sighed over it. There was a David and Elizabeth McGowan on the manifest, she told Hayden in a voice that had thickened, and their three minor children. She and her eldest daughter survived. She lost a son, another daughter, and her beloved David. Time stopped for them and never started again. She closed the watch gently. He'd have been wearing this when the ship went down, she murmured. He'd have kept it with him. He might have even opened it, read the inscription one last time after he said goodbye to her and their children. They never saw each other again. For more than a hundred years, this token of how much she loved him has been waiting for someone to find it and remember them. It's humbling, Hayden said after a moment, when the student outstrips the teacher. You have more than I ever did, he added when Tate glanced up in surprise. I would see a watch, the style, the manufacturer. I would note the inscription down, pleased to have a date to corroborate my calculation of its era. I might even give David and Elizabeth a passing thought. Certainly I would have looked for them in the manifest. But I wouldn't see them. I wouldn't feel them. It isn't scientific. Archaeology is meant to study culture. Too often we forget that people make culture. The best of us don't. The best of us make it matter. He laid a hand over hers, the way you do. I don't know what to do when it makes me sad. She turned her hand over so that their fingers linked. If I could, I'd take this and I'd find their great-great-grandchildren so I could say, Look, this is part of David and Elizabeth. This is who they were. Feeling foolish, she set the watch aside. But it doesn't belong to me. It doesn't even belong to them now. It belongs to Sea Search. Without Sea Search, it would never have been found. I understand that. I do. Needing to clarify her own feelings, she leaned closer. What we're doing here is important, Hayden. The way we're doing it is innovative and efficient. Over and above the fortune we're bringing up, there's knowledge, discovery, theory. We're making the Justine and the people who died with her real and vital again. But that's where I stumble. Where will David's watch go, Hayden, and the dozens and dozens of other personal treasures people carried with them? We have no control over it because no matter how important our work, we are employees. With dots, Hayden, in some huge conglomerate. Sea search to Poseidon, Poseidon to Trident, and on. His lips curved. Most of us spend our working lives as dots, Tate. Are you content with that? I suppose I am. I'm able to do the work I love, teach, lecture, publish, without those conglomerates with their slices of social conscience or eye for a tax write-off, I'd never be able to take time for this kind of hands-on field work and still eat on a semi-regular basis. It was true, of course. It made perfect sense, and yet... But is it enough, Hayden? Should it be enough? How much are we missing by being up here, not risking anything or experiencing the hunt, not having some claim or control over what we do and what we discover? Aren't we in danger of losing the passion that pulled us into this in the first place? You aren't. His heart began to accept what his head had told him all along. She would never be for him. She was an exotic flower to his simple, plodding drone. You'll never lose it, because it's what defines you. In a symbolic farewell to a foolish dream, he lifted her hand and pressed his lips to her knuckles. Hayden... He could read the concern, the regret, and, painfully, the sympathy in her eyes. Don't worry. Just a token of admiration from colleague to colleague. I have a suspicion we're not going to be working together much longer. I haven't decided, she said quickly. I think you have. I have responsibilities here, and I owe you, Hayden, for recommending me for this position. Your name was already on the list, he corrected. I merely agreed with the choice. But... I thought, her brow creased, you've earned a reputation, Tate. I appreciate that, Hayden, but already on the list, you said. Whose list? Trident's. The brass there was impressed with your record. Actually, I got the feeling there was some definite pressure to put you on from one of the money men. Not that I wasn't happy to go along with the recommendation. I see. For reasons she couldn't name, her throat felt dry. Who would that be? The money man? Like you said, I'm just a dot. He shrugged his shoulders as he rose. Anyway, should you decide to resign before the expedition is finished, I'd be sorry to lose you, but it's your choice. 
You're getting ahead of me. It made her nervous to realize she'd been singled out somehow, but she smiled at Hayden. But thanks. When he left her, she rubbed her hands over her mouth. Where had this spooky feeling come from, she wondered. Why hadn't she known about a list or that her name had been on it? Turning to her monitor, she clattered keys, eyes narrowed on the screen. Trident, Hayden had said. So she would bypass Poseidon and sea search for the moment to find where the power was at any level. You looked for the money. Hey, friends and neighbors. Bowers strolled in, gnawing on a chicken leg. Lunch is up in more ways than one. He wiggled his brows at Tate and waited for her to chuckle. Give me a hand here, Bowers. Sure, sweet thing. My hand is your hand. Just work your magic on the computer. I want to find out who the big backers are in Trident. Going to write thank you notes? Setting his lunch aside, he wiped his hands on his shirt front and started in. Hmm, a lot of layers here, he murmured after a moment. Good thing I'm the best. You're hooked up to the main here, so the data we need is in there somewhere, always is. You want a board of directors or what? No, she said slowly. Forget that. Ownership of the Nomad Bowers under the corporation. Who owns the ship? Ownership shouldn't be tough to find. Not with your friendly technology. Sea Search owns it, baby. Hold on. Donated. God, I love philanthropists. Some cat named Van Dyke. Tate stared at the screen. Silas Van Dyke? He's a wheel and a big deal. You must have heard of him. Finances a lot of expeditions. We ought to give the man a big sloppy kiss. His grin faded when he looked down at Tate's face. What's up? I am. She gritted her teeth against the fury. That son of a bitch put me on here. That, well, I'm taking myself off. Off? Baffled, Bowers stared at her. Off what? He thought he could use me. Almost blind with temper, she stared at the artifacts carefully arranged on her work table, David and Elizabeth's watch. For this, the hell with him. Matthew hung up the phone, picked up his coffee. Another bridge burned, he thought. Or maybe, just maybe, the first couple of planks set in place on a new one. He was sailing for Hatteras in the morning. If nothing else, he mused, it would be a good test of the mermaid's seaworthiness. The boat was finished, painted, polished, and named. He and LaRue had taken her out several times over the last few days on short runs. She sailed like a dream. Matthew sat back now, pleasantly tired. Maybe he'd finally done something that would last. Even the name had personal significance for him. He'd had the dream again, the one of Tate in the deep, dark sea. He didn't need Freud to explain it to him. He'd been in contact with Ray often over the last few weeks. Tate's name had come up, as had the Isabella, and memories of that summer. Naturally, it made him think and look back, so the dream had come. Tate might have been no more than a wistful memory, but the dream had been so immediate that he'd felt compelled to christen the boat for it, or, in a roundabout way, he supposed, for her. He wondered if he would see her, doubted it, and letting himself slide into relaxation, told himself it didn't matter one way or the other. The screen door whined open, slammed. LaRue came in with bags of takeout burgers and fries. You made your phone call, he asked. Yeah, I told Ray we'd start out in the morning. Lifting his arms over his head, Matthew linked his fingers and stretched. Weather looks good. Shouldn't take us more than three or four days at an easy clip. That'll give us a chance to shake her down. I look forward to the meeting of him and his wife. LaRue dug up paper plates. He didn't tell you more about what he found. He wants me to see it in person. Suddenly ravenous, Matthew helped himself to a burger. He set on heading out for the West Indies by the middle of April. I told him that suited us. LaRue's gaze met Matthew's and held. The sooner the better. You're crazy going back there. Face haggard, Buck stepped in from the bedroom. The place is cursed. The Isabella's cursed. Took your father, didn't it? His gait slow, measured, he came forward. Nearly took me. Should have. Matthew doused his fries with enough salt to make LaRue wince. Van Dyke took my father, he said calmly. A shark took your leg. Angelique's curse caused it. Maybe it did. Matthew chewed thoughtfully. If it did, I figure I've got a claim on it. That thing's bad luck to the Lassiters. It's time I changed my luck. 
Unsteady, Buck braced a hand on the tiny linoleum-topped table. Maybe you figure I only care what happens to you because of what'll happen to me. That ain't the way it is. Your father expected I'd look after you. I did the best I could as long as I could. I haven't needed looking after for a long time. Maybe not. And maybe I've been fucking up when it comes to you, when it comes to me the past few years. You're all I've got, Matthew. Truth is, you're all I ever gave most of a damn about. Buck's voice broke, causing Matthew to close his eyes and will away the worst edge of guilt. I'm not spending the rest of my life paying for something I couldn't stop, or watching you finish the job the shark started. I'm asking you to stay. I figure we could start a business, take tourists out, fishermen, that kind of thing. Buck swallowed hard. I'd pull my weight this time around. I can't do it. Appetite gone, Matthew pushed his food aside and stood. I'm going after the Isabella. Whether I find her or not, I'm picking up my life again. There are plenty of wrecks out there, and I'm damned if I'm going to spend the rest of my life salvaging metal or chauffeuring tourists instead of hunting gold. There's nothing I can do to stop you. Buck looked down at his trembling hands. I didn't figure there was. He took a deep breath, straightened his shoulders. I'm going with you. Look, Buck, I haven't had one fucking drink in ten days. Buck fisted his hands, forced them to relax again. I'm dry. Maybe I'm a little rocky yet, but I'm dry. For the first time, Matthew looked at him. There were shadows under the eyes, but the eyes were clear. You've gone ten days before, Buck. Yeah, but not on my own. I got a stake in this too, Matthew. Scares the hell out of me the thought of going back, but if you go, I go. Lassiter's stick together. He managed before his voice cracked again. You want me to beg you not to leave me behind? No, Christ. He rubbed a hand over his face. There were a dozen logical, viable reasons to refuse, and only one to agree. Buck was family. I can't babysit you or worry about you sneaking a bottle. You have to work, earn your space on the boat. I know what I gotta do. LaRue? Matthew turned to the man quietly eating his takeout dinner. You've got a stake in this. Where do you stand? Politely, LaRue swallowed, dabbed his mouth with a paper napkin. Me? I figure two more hands don't get in the way, long as they're steady. He shrugged his shoulder. If they shake, you can take him for ballast. Humiliated, Buck set his jaw. I'll pull my weight. James wanted the Isabella. I'll help you get her for him. All right. Matthew nodded. Pack your gear. We leave at first light. Chapter 14 The little plane bounced on the runway and woke Tate out of a half doze. For the past 38 hours, she had been almost constantly on the move, juggling herself from boats to planes to cabs. She'd crossed a hefty slice of the Pacific, an entire continent, and all the varying time zones. Her eyes told her it was day, but her body didn't have a clue. At the moment, she felt as though she were made out of thin, fragile glass that would easily shatter at a loud noise or a careless bump. But she was home, or as close to home as the tiny airport in Frisco on Hatteras Island. All that was left was one quick car ride, and then, she vowed, she would avoid anything that moved for at least twenty-four hours. Shifting carefully, she reached down for her carry-on. The tuna can with propellers she'd caught in Norfolk was empty but for her and the pilot. Once he'd taxied to a halt, he turned and gave her a thumbs-up sign, which she returned with a vague gesture and an even vaguer smile. She knew she had a great deal to think over, but her mind simply wouldn't connect. Since she'd discovered the connection with Van Dyke, she'd been in a tearing hurry to get home. Fate had played a hand. She'd been stuffing her gear into bags when she'd received a call from her father, asking her to come as soon as she was able to break away from the expedition. Well... She'd broken away, she thought, in record time. Since then, she'd done nothing but work and travel, catching snatches of sleep in between. She hoped Van Dyke had already been informed she was thousands of miles from her post. She hoped he knew she'd thumbed her nose at him. With her briefcase in one hand, the carry-on slung over her shoulder, she negotiated the narrow steps to the tarmac. Her knees wobbled, and she was grateful for the shaded glasses that cut the glare of the brilliant sun. 
She saw them almost immediately, waving cheerfully while she waited for the pilot to unload her suitcase from cargo. How little they changed, she mused. Maybe there was a touch more gray threading through her father's hair, but they were both so straight and slim and handsome. Both of them were grinning like fools, holding hands while they waved maniacally. Half of Tate's travel fatigue drained just looking at them. But what in the hell have you gotten yourselves into, she wondered. Secrets that couldn't be shared over the phone. Plots and plans and adventures. That damned amulet. That damned wreck. The damned Lassiters. It had been Ray's enthusiasm on the possibility of hooking up with the Lassiters again that had weighed the scales in favor of Tate's trip directly to Hatteras instead of to her own apartment in Charleston. She only hoped he'd listened to her and held off contacting Matthew. It was incomprehensible to her that any of them would want a repeat of that horrendous summer. Well, she was here now, she told herself as she gripped the strap and rolled her suitcase behind her, and she would talk some sense into her wonderful but naive parents. Oh, honey, honey, it's so good to see you. Marla's arms came around her, gripped tight. It's been so long, nearly a year this time. I know, I've missed you. On a laugh, she let her carry-on drop so that she could pull her father into the embrace. I've missed both of you. Oh, and you look terrific. Tearing up, she pulled back to take a long, close-up look. Really terrific. Mom, you've changed your hair. It's almost as short as mine used to be. Do you like it? Woman-like, Marla patted her sassily cropped do. It's great. Totally now. And so youthfully flattering, Tate wondered how this pretty, smooth-faced woman could be her mother. I'm doing so much gardening now, it always seemed to be in the way. Honey, you're so thin. You've been working too hard. Brow creased. She turned to her husband. Ray, I told you she's been working too hard. You told me, he agreed, and rolled his eyes. Over and over. How was the trip, baby? Endless. She rolled her shoulders to loosen them as they walked through the small terminal to where Ray had parked his jeep. Stifling a yawn, she shook her head. The bottom line is I'm here. We are glad you are. Ray stowed the luggage in the back of the jeep. We wanted you in on this trip, Tate, but I feel guilty knowing you resigned from your expedition. I know it was important to you. Not as important as I thought. She climbed into the back of the jeep, let her head fall back. She didn't want to bring up Van Dyke and his connection. Not yet, at least. I'm glad I was part of it. I really admire the people I was working with, and I'd be thrilled to work with any of them again. And the whole process was fascinating. But it was impersonal. By the time any of the artifacts got to me, they'd been through so many other hands, it was almost like taking something out of a display case to examine. Wearily, she moved her shoulders. You understand? Yes. Because Marla had warned him, Ray repressed his need to rattle away about his own plans. Give her a little time, Marla had insisted. Take it slow. You're home now, Marla said. The first thing you're going to do is have a good, hot meal and a nap. No argument. Once my head clears, I want to hear all about this idea of yours to go after the Isabella. When you've read through my research, Ray said cheerfully as he turned toward the village of Buxton, you'll see why I'm so eager to get started. He opened his mouth to continue, noticed his wife's warning glance, and subsided. After you've rested a bit, we'll get it all together. At least tell me what you found that started the ball rolling, she began, as he turned through a break in the pines and started up the sandy lane. Oh, the azaleas are blooming. She was caught, leaning out the window to draw in the scent of pine and bay and blooms mixed with the aroma of water. It looked, as Tate remembered, like a fairy tale. Marla had cleverly interspersed flowering shrubs among the trees, naturalized with spring and summer bulbs, so that splashes and flows of color seemed gloriously wild and unplanned. Near the two-story cedar house with its wide-screened porch, flower beds were only slightly more formal, with low-growing rock crests, sunny primroses, and flowering sage giving way to nodding columbine and larkspur. Annuals and perennials thrived, while others waited for their season. You've started a rock garden, Tate observed, craning her neck when the jeep turned into a widened slot facing the sound. 
my new project. We've so much shade here I have to be very choosy, and you should see my herb bed around the back by the kitchen. Everything looks fabulous. Tate stepped out of the jeep and looked at the house, and it's so quiet, she said softly, just the water, the birds, the breeze through the pines. I don't know how you ever leave it. Whenever we come back from one of our little jaunts, we love it that much more. Ray hefted her bags. It'll be a great place to retire. He winked at his wife. When we're ready to grow up, that'll be the day. More delighted than she'd imagined to be there, Tate started along the walking stones set into the gentle slope. I suppose I'll be ready for knitting or bingo long before either of... She halted at the back door. The colorful hammock she'd bought her father during a trip to Tahiti was stretched in its usual patch of sun, but it was occupied. You have company? No, not company. Old friends. Marla opened the screen door. They arrived just before dusk last night. We're loaded with weary travelers, aren't we, Ray? Got a full house. Tate could see little more than a mop of dark hair that flopped over mirrored glasses, a hint of a tanned, muscular body. It was enough to have her stomach clench into several painful knots. What old friends? she asked in a carefully neutral tone. Buck and Matthew Lassiter. Marla was already in the kitchen, checking the clam chowder she'd had heating for lunch. And their shipmate, LaRue. An interesting character, isn't he, Ray? You bet. Ray kept a bright smile on his face. He hadn't gotten around to mentioning to Marla their daughter's objection to the renewal of the old partnership. You'll get a kick out of him, Tate. I'm just going to put your things in your room and escape. Where's Buck? Tate asked her mother. Though she'd gone into the kitchen, she kept her eye on the hammock through the window. Oh, he's around somewhere. She sampled the chowder, nodded. He looks so much better than he did the last time we saw him. Drinking? No, nope, not a drop since he's been here. Sit down, honey. Let me fix you a bowl. Not just yet, Tate set her shoulders. I think I'll go out and renew acquaintance. That's nice. You tell Matthew his lunch is ready. Right. She intended to tell him a great deal more than that. The sand and springy grass muffled her footsteps, though she was certain she could have marched up with a brass band and he wouldn't have stirred. The sunlight slanted over him. Beautifully, she thought, infuriated. He was beautiful. No amount of resentment and disdain could deny it. His hair was mussed and obviously hadn't seen a barber's care for some time. In sleep, his face was relaxed, that gorgeous mouth soft. It was a bit bonier than it had been eight years ago, she supposed, deepening the hollows of his cheeks. And that only added to the instant sexual punch. His body was trim, muscled, and looked hard as granite with its covering of ripped jeans and faded T-shirt. She let herself take a good long look, scrupulously monitoring her own reaction as she would monitor any lab experiment. An initial jump of the pulse, maybe, she judged, but that was only natural when a woman came across a stunning animal. She was grateful to report that after that one visceral jolt, she felt nothing but annoyance, resentment, and good old-fashioned anger at finding him napping on her turf. Lassiter, you bastard! He didn't stir. His chest continued to rise and fall rhythmically. With a grim smile, she planted her feet, took a good hold on the edge of the hammock. Putting her back into it, she heaved. Matthew came awake halfway through the roll. He had a quick glimpse of the ground rushing up, threw his hands out instinctively to catch himself. He grunted when he hit, swore when a prickly needle of a thistle jabbed his thumb. Groggy and disoriented, he shook his head. Tossing his hair back, he shifted until he was sitting on the ground. The first thing he saw were small, narrow feet encased in practical and well-worn walking boots. Then there were the legs a lot of them, long, feminine, and wonderfully shaped in snug black leggings. Under different circumstances, he could have passed a great deal of time happily studying them. Shifting his gaze a bit higher, he encountered a black shirt, mannish, with its tail sweeping hips that were definitely not a man's. Lovely breasts, high, adding a nice curve to the shirt. Then the face. The juices the body had stirred went directly to simmer. She'd changed, unfairly, he thought, gorgeously, mouth-wateringly. While she'd been fresh, lovely, and sweet at twenty, the woman she'd become was heart-stopping. Her skin was ivory, almost transparently pure, with just a blush of rose. 
Her unpainted mouth was full, luscious, and set in a bad-tempered pout that had his own mouth going bone dry. She'd let her hair grow, and it was swept back now in a no-nonsense ponytail that left that face unframed. Behind her shaded lenses, her eyes were hot with anger. Realizing he was on the edge of gawking, Matthew unfolded himself. In defense, he tilted his head and offered a quick, careless smile. Hey, Red, long time. What the hell are you doing here, getting my parents tangled up in some ridiculous scheme? In a negligent move, he leaned on a tree. His knees were water. Nice to see you, too, he said dryly. And you've got it backwards. Ray's got the scheme. I'm going along for the ride. Taking him for a ride more likely? Disgust fountained up. It wasn't possible to swallow all of it. The partnership was dissolved eight years ago, and it's going to stay that way. I want you to go back to whatever hole you climbed out of. You running things around here now, Red? I'll do whatever I have to to protect my parents from you. I never did anything to Ray or Marla. He lifted a brow. Or to you, for that matter. Though in that area I had plenty of opportunity. Her cheeks heated. She hated him for it, hated those damned glasses that hid his eyes and tossed her own reflection back at her. I'm not a young girl with stars in her eyes now, Lassiter. I know exactly what you are, an opportunist with no sense of loyalty or responsibility. We don't need you. Ray thinks differently. He's soft-hearted. She angled her chin. I'm not. Maybe you've conned him into putting his money into some wild plan, but I'm here to put a stop to it. You're not going to use him. Is that how you see it? I'm using him? You're a born user. She said it mildly, pleased with her control. And when things get rough, you walk, like you walked on Buck, leaving him in some hole-in-the-wall trailer park in Florida while you sailed off. I was there. All but shimmering with resentment, she stepped closer. Almost a year ago, I went to see him. I saw that sty you dropped him in. He was all alone, sick. There was barely any food. He said he couldn't remember the last time you'd been there, that you were off diving somewhere. That's true enough. He'd have sawed off his tongue with his own pride before he would have told her differently. He needed you, but you were too self-involved to give a damn. You left him to drink himself half to death. If my parents knew how callous, how cold you really are, they'd pitch you out on your ass. But you know. Yes, I know. I knew eight years ago when you were considerate enough to show me. That's the only thing I owe you, Matthew, and I'll pay you back by letting you have the chance to bow out of this business gracefully. No deal. He folded his arms. I'm going after the Isabella, Tate, one way or the other. I've got my own debts to pay. You won't use my parents to pay them. She turned on her heel and strode off. Alone, Matthew gave himself a minute to let the storm of emotions settle. Slowly, he sat on the hammock, braced his feet to keep it from rocking. He hadn't expected her to greet him with open arms and a sunny smile, but he hadn't expected such complete and utter loathing. Dealing with it would be difficult, but necessary. Yet that wasn't the worst of it, not by a long shot. He'd been so sure he was over her. She'd barely been more than a passing thought in his life for years. It was a jolt, an embarrassing, devastating jolt to realize that, rather than being over her, he was desperately, foolishly in love with her. Still. Before Marla could repeat her offer of lunch, Tate had sailed through the kitchen, into the homely, cluttered living room, down the steps to the foyer, and out the front door. She needed to breathe. At least she'd held on to her temper, she told herself as she stormed over the sandy soil toward the sound. She hadn't decked him the way she'd wanted to, and she'd made her position crystal clear. She would see to it that Matthew Lassiter was packed and gone by nightfall. Tate took another gulp of air as she stepped on the narrow dock. Moored there was the new adventure, the 42-foot cruiser her parents had christened only two years before. She was a beauty, and though Tate had only managed one brief run on her, she knew the boat to be quick and agile. She might have gone on board, just to spend a few minutes alone with her anger, if there hadn't been another boat on the other side of the pier. She was frowning at it, its unusual lines and double-hull construction, when Buck came on deck. Ahoy there, pretty girl. Ahoy yourself. Grinning, she hurried onto the pier. Permission to come aboard, sir. Permission granted. 
He laughed, holding out a hand as she leapt gracefully down. She could see instantly that he'd lost some of the weight the bloat of drink and bad food had ballooned on him. His color was ruddy again, his eyes clear. When she hugged him, there was no stale scent of whiskey and sweat. It's good to see you, she told him. You look renewed. I'm getting by. He shifted uncomfortably. You know what they say, a day at a time. I'm proud of you. She pressed her cheek to his, but sensing his embarrassment, pulled back. Well, tell me about this. She spread her arms wide to encompass the boat. How long have you had her? Matthew finished her only a few days before we sailed up. Her smile faded. Her arms dropped back to her sides. Matthew? He built her, Buck said with pride ringing in every syllable. Designed her. Worked on her off and on for years. Matthew designed and built this boat himself? Just about single-handed. I'll show you around. As he led her around the deck from bow to stern, he ran a commentary on the design, the stability, the speed. Every few minutes his hand would run along a rail or fitting with affection. I gave him grief over her, Buck admitted, but the boy proved me wrong. We ran into a squall off of Georgia, and she took it like a lady. Mm Mm-hmm. She carries 200-gallon freshwater capacity, he went on, bragging like a doting papa. And storage. The way he set her out, she's got as much as you find on a 60-footer. Got twin motors, 145 shaft horsepower. Sounds like he's in a hurry, she muttered. When she stepped into the pilot house, her eyes widened. God, Buck, the equipment. Stunned, she walked through, examining. Top of the line sonar, depth finders, magnetometer. The cockpit held excellent and pricey navigational equipment. A radio telephone, radio direction finder, a nav text for offshore weather data, and to her complete amazement, an LCD screen video plotter. The boy wanted the best. Yes, but... She wanted to ask how he'd paid for it, but was afraid the answer might be her parents. Instead, she took a deep breath and promised to find the answer herself, later. It's quite a setup. The pilot house boasted full visibility, access from starboard and port. There was a wide, flat chart table, empty now, and glossy cabinets with brass fittings for storage. Even a settee berth with thick navy padding over wood had been built into a corner. A far cry, she mused, from the sea devil. Come take a look at the cabins. Hell, guess I should call them staterooms. Got two of them, with heads. Sleep snug as a bug down there. And the galley's one even your ma would be proud of. Sure, I'd love to see. Buck, she began as they exited to Stern. How long has Matthew been planning on going back to look for the Isabella? Can't say. Probably since we left the Marguerite. Ask me, it's been preying on his mind all along. All he lacked was the time and the means. The means, Tate repeated. Did he come into some money then? LaRue bought in. LaRue? Who? Did I hear my name? Tate saw a figure at the base of the companionway. As she stepped down, she made out a thin, natally dressed man somewhere between forty and fifty. Gold winked out of his grin as he offered a hand to help her down. Ah, mademoiselle, my head spins. He swept her hand up to his lips. Don't pay this scrawny Canuck any mind, Tate. He thinks he's a ladies' man. A man who reveres and appreciates women, LaRue corrected. I'm enchanted to meet you at last, and to have such beauty grace our humble home. At a glance, the neat ship-shaped deck house looked anything but humble. Wood gleamed on the dining bar where colorfully padded stools stood waiting. Someone had hung framed charts, yellowed with age, on the walls. She was astonished to see a vase of fresh daffodils on a table. Guess it's a big step up from the sea devil, Buck commented. From sea devil to mermaid, LaRue grinned. Can I offer you tea, mademoiselle? No, she was still blinking in shock. Thanks, I have to get back. There are a number of things I have to talk over with my parents. Ah, yes, your father, he was thrilled that you would be going with us. Me, I'm delighted to know two such lovely ladies will be adding charm to the journey. Tate's not just a lady, Buck said. She's a hell of a diver, a natural-born treasure hunter, and she's a scientist. A woman of many talents, LaRue murmured. I mumbled. Baffled, she stared at him. You shipped with Matthew? 
Indeed, it has been my trial to try to induce some culture into his life. Buck snorted. Shit with an accent still shit. Begging your pardon, Tate. I've got to get back, she said again, dazed. Nice to have met you, Mr. LaRue. LaRue only. He kissed her hand again. A bientôt. Buck shouldered LaRue aside. I'll walk back with you a ways. Thanks. Tate waited until they were back on the pier and headed for shore. Buck, you said Matthew's been working on that boat on and off for years. Yeah, whenever he had a little extra time or money. Must have done a dozen drawings and designs before he settled on this one. I see. That kind of ambition and tenacity was more than she would have given him credit for, unless... Has he been planning on going back to look for the Isabella for years, too? Buck's eyes shuddered. Can't say what was in his mind. That's what's in it now, though. He's got the fever again. Can't say whether he ever lost it. All right, she put a friendly hand on his arms. I hope you won't take this the wrong way, but I'm not sure any of this is a good idea. You mean us partnering up with Ray and Marla and going back? Yes. Finding the Marguerite was practically a miracle. The odds of it happening twice are very dim. I know it took a long time for all of us to get over the disappointment before. I'd hate to see you and my parents go through all of it again. Buck paused to shove his glasses back into place. I can't say I'm happy about it myself. Automatically, he reached down to rub the artificial leg. Bad memories, bad luck. Matthew's set, though, and I owe him. That's not true. He owes you. He owes you his life. Maybe he did. Buck grimaced. Fact is, I made him pay for it. I didn't save his father. Don't know if I could have, but I didn't. Never went after Van Dyke. Don't know what good it would have done, but I didn't. Then when my time came to pay, I didn't take it like a man should. Don't talk like that. She hooked a protective arm through his. You're doing wonderfully. Now, for a couple of weeks. Don't really make up for all the years between. I let the boy shoulder it all, the work and the blame. He left you alone, Tate said furiously. He should have stayed by you, supported you. Done nothing but support me. Worked at a job he hated so I could have what I needed. I took it, used it, and tossed it in his face every chance I got. I'm ashamed of that. I don't know what you're talking about. The last time I came to see you, I lied to you. He stared down at his feet, knowing he had to risk her affection for his own self-respect. I made it seem like he pushed me off, didn't come around, didn't do nothing for me. Maybe he didn't come around much, but it's hard to blame him. But he sent me money, took care of things best he could, paid to have me in detox I don't know how many times. But I thought... I wanted you to think. Wanted him to think it, too, because it was easier for me if everybody was miserable. He did the best he could. Far from convinced, she shook her head. He should have stayed with you. He did what he had to do, Buck insisted. And Tate bowed to unshakable family loyalty. Regardless, this new brainstorm strikes me as being impulsive and dangerous. I'm going to do my best to talk my parents out of it. I hope you understand. Can't blame you for thinking twice about hooking up with the Lassiters again. You do what you have to do, Tate, but I'll tell you, your daddy's got the wind in his sails. I'll just have to change his course. Chapter 15 But there were times when the wind ran strong and true and defeated even the most determined sailor. Tate tolerated Matthew's presence at dinner. She made conversation with Buck and LaRue at the big chestnut table. She listened to their stories, laughed at their jokes. Her heart simply wasn't hard enough to spoil the celebrational mood or dim the light of delight in her father's eyes with cold, hard facts and logic. Because she was sharp enough to notice her mother's occasional looks of concern in her direction, Tate managed to be marginally polite to Matthew, though she did her best to limit contact to the obligatory pass the salt. When the meal was over, she maneuvered the situation in her favor by insisting on clearing up the dishes alone with her father. Bet you haven't had a meal like that in a month of Sundays, he commented, humming under his breath as he stacked dishes. In a year of Sundays, I'm sorry I had to pass on the pecan pie. You'll have some later. That LaRue's something, isn't he? 
exchanging recipes with your mother one minute and arguing foreign policy the next with a side trip into baseball and 18th century art. He's a regular Renaissance man, she murmured. But she was holding out on judgment of him. Any friend of Matthew's, she thought, required careful scrutiny. Even if he was interesting, well-read, and charming. Particularly if he was. I haven't figured out what he's doing with Matthew. Oh, I think they suit each other well enough. Ray filled the sink with soapy water for the pots as Tate loaded the dishwasher. Matthew's always had a lot going for him. He's just never had much chance to put it all to use. I'd say he's a man who knows how to make the most of an opportunity, which is something I want to discuss with you. The Isabella. Sleeves pushed up. Ray began to attack pans in the sink. We're going to get to that, honey. Soon as everyone's had a chance to settle in for the evening, I held off saying anything more to the rest until you got here. Dad, I know how you felt when we found that virgin wreck eight years ago. I know how I felt, so I understand that you may think it's a good idea to go back. But I'm not sure you're considering all the details, the, the pitfalls. I've thought of them a great deal over the years, and little else for the last nine months. We had our share of luck, good and bad, the last time, but we've got a hell of a lot more going for us this time around. Dad, Tate slipped another plate into the dishwasher, straightened. If I have the right information, Buck hasn't dived since his accident, and LaRue worked on ship as a cook. He's never had on tanks in his life. That's all true. Maybe Buck won't go under, but we can always use another hand on deck. As for LaRue, he's willing to learn, and I have a feeling he's a quick study. There are six of us, Tate went on, trying futilely to chip away at the optimism. Only three of whom can dive. I haven't done any serious diving myself in nearly two years. Like riding a bike, Ray said easily, and set a pan aside to drain. We need people to read and run the equipment in any case. Now we've got a professional marine archaeologist on hand, not one in training. He sent her a beaming smile. Maybe you'll do your thesis on this expedition. I'm not concerned about my thesis right now, she said, straining for patience. I'm concerned about you. You and Mom have spent the last several years playing at hunting, Dad, exploring established wrecks, pleasure diving, shell collecting. That's nothing compared to the full-out physical labor needed for something like you have in mind. I'm in shape, he told her, vaguely insulted. I work out three times a week, dive regularly. Wrong tactic, she thought. Okay. What about the expense? It could take months of your time, plus the cost of supplies, equipment. This isn't a vacation you're talking about, or a hobby. Who's backing this venture? Your mother and I are very stable financially. Well, fighting temper, she snatched up a dish rag to swipe the counters. That answers my last question. You're putting your money on the line, which means you're carrying the Lassiters. It's not a matter of carrying them, honey. Genuinely puzzled, he pulled his hands out of the water and wiped them dry. It's a partnership, just like before. Any imbalance will be taken out of the profits once we salvage the wreck. What if there isn't any wreck? She exploded. I don't care if you toss your last penny away on a dream. I want you to enjoy everything you've worked for. But how can I stand by while you let that self-serving, opportunistic bastard take you for a ride? Tate. Alarmed at the way her voice carried, he patted her on the shoulder. I didn't know you were upset. I thought when you said you were coming back, you were committing to the idea. I came back to try to stop you from making a mistake. I'm not making one. His face closed up in the way she knew it could when he was hurt. And there is a wreck. Matthew's father knew it. I know it. The Isabella is there, and Angelique's curse is with her. Not the amulet again. Yes, the amulet again. That's what James Lassiter was looking for, what Silas Van Dyke wants, and what we're going to have. Why is it so important? This wreck, this necklace. Because we lost something that summer, Tate, he said quietly. More than the fortune that thief stole from us. More even than Buck's leg. We lost the joy in what we'd done, what we could do. We lost the magic of what could be. It's time we got it back. She let out a sigh. How could she fight dreams? Didn't she have her own still? 
the museum she'd planned for, hoped for most of her life, and some day she'd see it realized. Who was she to try to block her father's one abiding wish? All right, we can go back, just the three of us. The Lassiters are part of it now, just as they were then. And if anyone has a right to find that wreck and that amulet, it's Matthew. Why? Because it cost him a father. She didn't want to think of that. She didn't want to be able to visualize the young boy who had grieved helplessly over his dead father's body. The amulet doesn't mean any more to him than it... a means to an end. Something to be sold to the highest bidder. That's for him to decide. That makes him, she corrected, little better than Van Dyke. He hurt you that summer, Matthew. Gently, Ray took her face in his hands. I knew there was something between you, but I didn't realize it had cut so deep. This has nothing to do with that, she insisted. It has to do with who and what he is. Eight years is a long time, honey. Maybe you should step back and take another look. In the meantime, there are things I need to show you, all of you. Let's get everybody into my den. With reluctance, Tate joined the group in the warmly paneled room where her father did his research and wrote his articles for diving magazines. Deliberately, she moved to the opposite end of the room from Matthew and settled on the arm of her mother's chair. With the windows open to the scents and music of the sound, it was just cool enough to indulge in a quiet fire. Ray walked behind his desk, cleared his throat like a nervous lecturer about to begin his speech. I know you all are curious about what prompted me to begin this venture. All of us know what happened eight years ago, what we found and what we lost. Every time I'd dive after that, I'd think about it. Brood about it, Marla corrected with a smile. Ray smiled back at her. I couldn't let it go. I thought I had for a time, but then something would remind me and set me off again. One day I had the flu and Marla wouldn't let me out of bed. I passed the time with some television and happened to cross a documentary on salvaging. It was a wreck off Cape Horn, a rich one, and who was backing it, who was pulling in the glory, but Silas Van Dyke. Bastard, Buck muttered. Probably pirated that one, too. Might have, but the point is, he decided to film the proceedings. He wasn't on camera much himself, but he did talk a little about some of the diving he'd done, other wrecks he'd discovered. The son of a bitch talked about the Santa Marguerite. He never bothered to mention it had already been found, excavated. The way he told it, he did it all. Then, being the generous soul he is, donated 50% of the proceeds to the government of St. Kitts. In bribes and kickbacks, Matthew decided. It got my blood up. I started researching again right then and there. I figured he'd gotten one wreck, but he wasn't going to get the other. I spent the better part of two years digging up every snatch of information I could find on the Isabella. No reference to that ship, that crew, that storm was too small or insignificant. That's how I found it. Or how I found two very vital pieces to the puzzle. A map and a reference to Angelique's curse. Carefully, he lifted a book out of the top drawer. Its cover was tattered and held together by tape. Its pages were dry and yellowed. It's fallen apart, Ray said unnecessarily. I found it in a used bookstore, A Sailor's Life. It was written in 1846 by the great-grandson of a survivor of the Isabella. But there were no survivors, Tate put in. That's one of the reasons the wreck's been so hard to find. No recorded survivors. Ray stroked the book as though it were a well-loved child. According to this, stories and legends the author transcribed from his grandfather's tales, Jose Baltazar washed ashore on the island of Nevis. He was a seaman on the Isabella, and he watched her go down as he clung half-conscious to a plank, probably from the wrecked Santa Marguerite. Matthew, I think your father had traced this same clue. If that's true, what was he doing in Australia? He was following Angelique's curse. Ray paused for effect. But he was a generation too soon. A British aristocrat, Sir Arthur Minifield, had acquired the amulet from a French merchant. Minifield? Buck narrowed his eyes on concentration. I remember seeing that name in James's notes. The night before he died, he told me he'd been looking in the wrong place. He said how Van Dyke had it wrong, how that damned necklace had gotten around. 
That's how he said it, that damned necklace, and he was excited. When we were finished on the reef, he said how we were going to shake loose of Van Dyke, turn the tables on him before he turned them on us. Said how we had to be careful of Van Dyke and not move too fast. He had a lot more studying and figuring to do before we went after her. My theory is he found another reference to the amulet or to Balthazar. Ray set the book carefully on his desk. You see, the amulet didn't go down on the reef. The ship did. Minifield did. But Angelique's curse survived. Details are sketchy for the next 30 years. Maybe it washed up on the beach or someone found it while exploring the reefs. I can't find any mention of it between 1706 and 1733. But Balthazar saw it around the neck of a young Spanish woman aboard the Isabella. He described it. He heard the legend and he recounted it. Far from convinced, Tate folded her hands. If there's a reference to the amulet that places it on the Isabella, why hasn't Van Dyke found it and gone after the Isabella himself? He was dead sure it was in Australia, Buck told her. He was fired up about it, obsessed. He got it into his head. James knew something more, dogged him about it. And killed him for it, Matthew said flatly. Van Dyke's had teams working that wreck in that area for years. But... If my father found a reference that indicated the necklace was elsewhere, Tate continued with stubborn logic, and your father found a reference, it's only reasonable that a man with Van Dyke's resources and his greed would have found it as well. Maybe the amulet didn't want him to find it. LaRue spoke passively as he patiently rolled a cigarette. It's an inanimate object, Tate retorted. So is the Hope Diamond, LaRue said. The Philosopher's Stone, the Ark of the Covenant. It's the legend's surroundings, am I vital? The operative word is legend. All those degrees made you cynical, Matthew commented. Too bad. I think the point is, Marla cut in, recognizing the warrior light in her daughter's eyes, that Ray has found something, not whether or not this amulet holds some sort of power. Well put. Ray rubbed the side of his nose. Where was I? Balthazar was captivated by the amulet, even after word began to pass about the curse and the crew became uneasy. He believed the ship was wrecked because of the curse and that he survived to tell the tale. He told it well, Ray added. I've copied several pages of his reminiscences of the storm. You'll see when you read them that it was a hellish battle against the elements, a hopeless one. Of these two ships, the Marguerite succumbed first. As the Isabella broke up, passengers and crew were swept into the sea. He claims to have seen the Spanish lady, the amulet like a jeweled anchor around her neck, go down. Of course, that tidbit might have been for artistic effect. Ray passed out copied pages. In any case, he survived. The wind and the waves carried him away from land, from St. Kitts or St. Christopher's, as it was known then. He'd given up all hope lost his sense of time when he saw the outline of Nevis. He didn't believe he could make it to shore, as he was too weak to swim. But eventually he drifted in. A young native boy found him. He was delirious and near death for weeks. When he recovered, he had no desire to serve the Armada. Instead, he let the world believe him dead. He remained on the island, married, and passed down his stories of his adventures at sea. Ray took another paper from his pile. And he drew maps. A map, Ray continued, from an eyewitness who places the Isabella several degrees south-southeast from the wreck of the Marguerite. She's there, waiting. Matthew rose to take the map. It was crude and sparse, but he recognized the points of reference, the whale's tail of the peninsula of St. Kitts, the rising cone of Mount Nevis. An old, almost forgotten need surged in him, the need to hunt. When he looked up, the grin he flashed was one from his youth, bold, reckless, and irresistible. When do we leave? Tate couldn't sleep. There was too much racing inside her head, swimming in her blood. She understood and struggled to accept that the momentum was out of her hands. There would be no stopping her father from taking on this quest. None of the logic nor the personal doubt she used would sway him from partnering with the Lassiters. At least the timing worked. She just tossed an enormous career advancement aside for principle. That gave her some satisfaction. And it also gave her the opportunity to help launch the expedition for the Isabella. At least if she was there, right on hand, she could keep her eye on everyone, 
Matthew in particular. So she was thinking of him when she stepped outside to face the moon and the wind that washed through the top of the pines. She had loved him once. Over the years, she'd told herself it had been merely a crush, a young woman's infatuation with wild good looks and an adventurer's heart. But that was a coward's lie. She had loved him, Tate admitted, and tugged her jacket tighter against the night's moist breeze, or had loved the man she'd thought he was and could be. Nothing and no one had embraced her heart so completely before him, just as nothing and no one had ever broken it so totally and so callously. She tugged a leaf from a fragrant bay laurel, spun it under her nose as she walked toward the water. It was a night for reflection, she supposed. The moon, nearly full, rode a sky crowded with hot stars. The air was full of perfume and promise. Once she would have been seduced by that alone, before her romantic side had been sliced away. She considered herself fortunate that she could now appreciate the night for what it was and not spin dreams around it. In a way, she knew she had Matthew to thank for opening her eyes, rudely, painfully, but he'd opened them. She understood now that princes and pirates were for young, foolish girls to dream of. She had more solid goals than that. If she had to put those goals aside for a time, she would. Everything she was, everything she'd accomplished, she owed to her parents' support and belief in her. There was nothing she wouldn't do to protect them, even if it meant working shoulder to shoulder with Matthew Lassiter. She stopped near the water, down current from where the boats were docked. Her parents had built up the bank here with duckweed and wild grasses to fight erosion. Always the water stole from the land, always the land adjusted. It was a good lesson, she supposed. Things had been stolen from her, she'd adjusted. It's a nice spot, isn't it? Tate's shoulders tightened at the sound of his voice. She wondered how she hadn't sensed him, but for a man who spent his life at sea, he moved quietly on land. I thought you'd gone to bed. We're bunked down in the boat. He knew she didn't want him beside her, so perversely he stepped forward until their shoulders nearly brushed. Buck still snores like a freighter. Doesn't bother LaRue, but then he sleeps like a corpse. Try earplugs. I'll just string a hammock out on deck, like old times. These are new times. She took a bracing breath before she turned to him. As she'd expected, perhaps feared, he looked magnificent in the moonlight, bold, exciting, even dangerous. How lucky she was that such traits no longer appealed to her. And we'd better lay out the ground rules. You were always more into rules than me. To suit himself, he sat on a bale of duck grass, patted the space beside him in invitation. You go first. She ignored the invitation and the half-empty bottle of beer he offered. This is a business arrangement. As I understand it, my parents are fronting the bulk of the expenses. I intend to keep an accurate account of your share. Her voice still carried those lovely liquid vowels of the South, he mused, the consonants blurring like soft shadows. Fine. Bookkeeping's your department. You will pay them back, Lassiter. Every penny. He took a swallow of beer. I pay my debts. I'll see to it you pay this one. She paused a moment before moving from one practical matter to the other. The moon mirrored prettily on the calm water, but she paid no heed to it. I understand you're teaching LaRue to dive. I've been working with him. Matthew moved his shoulders. He's catching on. Will Buck dive? Even in the shadows, she saw his eyes glint. That's up to him. I'm not pushing him. I wouldn't want you to. She softened enough to move closer. He matters to me. I, I'm i glad he's looking so well. You're glad he's off the bottle? Yes. He's been off it before. Lasted a whole month once. Matthew. Before she'd realized it, she laid a hand on his shoulder. He's trying. Aren't we all? Abruptly, he grabbed her hand, tugged her down beside him. I'm tired of looking up at you. Besides, I can see you better down here in the moonlight. You always had a face for moonlight. Personal rule, she said briskly. You keep your hands off me. No problem. I don't need the frostbite. You've sure chilled down over the years, Red. I've simply developed a more discerning taste. College men. His smile was a sneer. Always figured you'd go for the academic type. Deliberately, he looked down at her hands, then back into her eyes. No rings. How come? Let's keep our private lives private. That's not going to be easy, seeing as we're going to be working in close quarters for some time. We'll manage. 
And as to work in arrangements, when we dive, one member of your team goes down with a member of ours. I don't trust you. And you hit it so well, he muttered. That's fine, he continued. That suits me. I like diving with you, Tate. You're good luck. He leaned back on his elbows, looked up at the stars. It's been a while since I dived in warm water. The North Atlantic's a bitch. You learn to hate her. Then why did you dive there? He slanted her a look. Doesn't that come under the heading of private? She looked away, cursing herself. Yes, though it was professional curiosity that made me ask. So he'd oblige her. There's money to be made salvaging metal wrecks. In case you haven't heard, World War II played hell with ships. I thought the metal you were interested in was gold. Whatever pays, sweetheart. I've got a feeling this trip's going to pay off big. Because it pleased him almost as much as it hurt, he continued to study her profile. You're not convinced? No, I'm not. But I am convinced this is something my father needs to do. The Isabella and the Santa Marguerite have fascinated him for years. And Angelique's curse. Yes, from the moment he heard of it. But you don't believe in curses anymore. Or magic. I guess you educated it out of your system. She couldn't have said why it stung to hear him say what was only the truth. I believe the amulet exists, and knowing my father that it was aboard the Isabella, finding it will be another matter altogether, and its value will come from its age and its stones and the weight of its gold, not from some superstition. There's no more mermaid left in you, Tate. He said it quietly and stopped himself before his hand lifted to stroke her hair. You used to remind me of something fanciful that was as much at home in the sea as in the air, with all sorts of secrets in your eyes and endless possibilities shimmering around you. Her skin shivered, not from the nippy little breeze, but from heat. In defense, her voice was flat and cool. I doubt very much if you had any sort of romantic flights of fancy where I was concerned. We're both aware of what you thought of me. I thought you were beautiful and even more out of reach than you are right now. Hating the fact that such careless lies could make her pulse jump, she rose quickly. It won't work, Lassiter. I'm not along on this trip to amuse you. We're business partners, fifty-fifty since my father wants it that way. Isn't that interesting, he murmured. He set the bottle down and rose slowly until they were toe-to-toe, -to -toe, until he could smell her hair, until his fingers throbbed with the memory of how her skin felt under them. I still get to you, don't I? Your ego's still in the same place. She schooled her features to mild disdain. Just below the snap of your jeans. Tell you what, Lassiter, if things get a little tedious and I'm desperate enough to try anything to break the monotony, I'll let you know. But until that unlikely event, try not to embarrass yourself. I'm not embarrassed. He grinned at her. Just curious. Hoping to loosen some of the knots in his gut, he sat again. Any more rules read? She needed a minute before she could trust her voice. Somehow her heart had lodged in her throat. If, by some miracle, we find the Isabella, I will, as marine archaeologist, catalog and assess and preserve all the artifacts. Everything gets logged, down to the last nail. 
Fine. Might as well put those degrees to use. She bristled at his obvious lack of respect for her field. That's just what I intend to do. Twenty percent of whatever we find will go to the government of St. Kitts and Nevis, and though it's only fair that it be put to a vote, I'll set aside what artifacts I find appropriate to donate. Twenty percent's hefty, Red. Try a little fame along with your fortune, Lassiter. If things work out as we hope, I'm going to negotiate with the government to establish a museum, the Beaumont Lassiter Museum. If the wreck's as rich as reputed, you can spare ten percent of your share and still not have to work another day in your life. It'll keep you in shrimp and beer. Again, he flashed a grin. Still stewing over that sword. You surprise me. As long as we keep our cards on the table, there won't be any surprises. Those are my terms. I can live with them. She nodded. There's one more. If we do find Angelique's curse, it goes to the museum. He picked up his beer, drained it. No, you've had your terms, Tate. I've only got one of my own. The amulet's mine. Yours? She would have laughed if her teeth hadn't been clenched together. You don't have any stronger claim on it than the rest of us. Its potential value is tremendous. Then you can assess it, catalog it, and deduct it from the rest of my take. But it's mine. For what? To pay off a debt. He rose, and the look in his eyes had her backing up a step before she could stop herself. I'm going to wrap it around Van Dyke's neck and strangle him with it. That's foolish. Her voice shook. Crazy. That's a fact. You live with that one, Tate, because that's how it's going to be. You've got your rules. He cupped her chin in his hand and made her tremble, not from the touch, not this time, but from the hot-blooded murder boiling in his eyes. And I've got mine. You can't expect any of us to stand by while you plan to kill someone. I don't expect anything. He'd stopped expecting long ago. It just wouldn't be smart to get in my way. Now you'd better get some sleep. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. He was lost in the shadows of the trees almost immediately. To ward off the chill, Tate wrapped her arms tight around her body. He'd meant it. She couldn't pretend otherwise, but she could tell herself that he'd lose this thirst for revenge in the hunt. The odds were they'd never find the Isabella, and if they did, the odds were even higher against finding the amulet. For the first time, she prepared to go on an expedition, hoping for failure.